Enemy Esports versus Team 8. Now, for Team 8, they are still on the hunt for their first win this split, which is surprising when you consider that they were only one game away from playing in the spring playoffs last split. Yeah, it's been a tough road, and this week is a new set of challenges. I mean, first off, we do have to mention Slushy. Uh, unfortunately, Slushy has had an important family issue come up, and he will be leaving immediately after this week to attend to it. Don't know exactly when he'll return, but he will be in for this week. And it's most likely going to be very difficult for him to play without distraction. Add that to the fact that Nien is still new to the team, and that Porpoise and Cali Trolls have been underperforming recently when compared to last split. And, I mean, Teammate just has a really tough road ahead of them this week. That's true. We'll see if they can improve, though. Uh, so, while Teammate has have to be looking at games like this against other bottom of the standings teams. Maybe they can take games like this to start closing the gap. This is one of the games they probably have to win. Yeah, and Freak, enemies games have kind of shown an inconsistently that does come from playing your first four games in the LCS. They defeated Gravity, then they gave TSM a good fight, but then last week they struggled to close out a TDK sub squad. And we're also seeing those inconsistencies translate into champion select as well. Sometimes it looks like they have a great draft, other times they give up all of the priority champions to the enemy team. Yeah, we'll see if those plans work out for them in the future. Right now, we're going to check out the starting lineups, though. On the blue side is enemy esports. Top laner, Flares. Jungler, Trashy. Mid laner, Inox. AD carry, Otter. And support, Body Drop. And on the red side, of course, it is teammate. We got Cali Trolls in the top lane. Porpoise in the jungle. Slushy in the mid lane. Nien on AD carry. And, of course, Dodo 8 on support. Dodo 8 on support. So, coaches behind them. Players ready to go. All 10 are in the lobby as well. So, uh, we've had another... We come through. We are on the same patch as last week, if I remember properly. Yes. Still 5'10". But different in the fact that Echo is now yeah. able to be selected yeah. in this patch. Uh, and it's, it's actually really interesting now. With so many really strong champions out there, mm -hmm. uh, it's the one reason that Echo and Rise basically do get through sometimes. Because... Uh, the red side has a lot of agency when it comes to what they actually decide to ban, whether they want to play a game inflated with these strong champions, uh, or if they just want to take it on themselves to ban it out. Because if they don't ban any, it means they actually get some. Sure, and keep in mind, even though there's the sort of default considered strong champions, there's players who specifically excel on a very small number of them. While LeBlanc is, of course, common, Slushy is really known for that champion in particular, so that like has to be banned by enemy esports. Even though Inox could play it himself, they can't risk it. Yeah, another ban that's happened three times against enemy was the mid lane Kog'Maw. I talked to Inox really briefly. He says, yeah, it's so strange. People keep banning Kog'Maw against me. I've only played it once in competitive play, and it was in Challenger. And I was like, well, have you practiced a lot? And he's like, yeah, I was like the first one to start practicing it, and I played it all the time. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> so that's why. Aware. <laughs> Maybe that's why they ban AP Kogma. But as you can see right now, no Echo bans. We do see a Rise ban. The AP Kogma ban is getting closer and closer to going through. I think we're going to see some fireworks this game. Uh, depending on the skin, absolutely. We'll see if he goes for that one. LeBlanc, Callista off the table. You mentioned the Gragas and the Rise as well. Waiting to see if the Echo phase is going to be there. But no, Inox surprisingly banning his own Cassidy. That's a little strange. I mean, we know Slushy is good on Assassin Tights, but he's been happily playing Ziggs for the last mm -hmm. month, essentially. And yeah, that's a champion that has not been banned against teammate the entire split and also hasn't been picked by them. Maybe it's something enemy found in scrims when these guys are practicing earlier on in the year, but... Yeah. Yeah, definitely a curiosity here. I assume Flares didn't misclick. They could have ejected out of champ side if that were the case. Final ban coming through as Alistair. Not a big surprise there either. Echo is on the board. He is, as is the Kog'Maw, and the question is, with a, pretty much every single common poke mid still up, unless there's a, a tier list pecking order where, like, Kog beats Varus, enemy could leave that champ up for later, and it, as you say, Echo might be that important that they pick it up right away. Yeah, obviously the European also LCS, Rex, he was picked, Echo was picked a man in 9 out of 10 games. Uh, in the LPL where he was available, 15 of 16 games, Yep, 1 out of 1 so far in North America. All right, here we go, so... The crazy thing about Echo, so he's uh, definitely strong. Mm -hmm. And whenever there's a champion that is overpowered in this sense, you get to play him in a variety of roles. And he's so strong that people are throwing him into the team just to have him and then figuring out later where he goes. We've seen him both in the top lane, jungle, and mid lane, and it's a spectacular flex pick in that yeah. sense to yeah. be able to first pick right now. Full AP Echo with a mid lane tank or AP Echo top lane or tank Echo jungle have been the main builds we've seen so far. Yep. We've seen, I believe, Riven as a counter pick to him before in China. Unless I'm forgetting the matchup. 
Top lane Hecarim comes through already, though, for Cali Trolls, plus the Thresh picked up by Dodo. So, teammate saying, okay, here's your Echo, here's what we want to play. Oddly, though, again, with, with the Gragas ban and no Rek'Sai ban, Rek'Sai has not been seen yet in Champ Select. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, mainly, it's just Dodo wanting the Thresh. They also want to block Hecarim from Flares. He had that devastating Hecarim game against TSM, where he nearly solo carried the entire game. So, pretty normal picks. I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised that Porpoise did not go for the Rek'Sai, only because it's been a staple of his, especially when he's had successful games. But with Sejuani still up as well, and that being a pick that he enjoys, I think they're just going to wait for a bit more of the team comp to come together to figure out if they need the early game pressure against what enemy picks, or if they go with Sejuani. Let's we'll see that comes out here then. Team fight comp, early picks, early aggression, any of these things could absolutely happen. The Rek'Sai hover right now is for Trashy. And looks like he's going to let that one get locked in, but Inux needs to pick his own champion here, and they're really taking a long time to figure it out that they want yeah. Janna down to the bot lane. When you, yeah, when you go in three lanes, you're like, okay, wait, he's not going to be jungle anymore. So, Inux, do you want him yet, or are we still going to wait? Uh, crap, just pick Janna, screw it. Man, they uh, almost got random to champion right there. Yeah, that was close. Would have been interesting. Janna right now, decent disengage against the Hecarim. Plenty of team composition to still come in. All right, here we go. 30 seconds to go on the next setup here. Cassiopeia, the hover for Slushy, a big team fight mage for them. Yeah, Azir just kind of as well. Slushy has been playing a whole lot of Ziggs, but picked one of the other champions that fit into the role. Nunu also picked up. This team is actually set up to uh, buff Nian if they want him on something like a Jinx, meanwhile. Yeah, and this is the real reason that we didn't see an early lock-in on Rek'Sai, is especially yeah. if they wanted to plan somewhat of a control composition around Nunu Azir. Great synergy between those two. As far as champions that actually can do well against Rek'Sai, uh, Nunu is kind of near the top of the list, in my opinion, because yes, he can burn a close on you, but afterwards, if you just hit him with a snowball, he generally can't get off his auto attacks after his knockup, or even get to you for the knockup if you hit him with a snowball while Rek'Sai is burrowed. So I actually do love this Nunu pick by teammate as well as the Azir. The only danger is they ended up having to pick Azir blind. Uh, and now Inox gets to yeah. pick if he wants Echo or something else. Assuming that Flares is put enough happy to play Echo, Echo. to swap from top. Yeah, true. We've only seen a very few top lane Echo games so far, literally two in professional play from what I can tell. There is a loss over in China and a win for Huni over in Europe. And it's going to be, yep, mid lane Echo. Nar top comes through to face off against Ekarim. The Saber comes through for Otter. So enemy ended up making sure they had tanks in their team, which is generally wise, especially against Azir, because they need to be able to bash him around a little bit. Uh, need to have some type of front line of their own against a strong teammate front line that we have put together right here. Yeah. But as far as just persistent damage and team fight power, teammates certainly have pretty much the best in the business down the line. Cinder Hulk, uh, Hecarim, pretty scary. Just blood boiled Azir in the first place. A lot of amazing things out here for the teammate. 5v5. Enemy Esports, of course, with the choice to pick their fights with a couple of assassins and a lot of cool team fight powers like Sivir Ulti. Yep. Let's see if they can pick the right fights, though, as teammate look to grab their final slot here. Yeah, just need an AD carry. Is. And that's that's team eight right there. They're just going for heavy amounts of team fight damage and kind of setting up a position with the Azir and the Nunu. And Jinx can work for that. It really will depend on Yen's positioning, whether he can avoid the Echo assassinations. Echo, really great at baiting people into his ultimate. Uh, pretty good at diving in, but as, as well as having to get enough damage to actually one-shot the Jinx without your ultimate, you got to pull off a pretty perfect combo on a late game Echo, so I kind of like that Jinx pick here, but of course, it really just depends on how well Inox assassinates and how well Nien positions. Yeah, those are going to be very important things, and at the very end of it all, you at least have Thresh to help keep things safe in the end of it. Maybe that'll be enough to keep the Jinx alive. Nien, of course, on 5.10, Jinx for the mid game's a little bit weaker, but he's just known for getting farm over and over again and scaling up throughout the late game, but... I guess I need to ask a little bit of teammate have almost too much late game. Jinx and Azir on the same team feels like more than enough late game insurance. Nice! It's a good celebratory fist bump for both those guys. They head off stage. Yeah, history teacher wanting to pick up his first win as the coach of teammate. Yep. We mentioned earlier a very important game for teammate. Always needing to pick up that first win. And of course, enemy 
they want to get above 500 here. And that'd be sweet. Three and two for them would be great. But while the teams load on to the game, be sure to send your picks with hashtag NMEWIN or hashtag T8WIN to at LOL Esports. Over on Twitter, let us know who you think is going to win this one. You can see the team comps up on your screen. A really big, powerful team fight comp for Team 8. Enemy Esports bringing the first Echo to North America in Inox's hands. They're also the first game Echoes available. I guess we can give him the title for having I mean, the first Echo. He gets it. It's not as special as Lost Boy having the first Bard. Because, you know, people That's had fair. their own chances to pick up. Yeah, Afro had a ban against him like four times. It's true. And then it got played against him. It's true. He had the chance Ultimate to pick it, he didn't. I know. How unfortunate. But we are on to the rift, ladies and gentlemen. Week three of North American LCS has begun. Whew. And first damage dealt by Inox. It's basically the game right there. Yeah, well, Cali Trolls GG. says that with a little more time, Team 8 will be a real threat. I feel a lot more comfortable when playing with uh, Nian already. And like we, I don't think we should be judging by our first two weeks right now. We are doing really well on Scrim. And we have potential to beat any team in NA right now, but it just hasn't come out yet due to uh, recent changes in coach and also obviously AD carry. Yeah, as we saw during that right there, Otter sticking his head out a little too deep into the river for that teammate brute force invade. It cost him his flash, and at the end of the day, teammate gets their wards in, but that also meant that enemy was able to get some deep wards in of their own. What I liked most about this teammate invade is they spent a little bit longer to get that ward in their own jungle so that they could track where enemy entered for those own wards. So this time it was basically all wins for teammate. They got the wards they wanted as well as scouting enemy and they burned the flash. And a really good start for these guys. Deep utility tree for Porbus in order to afford all the wards and everything. Just for the interesting insight into his Mastery choices, and here we go. Porpoise and Cali Trolls will be double jungling up on this red buff here. And on the safe side of the map, as their dual lane is down on that side, as enemy have lane swapped. Yeah, they're... Be interesting here what Trashy's read is. He should know with their lane swap that he needs to invade the enemy red. Otherwise, he'd be in danger of a bit of a three buff, but this should be a relatively standard open. And I believe both lanes were able to get a freeze. Uh, looking Double into it now, it looks like Sivir is actually pushing her yeah. lane. And Jinx Otter was unable game. to get the freeze. I think this is the standard par for the course when your junglers start on this side of the map correctly. Is when you, you do the, the, yeah, the, the fourth wave turret push. Jinx will be a little bit better than Sivir, but Sivir has Janna, who's better than Thrash, and knocking turrets down. So as far as cumulative turret killing power, I would say it's close. Oh. Leash's back didn't heal though. Interesting little didn't interaction that right there. Yeah. A lot of times when a leash is back, it will start healing because you've hit the three soft leash recap. But it didn't look like they hit the leash cap, and for some reason the red walked away. Once in a while, I see a leash like that. Yeah. It basically just looks like these guys are going to be doing four-man turret pushes right now. Uh, neither team is trying to prep three or four people to race down and catch the big wave that wasn't froze. Because there's a couple of different options you, you have in these situations. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, it looks like they're just going to be trading each other's jungles and going for the turret kills. At, at, the, at the moment, it's actually, it's actually both teams hoping for a dive. They're, they're kind of hoping that someone shows up at that turret to get experience. But no one is that foolish. There's going to be four people in there taking the turret. Yeah, and teammate actually managed their turret dive quite a bit better. I think enemy will still knock the turret down, but teammate had, had cleared all the camps a bit faster. They've got... Uh, a bigger wave to push it down. I believe the bottom turret will actually die first as well, depending how they want to balance this, though. Yeah, okay, so if they're just going to balance the wave. Looks like enemy will be right on time. That last minion dies, and they will build a freeze for the top laner. Yep. Looks like teammate will have the same after all. So even though teammate did jungle slightly faster, it did not matter. Well, they could get the dragon. That's the only, oh, yeah, you're right. that's the only main difference when you have this particular lane swap. Whoever decides to go top lane does forfeit a little bit of dragon control. It's interesting what we're seeing out of a lot of these North American teams is a, it's a very macro focused style, but it also really diminishes the risk taking these teams are willing to do in the early game. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I definitely am hoping for some more aggressive play this week. 
because I think there's some windows for exploitation on the slowness that a lot of these teams are doing. But if both teams are doing the same thing, then technically there's not those weaknesses to be exploited. True. And that's what happened here. Teammate with the dragon, turret trade, small advantage. Speaking of small advantages, Slushi also slightly had on Inox here, who's been pushed into his turret the entire time on Echo. The CS lead not massive, but is a small lead for the Team 8 mid laner. Meanwhile, we see as the lanes come back to normal, Flares will be holding that freeze top lane. He'll be facing Nien. And of course, the opposite scenario down to the bottom side is Aldrin bided up to push in towards Cali Trolls. Yeah, and the tricky thing about this mid lane matchup is Inox gets a little bit aggressive. Is that type of aggression he actually can't do frequently at all with the lane swaps because there's usually two people MIA on the map at all times. It's not mm -hmm. just a jungle gank you have to worry about. It's a jungle gank and a support gank and a top lane gank and all the things, which basically turns mid lane into a farm war until you get sufficient ward coverage down. It's actually, in my opinion, pretty solid of Enox to have the CS he has as a melee right now against Slushy's Azir early on. Yep, he went flash to try to keep himself alive. That should be working out pretty well for him. Porpoise. So far, playing the control game quite nicely. He got to take the bottom scuttler. Get away, pink forge should get the top one on top of that one. Inox still getting dropped low, but he's still like holding up in CS, though he is now out of potions after this one times out. Yep. Just doing his best. He's gonna have to back real short. Yeah, he's he's got, out of mana, he can't stay any longer. He's got 1450 gold. Hold on, Porpoise yeah. says hello to Trashy. Smite consume matches to level four, and Dodo's already here. Good flash by Trashy to stay alive. But there's already a jinx in this one. The die from teammate is surely gonna work. First blood goes to Cali Trolls. Porpoise has aggro, jumps right back out. They knock down flares on top of it. And now body drops getting caught out. A summer heal keeps Cali Trolls alive. And it's three kills for zero under a turret. Enemy's seen this one before. Oh boy, that is like the classic 4v3 early game, except it happened on the second turret when people were much higher levels. The reason this was so disastrous for NME is because they were funneling in slowly to go defend that turret, which was being slow pushed with a big minion wave by Team 8, and they didn't account for the missing members of the team. So instead of waiting a little bit, grouping up and attempting the turret take as a group, they went in one by one because they didn't want to lose CS, and because the rest of Team 8 was there, uh, they ended up getting crushed. Obviously Obviously, it all started in the jungle with Porpoise onto Trashy, but that's the general gist. It was not a clean rotation by NME, and Teammate punished it. Well, really good by Teammate. Then looks like with a 3,000 gold lead, they've done a great job of setting their early games quite nicely here. And looking for the first one on the board, this might be the setup they need to do so. Right now, NME not going to lose their blue buff off that, and they will be able to set up Inox for this blue, assuming he wants it. Right now, he's got to clear this wave under his turret, but... Knocks it down. Yeah, he probably wants it. It's just <laughs> over. He goes. I he's imagine. so pushed into his turret that he loses a lot of time every time he goes back. Yeah, he's going for it right now. Rexai, no need for such things as blue buff. What a start by teammate here. So not trashy only not only do they do the oh trashy took the blue. I I think it. Why? I don't know what actually Why took it though. I don't, I don't think I saw him auto attack. I looked at sort of passively over on my screen and you I didn't quite see what stole the follow damage. Follow the play by play. I will watch it on All my right. own screen here. All right, you tell me what happens. Meanwhile, teammates still playing very aggressively. Porpoise and Dodo duo invading to kill another pink ward. Inox can't get into his own jungle at all. I, I, I don't understand what happened, Freak, with this blue steel. It looks so strange. And a four-man push by teammate into the mid lane. They just keep making the rotations happen. The early Nunu pressure. Anos comes in for the stun. They're going to catch Nien for a lot of damage, though. And he will go down to Trashy. Yeah, and we talked about the positioning from Nien and how important it would be. And he's just com caught completely out of spot right there. Anox doesn't have to really do much to oh, kill him. Oh, the flash to Maybe get it. More. The flash made the slow land. He got the passive tick and everything. Two, zero, and one on Echo from Inox. This is a very strange game right there, how all of that turned around, seemingly at the drop of a hat for Hold enemy, on. and they continue. Flash, Narlti, Slushy flashes the wall to get away. He will survive, but maybe not. Trashy still on the hunt. Of course, Tremor Sense lets him know what's going on. I think he'll live. 
Oh, the mid lane boy. turret will not. And enemy esports ties up the turret game. They've tied up the kill game, and now they're ahead in gold. So for everything the teammate did in the early game to get that lead with the quick rotations and the dragon fight and catching them in the top lane, that's all gone now. Yep. Because enemy wins one massive fight as well as being able to take a turret afterwards. Now their ability to engage and pick fights. They've got engage tools with Nar and Rek'Sai. They've got the Civ Rolti, and they've got Echo for follow-up. While teammate have a good five on five, they can get picked out. And yeah. Exactly what we saw, but Nian with Blood Boil will answer back the turret as enemy were forced to recall and buy off their recent victories. Yeah. Going back a bit, you can notice Kali Trolls in the bottom lane without his TP right here, so enemy know that they can get a 5 before, they just have to go in slow. It's mainly because teammate wasn't respecting the Echo zone of control right there, and Yen gets stand, stunned, and that ends up turning it into a 5v3. Plus, you have to add in the fact that they had a Sivir ult. Porpoise is not level 6, so he can't zone with his Absolute Zero. And yeah, teammate just gets completely run down, all because of the open from Inox's Echo, I have to say. All right, so we sit back at a game 500 gold apart and with a dragon lead for Team 8. So all said and done, the smallest of leads for the red team. Cali Trolls will have teleport very soon. He's got a completed Cinder Hulk with Challenging Smite on top of that. So a scary Hecarim definitely galloping around the map. It's a 23 minion lead, 21 minion lead for this Hecarim here. So certainly a scary top laner. He's even got 100% kill participation. Yeah, but with all the rotations, something that's happened is Porpoise has fallen incredibly far behind in CS. Oh, like, wow. He's a, yeah. a 13 CS Nunu at 11 minutes. I wonder if he's, when they were double jungling, if he was giving some of the CS to Kali instead of taking it as a jungler I because they're was. both going for jungle items. Mm -hmm. But that just puts him so far in the support role. Yeah. As far as needing zone control with Nunu, he just doesn't have it right now because he's... He's so starved for gold. Yeah, he's 500 gold down. I think some that mitigates it is that he has been um, taking Scuttlers more often, so that'll slightly deflate the CS numbers. I mean, 500 it's gold still disparity 500 is... 500 gold down oh, I mean, certainly, a jungler. Yeah, I definitely agree he's behind. I just think we'll have to see what he can do then with his Sightstone Rush and no other combat stats then, because he's certainly squishy. Vision Control was what Teammate was trying to do. The one mistake cost them, but... They have been trying to play an objective game. At least they will have that blood boil no matter how farmed he is. And they can make Azir or Jinx carry their team fights. Kali Trolls has yeah. become the primary tank with Cinder Hulk Rush. So Pretty much. It, it basically maybe just, it pans out. It basically switches their team into a double support. Uh, instead of a, a new new front line, he's kind of more of a supportive bot right now. Uh, but Kali Trolls is ahead because of it, right? He was able to finish his Cinder Hulk early. Mm -hmm. Flares is still waiting on his item timings. Uh, and with the Dragon live and Kali Trolls having his teleport up, this would be the time where they'd have to go in and try and make an impact with it. All right, double TP and attempted frozen mallet for Flares, which he will not have for another thousand gold or so, but that was his intended way of bullying around Kali Trolls. Again, Cinder Hulk, Hecarim, definitely scary. And we're going to see... Pretty much equal items for those 80 carries, equal items roughly for the mid laners, although we are waiting for Slushy to finish his Merlinomicon. He has money for it, he just hasn't backed in a very long time. Flare's now in a battle, Calitro's very far ahead! He's gonna dive right on in and cannot quite get what he was looking for as Flare's gets away over the wall. And now Slushy is caught, he is flashless, but he's inside a wall <laughs> and gets away. Yeah, a little bit of a bug there as he EQ'd over the wall. Could have been visual, not sure there, but he escapes with his EQ, Shurima Shuffle, whatever we want to call it. Uh, but because Kali Trolls all the top, because Slushi is low, it means enemy is now going for this dragon. Kali Trolls could still teleport in. It is thinking about being contested. The Nar TP should call it off. Nar TP does come in. Mini Nar, though, means he's not the most threatening, but it will not be contested as they are missing their star mid laner. Dragons equalized. Gold still 1,000 apart, though, as teammate feeling good about the places they're getting farm. And it's actually largely on Cali Trolls, still. Yeah. So the early CS he was able to get, kind of at the cost of Porpoise, it seems, uh, was giving him that big edge. It was a two-level advantage he had over Flares, but he could not convert the kill, which is pretty key. And then because of what happened in the mid lane, enemy was able to take the dragon afterwards. So it's kind of been a game of teammate having a decent strategical edge, but then either misplaying or getting a little bit caught out just position-wise uh, that enemy is able to capitalize on that small, on those small things, which is all that enemy's team is built around here. Sivir ultimate to engage them, mm -hmm. 
They need to be able to have really clever echo positioning to get around all the Azir and Jinx things. Yeah. And Thrash is already very good peel support, and you've got Azir to help. Like, good luck dealing with that backline. You're absolutely right. Again, standard battle lines just simply would not work for enemy esports. So we'll see what kind of trickery they can get themselves involved in. Blue buff goes over. Enemy gonna feel okay about that one. Inox only down 12 CS. He's mostly staunched the flow of bleeding in that lane. He hasn't bought in a long time either, though, sitting on 800 gold, actually. I guess he just picked up boots and a Doran's ring. Yeah. He's got so much mana, though. Second Doran's ring, blue buff, and Merlin Amakan just feels like infinite. Yeah, and Echo will definitely be okay. Mana yeah. wise. Yeah. With this build. Inox is pretty much always going to be sitting in full mana. He's he's struggling against the pushing power of this Azir though. And yeah, with the turret up like this, he's got so little room he could even stand in. Because of course Yeah. And how safe is Azir? You can just keep poking at him and Well, it's mainly because of this ward coverage that Porpoise and the rest of the team have been able to set up with du this double sight stone this early in the game. Porpoise obviously getting it even before his Cinder Hulk enchantment. Littering that side of the jungle with wards, and that's allowing Slushy to play that aggressive mid lane play. Mm -hmm. If not for teammate being caught out of position those couple of times, they would be crushing this game. But because they have been, they're leaving the door open for enemy. Well, we'll see if enemy can walk through that door, because right now they're just simply sitting in their lanes. Kalichols continues to have the gigantic push lead topside and then is also stealing away some jungle as much as he can. Flares will show up to the lane late, but only after losing that wave of minions to that tier 2 turret. Bot lane basically equal. There is some turret damage coming through, and Trashy has come alongside Inox to maybe knock that one down. There will be a Nunu defending, but the 4v3 should be more than enough. But Inox is forced to retreat back down to his mid lane or he loses that turret. Yeah, as long as teammate keeps the map pressure up here. Uh, that was basically what prevented that push, is the fact that Azir could have pushed down the second tier mid turret, and it wasn't worth enemy committing four against three, where they maybe would not even have gotten the mm -hmm. turret. Even a trade itself would have sucked. It's a mid, it's a you know tier one for a tier two. So yep. yeah, so far enemy kind of forced to play in the same lanes. Cali trolls because he has such a big push lead, he's able to like leave the lane for like a minute and a half, clear three or four jungle camps, and then show back up there. Like a Nunu who doesn't need a lot of farm, all he has to do is be a ward bot. They've got a basically secondary jungler to pick up that farm anyway. The gold isn't even disappearing off the map. Teammate's still farming it all. Yeah, CS wise. It's definitely there. It's kind of interesting what enemy is doing here because they've littered the bottom side of the map, dragon wide with wards, but they just moved their entire team up where they don't have ward coverage means they can't be very safe wherever yeah. they go. Definitely a risk for sure. Two to three in turret kills, though. Enemy missing all their outers. The bot lane not quite dead yet, but close to it. Dragon up in two minutes. That will be in time for Flares' teleport. Cali Trolls can't use his for the next two minutes, or it will be down for that important objective. We just keep seeing the top laners push back and forth. Frozen Mallet finally done for Flares. That should help his 1v1. I want to see if that tilts the matchup much more. I still feel like it's Hecarim flavored, but... I'm not much of a top laner myself. Uh, the matchup right now? Hecarim yeah. Versus Frozen Mallet. Just since Frozen Mallet's in. But yeah. speaking of Hecarim versus Frozen Mallet, how about Hecarim versus Otter? Good spell shield knocks, stops the knockback, and then Kelly Trolls misses that as well. I'm actually surprised he didn't knock down the spell shield. Normally you rampage a quarter second before E, and you, you pretty much can't spell shield it. Yeah, that is very true. You also kind of have to add in the fact that Kali Trolls is on the tank Hecarim, and especially against the Janna who can peel after the burst, mm -hmm. it's going to be really hard for Kali Trolls to actually apply pressure to Otter. That's true. Uh, this may may have been one of the matchups where he'd want to go with the Ignite. Uh, to speak to the Hecarim Nar matchup as well, once Nar gets the Frozen Mallet, he can really keep Hecarim at bay in most situations from range form. And Nar can really start to actually bully Hecarim just because of the existence of that item. Wow. He's sitting 1,100 gold down, so if that does happen for Flares, that just kind of shows you how much of a key that item is. Also a level down. I want to see if this does play out any well. Right now, Kelly Troll is just happy to keep farming, going for the Spirit Visage second, it looks like. And Dragon's going to be up in 24 seconds here. Kelly Trolls, of course, did use Teleport to make that play to the bot side, so TP advantage for this Dragon spawn for enemy esports. They seem happy to play just for the drags right now and letting themselves farm. They have the mid lane cleared first. 
they've just recalled on almost the entire team. Very, very few people on that squad have golden pockets. Similar situation for teammate, though they have a bit more outstanding. Yeah, they've been so passive after that early uh, getting caught in a position by teammate. And this has been a struggle of teammates kind of throughout throughout all of their struggles is yeah. Cali Trolls as their shot caller. They haven't been able to find the right ways of kind of capitalizing on any early advantages. It happened last week. Uh, it seems to be happening again. There's They're supposed to be implementing a better system now with History Teacher. In the end coming in, everyone really loves his positive attitude. Mm -hmm. It helps them make calls in game. Uh, I imagine it's working very well in practice, but as far as actually on the LCS stage, we haven't seen it come together. Yeah. But meanwhile, we're actually seeing enemy esports, the one actually making aggressive choices. They did secure the dragon. They've now lane swapped Inox to the bot lane. He got the turret because of it. And now Otter is being sent to the mid lane to hold this. Gives body drop more room to roam around from this sort of base of operations. And it looks like enemy esports have managed to put in a good number of aggressive wards onto the other side of the map. Meanwhile, we don't see any at all from Team 8, so the ward game is going the way of the blue team right now. Yeah. But because Dragon was just taken, there's just really not many objectives up on the map. This is kind of your classic game of three turrets down on both sides. Because they've traded advantages, uh, neither team really wants to overcommit into a choke point because that's when they run the risk of getting destroyed. I mean, if, if Slushy now with the Death Cap and Relan Omicron ever catches enemy in a bad spot, he's going to be able to crush them with his ear. Whereas, teammate, if they try and get aggressive, they always run that risk of walking into an Echo clone who then alts back and kills everyone. Absolutely. Yeah, chasing into an Echo team is super risky, absolutely. Especially an AP Echo. He's gotten Relan Omicron into Luden's Echo. I've seen Death Cap pretty commonly on him as well, but looks like he's going for the slightly higher mobility build. And they've got a several do right on the Dodo, and Baron they're going to knock control. him down. Baron Control is the next logical step. 20 minutes into the game, teammate did not have the ward control. Get an easy pick with Sivaroth. Here comes Inox. Yeah, careful though. They're right on top of his ear turret next. Got to get right back out of this one. And in comes Hecarim. The cavalry has arrived. He's knocked down flares. The chase still coming. Slushy wants a lot to do. Jinx helping as well. Porpoise zoning back. But Otter knocks a kill down. Five to four. Spell shields the Ice Blast. Dodges a zap just by running away. And Slushy is still cleaning up. Two for two so far. Inox on the back side. Very chaotic fight coming in there with a half turret dive into Cali Trolls entering from the backside. It is teammate that comes out a little bit on top health bar wise. They're trying to get a push down the mid lane right now. And this could be very successful. They're five seconds away from the next minion wave. Flares and Otter both dead. That's pretty much their, I guess they do have Echo still for wave clear tools, but it's not a lot. Trashy is kind of waiting around at half health, not able to do anything except soak a minion's worth of experience. Body drop can't help either. Teammate are gonna have Porpoise slowed, but there's no engage. Yeah, it's because all of their damage dealers were far, far away. Yeah. Inox with the CDR Echo build. I'll talk about that a little bit. His recommended items for Echo uh, are Luden's Echo and Lich Bane. Uh, just to kind of multiply his AP ratios mm -hmm. up there a little bit. And because with his E, he gets a lot of auto attacks off. Plus the move speed is great for his assassination CC pattern. Uh, as you can see here, it was just Dodo going alone to try and get a ward in. They were worried of a Baron rush. He could have waited another five or 10 seconds to get some backup to go in there because the Baron would not have been down quickly enough. Uh, outside of that, they then try and dive on top of an Azir turret, but there's never going to be any follow-up and they have no eyes on the Hecarim. And here goes Slushy. Ooh, Flash talking about a Slushy. The ult is gonna buy a bit of time, but not nearly enough. Inox takes him out without even having a flash over the wall. Another one for Azir, and this time no Azir turret to stop any further pushing. Yeah, just a really messy game right here. It's going to just come down to positioning properly and getting the right wards up, but mainly sticking together as a team. A lot of split decisions being made by individuals here that are costing them. Sometimes in an overly patient game, patience is the key, which is what's happening right now, because mm -hmm. uh, all the mistakes are actually being, some of the mistakes are being capitalized on pretty harshly. Enemy wants to dive here. Oh, Ooh. they land the sun in a porpoise. They go in, but Inox taking a whole lot of damage. Chain fear, chain TC, it ults back in, but Ignite is on. He's got to run away. A lot of damage dealt. Ricochet cannot quite claim any victims, except maybe this turret going down after three more auto attacks. Teammate zoned away. Enemy esports get the kill off the earlier Slushy pick. Yeah, Inox was in the turret long enough that his clone was actually able to do damage to some of his opponents. Where's this Jinx Rocket going? Oh, man. Ooh. 
Well, he's fine. Still look cool. Unfortunately, no fantasy points for sweet looking ults for the end. It's true. Definitely true. Uh, one one thing we haven't kind of touched on. Uh, you always mentioned in Challenger, Nian's team would pretty much always lane swap to get him into the mid game. Yeah. In a good spot. Well, that's what Team Eight ended up doing this game. They had the lane swap, and as we can see against Otter, Jinx versus Sivir, they're pretty much even in CS. So this is a game where Nian doesn't have to play from a deficit. He has the same items, uh, and honestly, Team 8 should have the better team fighting team, yep. as long as they're not caught out of position by some sneaky Inox plays. And at this point, Jinx is now a bigger damage threat than Sivir in about 95% of team fights, so it only gets better for here from Nian. And again, Blood Boil is amazing. Still only one point, though. Porpoise has three and consume maxed Ice Blast. The, I believe, five attack speed per level on Blood Boil does not seem to be worth it for him to put any more points into that just yet. I also kind of think it should be Blood Boiling the Azir. Sure. I feel like Azir does more damage. That's fair. In these team fights. Secondary Blood Boil target will be Jinx. Okay. Trust you in that one. I like the Black Cleaver Hecarim once again uh, from Cali Trolls. Okay, yeah. Something players did earlier. I think it's a great Hecarim item. I think it especially fits because he hasn't gone Triforce. I think you can't afford to get more than one offensive item. Right. On most melees here, so... With Center Hulk, it does fit the build. Uh, at the moment, though, teammate just has to stall a little bit and then teleport in, but they don't have flank wards for the teleport to come in. Kali Trolls is trying to recall four home guards, but he can't do that yet. He comes in late and doesn't have home guards. Dragon 3 already picked up, and the Sivirulti to get the team out. Enemy Esports clean, Dragon take, and the retreat. They miss an ult for it, and they give pressure on the mid lane for teammate, which they're going to use right away to clear the wave. And what can they pressure? Except Baron. They can try and pressure Baron. They're going it's a boards. bit of a desperation play right here. They just fumbled their teleport play. If they're going to be threatening a home guard teleport dragon, they have to have the Hecarim base. That's why enemy was able to rush it. Now they're scrying orb on top of the Baron. Sivirult has been burned, so the initiation potential isn't that great for yeah. enemy. They just had to show up. That's all they had to do. They had to look at teammate, and they had to go off the Baron. And teammate didn't want to engage. They had the Kalitros ulti, but they think they thought it was not going to be enough to pick the fight. They do get themselves over to this left side of the map, though, and they've also pinched top lane, so in the grand scheme of things, they've gotten in, but they're still unwilling to push in. Flares will have Mega Nar. Azir ult says, don't you even dare try. And if they were a minion wave, that would be a turret kill, but teammate, do not stick for it. Yeah. It's still a very close game yeah. after all of this. And honestly, these are teams that are looking for wins wherever they can get them. Teammates still needing their first win of the split. It's become more and more about this Baron now. And knowing that there's already an Azir ult down, uh, it's, and no teleport for the Hecarim, there's uh, some very real vision gains that can be made by enemy right here, if they can sweep properly and deny the vision from teammate. Uh, right now, they're going to have teammate hold the mid lane up. No lanes got pushed off those recalls. Enemy just kind of sat around Baron and hoped they could bait the enemy team in. That didn't happen here. Otter has to be afraid of Kali Trolls a little bit. Janna Shield says, I feel good. And we're again at a 1,000 gold game. Of course, neck and neck here. Teammate at 0-4. Enemy Esports at 2-2 two two in the overall North American LCS. Now that enemy have had a couple more weeks to work with Trash, he seems his individual performance has gotten a bit better throughout the split. Inox still seemingly the hard carry of the team. Great Echo game so far. Yeah, I want to see if he can transition that into these late game team fights because, yes, we've seen Echo do some really crazy things, but now that he's been out a bit longer, oh, all, all two and a half weeks, mm -hmm. if teammate can avoid following into the ultimate, and if Echo can't get off his ultimate, his, his effectiveness is greatly diminished a lot and especially with this enemy team like they don't have too much to actually lock people in echoes w so he can get the stun reliably and less trash he goes in you know really well with kind of a flash rexai knockup to get them started uh, really we have to pay attention to inox in these fights because he will he will make or break this game for enemy and so far he's made it 100 percent kill participation four of his team's six kills you think it's pretty much all about him in this one Enemy Esports have just taken turns having one of their players carry. In their breakout game, it was Otter's Vein. This game, it's Inox's Echo. And earlier, they had almost gotten the win off of 
Flares is a rally, but he this time around, they're gonna get the knockup and the stun on a porpoise. Nunu gets a lantern out, the box comes in, and they just cannot get the kill. Inox at half health, forced ult out for no damage, and the counter engage comes in. Kali Trolls knocks back Trashy, gets one, and now the tanky Hecarim. Yeah, and will not go down. just going back in. No Finally. ult this time, though. But look at the follow up a double kill for Azir. Jinx is in the fray, Nien. Can't quite catch body drop, but it's a three for one, four for one. Yeah, and making or breaking that game. Inox could jump in, but he never got a good ultimate off. He had to go back. They couldn't finish Porpoise. Focusing Porpoise and Thresh in the first place doesn't deal with the real issues of this team, which is Nien and Slushi, despite being down three dragons with the superior late game team fighting composition. Teammate takes that fight heavily in their favor, four for one, plus the Baron afterwards. So that was, that's what teammate needed. Yeah, looking at this one more time as well, it, Inox saw the pick opportunity, but honestly, the real pick opportunity was Porpoise and, was Slushi and Yen down on the bottom. All these people up top are just distractions. Teammate down at the bottom of the screen are the real guys, Slushi coming over the wall, and the Azir damage is the real threat because enemy could never funnel in at the right moment. Inox gets chunked Jeez. by those Azir shots. It allows Nian to come in from the back afterwards. It feels like enemy aren't respecting the fact that a five on five is not good for them. You can't chase through Azir and Jinx with proper peel. Just the damage is, just feels too high. Yeah, it, it really appears like enemy got trapped into a fight there because they were going for the quick pick kill onto Porpoise. When they didn't get it, they saw the lantern, they saw how low he was, they thought they could keep chasing. It ended up kind of tricking them into a team fight. Now they're against a barrened up Azir Jinx team, uh, completely on the back foot despite being up dragons. Yeah, that's pretty rough. And Dragon up in 45 seconds. That will be during the Baron buff of Teammate, meaning they might get a second one themselves. Top lane tier two being defended for now. Kelly Trolls is killing a ward on the flank. Like, enemy has to know a tower dive could happen here. And the tank line, I feel like, is big enough that they could tower dive. Kelly Trolls walks away after pressuring the mid lane, but that gives enough time for top tier two to go down. Teammate flip pushing quite cleanly. Yeah. Even with. Baron minions, Sivir is still a pretty good wave clearing champion, but because of the split push there by Kali Trolls, it sucks enough. Attention down to the mid lane, and I'll let them get the outer turret. It's the outer turrets there. I call them the middle tier turrets, I guess. That are the ones that are the real target of the first Baron of the mm -hmm. game. That's mainly what teammate is focusing on getting here. If they got an inhibitor turret, it would be a big win. Yeah, there's always a chance. A misstep or a great play can always end you up with more than you expected to have. We had a fairly slow game for the first 20 minutes, but recently it's picked up. Slushy gets a blue buff steal on his way out, and Kali Trolls will even try to snag this red. Now, he is alone in this one. It's flashes, but he has the ulti. Gets away with his life. Red buff will go to Otter after all. Now, Dragon's up, and all of teammate have already recalled in time. You notice the like, enemy esports they don't even try to ward the river. They're like, yeah, you're right. That's that's yours. Enjoy the dragon. And here's the big thing. Kali Trolls back in base. I thought he was going to wait for home guard TP threat, but he just ends up running down and they take the dragon anyway. Would have been great uh, to prep a dragon, but because it was uncontestable anyways. Ooh, NX not quite in range. Lich Bane, Ludens. Uh. He, he timed out by now. Hey. He's not going to get him. Well. At least he's pushing the wave. And yeah. they have a head start on this wave. Teammate has to go yeah. back to base with the slow recalls. Oh, Nian unwilling to base trade. thought about base trade. That, but he should. Uh, he has no words to, to know that it's safe, though, is the problem. Yes, because they did If he knew all five was enemy. there. Yeah, exactly. Like, now they, they see three or four of them. They know the only guy missing is the jungler. But yeah, the threat of Inox, I guess, too high. And Yin will not split push that turret down. All the neutral objectives now off the map. We have about three minutes on Baron. Look at the ward, the lack of wards right now. One scrying orb, it's on Nien. We know that enemy needs to be able to get a quick pick to win these fights if they can catch someone oh, scattered out of position. Wow. Teammate, they're like, we see Sivir. It's a bait. I'll bet you they're all in that brush. <laughs> that ping is what that meant. Yep. That was slick. Yeah, and a big wave stacking in the bottom. Need to be cleared. The funny thing is, enemy being stuck in the base means basically nothing. Both their buffs are gone. Dragon and Baron are gone for two and a half to five minutes for each one. 
teammate, like, there's literally nothing worth them warding, really. They're going to be the aggressive team, it looks like. They just get wards back in the yeah. bottom left of the map, at best. And Slushy hits some really powerful item breakpoints right now with Ludens and Deathcap to go with his Void and Relinomicon. The first soldier move with an auto attack, just that, placing a soldier, queuing into someone with it, rocking the Ludens, and then also having the soldier hit you once, is at least half of Inox's health or Otter's health if he doesn't spell shield. And that's not even where Azir gets most of his damage, which is from a sustained fight. But oh. they're trying to pick off Nyan. Where's the positioning? Teleporting in. No home guard for the Hecarim. Azir is far away and as no well. It's going to be a bit of a 4v3 at the start of it all. They jump in on the port because they cannot catch Nyan. His own only hits Trashy and Cali Trolls. Very tanky in the front. Dodo shows up. Porpoise still taking damage. Cali Trolls just refuses to go down. Finally picked up by Flares. And there's more coming in for Inok. Azir now joins the fight. Can Slushi get anything here? The carries of Team Teammate are still alive, but their front line is gone, so they have to be very hesitant about how they approach this. A hook would be great right now. Enemy running towards the other team's base, but they have the speed, and because of the lack of front line, it's very hard for teammate to approach. Not a group right there when they were caught out of position. Enemy yeah. gonna try and push the mid lane. Teammate jumped into enemy territory without enough wards, without their mid laner. Enemy smart enough to capitalize on that one, and they get a nice surge of gold to almost tie the game back up. One minute on Baron, and enemy may have the control to get wards over that first. And in fact, that's exactly what Body Drop is doing. Teammate still in position to win this game, of course with their team comp. And yeah, it was basically, I, I don't necessarily know why they were down there without the Azir. They could have just had a little bit more patience and pushed it as a team. Uh, but because they did not, you can see this very crazy fight breakout. Enemy, you know they're far behind. They didn't even have the cleanest win there. Flares almost fell down. But Inox basically just picking off whoever he could because the realistic damage threat is Slushy and he is there very late. He doesn't. Uh, even get soldier damage over the wall once he does arrive, and ends up being a very lackluster collapse from Slushy's Azir. And these 80 carries, despite all the crazy things that have happened throughout this game, of course, were very close in, and they are sitting on equal items, which, again, at three and a half, just means more for the Jinx. Baron now alive, Dragon in two minutes. A lot of farm on basically everyone. And yeah, this is rushing real this down. dangerous, but they do have the Azir. It's good zone control. Let's watch this fight. Done for He's Echo done. to catch the end, and Baron Nasher goes to the red team. Everyone is alive still from Team 8. Slushy will get chunked pretty hard by Inox. They're going for Cali Trolls now. Trashy is going to be the first one knocked down. A double kill as Otter's also dropped. Down goes Flares as well. It's a 5v2 now. Team 8 is so superior in team fights that they can just start the Baron like that. Get their AD carry stunned by an Echo and still come out on top in the team fight. Now with Baron and 30 second death timers on three main members of enemy, just in Ox and Body Drop. This could be the game freak. It could be indeed 22 seconds to go till any of the uh, valuable members respawn here. Mid inhibitor goes down. Baron buff still there. Inox just does not have the wave clear. He's at half already. Body Drop barely does anything. And look how fast Nien and Slushy knock these turrets down. One more to go. Teammate to get their first win of the split. The dive to Nien. They can't quite get him. That's Brillanomicon, not Ignite. Here's the response. Can they stop the game in time? Slushy diving in a fear from Cali Trolls. One more hit. The Nexus goes down. The first win of the split for Teammate. And it could not have come at a better time. They needed this win. So many difficulties for these guys coming into this game. Slushy playing great, despite the adversity he is facing. So very gutty performance here by teammate. It wasn't the yeah. prettiest game, but it counts. One couple. and four now for them, knocking enemy to two and three. Yeah, absolutely, the scoreline. So one game apart now for both these teams as we've crest the fifth game of the split for both these guys. Teammate looking for that late game insurance. Slushy finding another champion to be successful on. Won his lane by a little bit. Got the enemy turret down as well. In the end, as late game insurance as well. That worked out nicely. And Porpoise donating farm to Cali Trolls. Kalichos was part of 13 of his team's kills. Actually, highest kill participation. Yeah. He missed out on one. They As gave the farm to Kali. Yep. Their top laner juggernaut, Hecarim, and it worked out for him. 
Exactly. As a Hecram, too, it's not one of those guys who can just throw like a Jarvan flag down and get all the assists. Hecram, he's got to be in the fight for a while mm -hmm. in order to get the assist credit. A lot of short range abilities. It's, it's one of those games the teammate needs to have more of funneling things through Cali Trolls and actually getting Mien to the mid late game without a deficit. That's the big thing that they weren't able to do in a lot of their previous games. Nien was yeah. falling behind early on in CS, and then the team obviously couldn't come back from deficits. Being able to get the early game lead, they absorbed enemies mid-game aggression and the pick comp that they were trying to pull out, and eventually, teammate was able to force some team fights down the stretch. Yeah, yeah good job setting up on the bear, and the, the lane swap plan worked out. They. I guess teammate got a dragon for it. Actually, interestingly, enemy is the one that actually initiated team solo mid and team Dignitas. Now for team Dignitas, this will be our first chance to see how they perform with their new jungler, Helios. Yeah, and about Helios, he became a free agent when his team Winter Fox were knocked out of the LCS by TDK in the promotion tournament. Now he is replacing a Zingy, who had been kind of the person carrying Dignitas through the early games in their three wins, but only on Zac. Now, Helios, he's expected to be a better overall jungler, but it's interesting because Zingy was kind of the one winning their games, it felt like. Right. Uh, but granted, those three wins for Dignitas came against opponents who were a combined 1 and 11. We're just going to have to see how this roster change works out. Yeah, and see if Dignitas is really good enough to battle the other big boys at the top of the standings. But meanwhile, speaking of top of the standings team, TSM are seeing blue skies, and they are riding high after once again defeating their rivals, Counter Logic Gaming. Yeah, and there was another breakout performance in that game. It was Lust Boy's Bard. Uh, CC and initiations were a big part of how TSM were able to come out on top in a lot of those team fights. And... TSM looked like TSM right there. They returned to their very familiar and somewhat predict predictable formula of putting Bjergsen on Assassins. He got LeBlanc two games in a row last week, and he carried hard, honestly. Some very impressive score lines. 12-3 and three against Impulse and 8-2 and two against CLG. Yeah, he was over half his team's kills last week. It was pretty incredible. Meanwhile, though, TSM's strategy of let Bjergsen carry isn't new, of course, but Gamsu admits that Team Dignitas are still looking for a way to deal with that mid lane MVP. Team Bjergsen is doing very well. Bjergsen is really difficult to find the fight for the fight. The fight for the Bjergsen is going to be broken, but I don't think any team can find the fight for the fight. So he's yet to identify any weaknesses in the player. That's yeah. always disheartening. Well, what happened at MSI is he had strong laning, but he was vulnerable to ganks there. So when yeah. the rest of his team was falling apart, they could gank him because he was almost trying very hard to win his lane here. In North America, though, teams have definitely not found a way. Yeah, no, absolutely. Especially when he's got like three teammates ar you yeah. know, around that yeah. line. Hard to gank time. three people. <laughs> Centaur gets some wards for him. Either way, they're going to check out starting lineups. And on the blue side is Team Solo mid. In the top lane is Dyrus in the jungle. Santorin, Bjergsen in mid, Wild Turtle and AD Carry, and Lust Boy on support. And the three win, one loss challengers against them here are Team Dignitas on the red side. Gamsu in the top lane. Helios now. First game is Team Dignitas' is jungler. Shifter in the mid lane. Korja Day on AD Carry, and Kiwi Kid on support. And so, yeah, as you mentioned, we got to see just how well Dignitas adapts to this new player. This is their fourth jungler this year. They started with Crumbs, they replaced him with Cloud Wind, they replaced him with Azingi, and now this split, they've replaced him with Helios. Shifter has gone through a whole lot of them. He started his competitive career with Nintendude over on Team Coast or Good Game University. And as the team continues to shift around, we're going to see now what this new Dignitas lineup can do. Yeah, and it's a big testing game here for Dignitas. Being 3-1 after being a team playing in the promotion tournament, a win here would give them temporary control of, sole control of first place in the entire North American LCS. Yeah. Same can be said for Team Soul Mid, because obviously coming into this week, we have five teams tied for first place at 3-1. And, and the question will always be this week, do we see Echo? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, based on last game's Echo, again, Echo had a good start to the game but then wasn't really able to snowball the team to victory. We're kind of seeing that pattern again and again. One thing I always find with new champions when you haven't put in hundreds of games on them is laning phase is what comes first. That's what you learn. Sure. But actually finding mastery of them over in team fights 
it's then the hardest thing to do. And that's where we're seeing a lot of these Echoes fall apart, whether it's from the champion kit or from the player skill, undecided. And it's interesting too, because even when they do succeed in scrims, we tend to see that scrims end up being like a lot looser and like crazier things happen. And yeah. the more one-on-one -on -one based champions do well in scrims, the team's like, oh, Echo works so well, I just keep killing the mid laner. It's like, well, yeah, but you're not on stage. It works differently. Yeah. Notice if you add the pick rate and the ban rate together for Callista, it's a very big number. Um, I'm gonna say it's at least so, 90. Valuable first pick there for Team Solo <laughs> Mid uh, on the Callista thus far. No Gragas or Rek'Sai ban, so those are the two junglers that we're most likely seeing in this game. Team Dignitas gets first crack at if they want one or if they want to play the Echo game because TSM is almost daring them to do so right now. Or even both, Alistair off the table. There are enough team fight mids to make you not too afraid of grabbing one right away because there's always a Victor or a uh, Vladimir chilling in the side as well. Oh, is this Fizz time? Is it Clarity Clairvoyance Fizz? I mean, that's even better than the Smite Teleport in my book. All right, so Fizz either for the mid lane or the top lane then as Rek'Sai has already been locked in for Helios. That's going to be his breakout champion here in his first game on Dignitas. And the flex pick Fizz with being on red side means they can flex at the very last pick. It's true. Uh, even though Fizz doesn't feel like the type of champion Shifter has been playing of late, uh, he's found success on Azir, Vlad, Azir, and Kog'Maw. So the long range poke champions or the late game hyperscalers Fizz got to play much more aggressive in the early game. I think it would be a top lane Fizz if we've seen it. Most it, likely. It has so much play in the LPL. The Cinderhulk Smite top lane Fizz. It recently kind of broke out a bit in the European LCS with Soaz having a very successful game on it. Maybe now we get to see it in North America. Man, talk about fan favorite picks right here. They locked both those in. They just need Poppy to round it out and everyone would love Team Solo mid here. They're taking plenty of time in this one. Bard is going to be the Verlust boy, and someone's going to be playing Echo for Team Solo mid. Yeah. And the Currently. timer actually reset itself, but I'm pretty sure they're still picking Echo. That happened actually. That happened last week in Challenger as well. Uh, for some reason, a champion got locked in right the last second, and the timer reset. Yeah. That's... So I assume they're still playing Echo. We'll go with that. Well, no. Here's the thing. It's Echo. You have to see him twice. He turned back time when you got him. <laughs> He's so amazing. He gives him time. The enemy gets more time to think about their pick. That's uh, It's before his device got injured because he went back 60 seconds and not four. So we're like past life echo, you know. If you read the comic, right, it got like damaged or whatever. It's a great comic. Yeah, it was really fun to read. Okay, so. Hey, there it is. <laughs> you want to make really sure the echo is okay. Echo's in now. Okay, that's the two newest champions to the league that TSM has picked right here. And if... Is it the three newest? It's, it's another one of those flex. I, I'm probably missing Azir or something. I think Azir was in there. Yeah, I forget. Either way, sorry, we're getting way off topic. I apologize, Chad. I'm, I'm really dragging you around here. But Morgana and Sivir are the pickups for Dignitas. So Kiwi Kid, his, I believe, second more game this split. Yeah, you are correct. Uh, uh, today I learned, <laughs> actually. I was telling you earlier. I was yeah. going to ask you, did you know? And then you would have said you did, because I told you earlier. Uh, coming into this game, Kiwi Kid and Lost Boy were the only supports in the North American LCS to play a different support in every game. That breaks today because they're doubling up on more games for Kiwi Kid and doubling up on Bard games for Lost Boy. Speaking of doubling up, how about a couple of tanks up in the top lane here? Solo mid going to lock in. Hecarim for Dyrus with Smite so far, and the Gragas in for Santorin. So you were right, both those junglers do show up, and the blind pick Fizz will be facing the pony up there. Interestingly, we typically see people like playing Fizz into the matchup, but Dyrus seems to not care too much. Yeah, I see that as well. It's one of the champions that can kind of go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Hecarim, but at the end of the day, you're still going to be Hecarim. And they're yes. both going to be effective. They fill very similar roles once they're both farmed up. Uh, it's, it's also a lane where Fizz can farm up when he's against the Hecarim, and then can still provide a lot of AD carry threat. Yeah, Fizz there's definitely... Still a chance, there's still a chance of a flex pick here for Team Toss if they wanted to. That's true, you're right. It's not gonna happen. No, the Kog'Maw here for Shifter, his second of the split as well, I believe. And He's looked down at the pick and ban rates. You mentioned Callista being in every single game. Looks like Gragas has continued that trend as well. His pick and ban rates hit 100%. The AP Cog will come through for Shifter, but Kogma into Echo may be very scary. Definitely not a matchup I have played or seen played just yet. Bjergsen will be our second mid lane Echo in two games here in North America. Yeah. 
I'm looking forward to this one, especially early on in the laning phase. This should be something that Bjergsen wants to take heavy advantage of. Uh, Bjergsen in the spring split had a 10 CS deferential at, at 10 minutes, so he was more than 10 CS up on his opponent. Shifter was negative seven or so. Not to mention, Echo has a stronger early laning phase than Kog'Maw. We could see a very large discrepancy in that laning phase, but the question will be how TSM translates that into the mid and late game, especially against that long range Kog'Maw. That's gonna be interesting to watch for you. Echo could not, at a certain point, Kog'Maw just outranges every single skill Echo has on his kit, like combined. Yep. <laughs> e4, then W, max range and Q afterwards. And you're like, yeah, you're still not even halfway towards me here, so. Uh, we'll see if the sieging can work out and the poke can be strong. The coaches head their way off the field. The players now loading into the game. And so you guys at home can now join in. Send your Twitter predictions to us. Tweet hashtag TSM winner, hashtag DIG win to at LOL Esports. We'll see how you guys are voting once we are on the rift here. Team Solomid, a whole lot of tanks. A Callista with a bard for setup and Echo wreaking havoc. Meanwhile, Dignitas with a lot of split pushing and an AP cog in the back line. And double TP smite in the top lane, which is something we actually haven't seen much of in North America, even though it began as a trend many moons ago. Yeah, back in playoffs. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering if we're going to see some early gank pressure in those lanes. It is, of course, pretty difficult to gank those two if Dyrus is conservative with his E and Gamsu the same. Also with his E, his playful trickster. Yeah, I'm unsure, because you're right, it's flashless lanes, but it's the two best early gankers in the game that are commonly played. Yeah. Mid lane is actually fairly escapeless as well, relative to, like, the LeBlancs and Zeds of the world. Bot lane actually pretty good gank assistance on both sides. Callista chain slow, Morgana bindings, but... I don't know. I actually wonder if there's going to be any easy, successful ganks. There's no, like, Annie's running around, you know? 30 seconds until minions spawn. Right now, Dignitas looked to set up a bait in their jungle. That does not happen, though. No invade for TSM here. They actually invaded the bottom side of the jungle, and that's not where Dignitas was, so... Yeah. A Trinket Ward will spot a Gromp start. Wild Turtle already in top lane position, but completely unspotted to do so. Uh, TSM should should almost assume uh, that Team Dignitas is starting on their red side of the jungle only because the ward that TSM placed is saying that they didn't start at Gromp. So some intel gathered just because the ward didn't see anyone. Mm -hmm. And they will not see Sivir and Morgana going for Gromp. Those two actually would do miserably at that. If they were a blue team, they could have taken the small Krug, but Gromp would suck. Meanwhile, TSM can take easily Gromp themselves. Glista Bard, actually two of the better ones at it. And they're gonna let Lust Boy or Wild Turtle take about two to three attacks, then life steal up the rest, and Lust Boy can just maybe chug a pot if he needs to. Won't even do that. So that's really interesting. Dyrus used an early smite to help with the Krugs. Then checked the lane, saw it was two people freezing, and then just ran away as quickly as possible. Interesting. Uh, also, since TSM is wise to the ways of a Morgana harassing the red buff, uh, decide to not even do it. And this is smart. Lust Boy right after the Gromp, beeline to the top side, essentially the same thing that Kiwi Kid had done. Mm -hmm. Trinket's pretty late in, gets spotted out by the Dignitas duo, but he'll be safe. But here's the main difference. Team Dignitas both got level two, and I feel like that's actually kill threat on the Lust Boy if he walks near. Yeah, yeah, I really like what Team Dignitas, Helios, and Gamsu did with that. Instead of going Krugs to red buff to Raptors, they did Krugs to Raptors to double hit level two, therefore can't be harassed off. And because Lust Boy didn't run straight to the Raptors while they were still level ones, he can do that well. Uh, Lust Boy, yeah, really likes harassing here, but. Gamsu does have Playful Trickster, but so does the rest of TSM as three people show up to this top lane to join where Wild Turtle already was. And they have cut off the Gintas. They will not allow experience to be gained in this lane. Dig have left their dual lane still to the bot side, and now Darius will TP to gain a third lane worth of experience, and TSM should shoot out a little bit ahead as far as levels go in the early game. Ooh, he jumped, jumped into that. 
Really interesting TP there by Dyrus. Uh, knowing that there's max two people down bottom, he teleported in. It could have been matched by a Gamsu teleport to then 3v1 Dyrus and push him off that, but he teleported in with a timing that he was going to be getting a lot of CS regardless, so he has an experience edge now on Gamsu. Really, just micro adjustments that are made early in this laning phase seeming to favor TSM here. And as they try to set up a freeze for this top lane, the rest of the Guntots are heading up here. Gamsu did not teleport out, but Keep in mind, Santorin did recall away, but Dig will walk right through the Sentinel. While Turtle will kill the turret and retreat away, and there will be no scuffle up in this top lane. Bjergsen versus Shifter is actually going Bjergsen favored right now. He's up six minions. And keep in mind, Shifter picked into this matchup. Yeah. So far, is not a great early lead. Seemed fairly obvious that Shifter is picking for the late game. Here. Yeah. Uh, mainly because. That is what AP Cog does, and yeah. it's also what Shifters found success on. What's What's interesting here is, with all the lane swapping, normally when you have these lane swaps, there's a lot of pressure applied mid lane or potential pressure that needs to be respected. But there has been a lot of visions of the opponent this game. So like the top laner, jungler, support, and AD carry have pretty much all not been hidden in Fog of War for the majority of the game. Yeah. Uh, therefore, the mid lane can actually get a little bit aggressive. And Bjergsen actually not applying that much pressure early on against Shifter's Kog'Maw. Now with Double Dorans, we'll see if he can actually get a lead. If Bjergsen doesn't get a lead in that lane, it, to me, is considered a lost lane. I agree with you on this one. So we'll see if Bjergsen... Everything else I say you disagree, but this time... Hey, 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 whoa, well, not everything. <laughs> Just, you know, most things. Yeah. It's fine. My puns are funny, for example. You don't think so, but that's all right. I forgive you for your lapse in judgment. TSM will be in their lane swap over a little bit longer. Lustboy is actually still roaming around the map. He is still level... Oh, no, he's three. Sorry, I misread that. Lustboy has been gaining some experience over time, but hmm. still underleveled somewhat. Dyrus is four. 600 gold lead for TSM from the lane swap game. They managed to knock down the top turret off of that 4v2 sort of scenario. Yeah. And not nearly as much damage as dealt by the Dignitas duo. Once Dyrus TP'd in, Lustboy Magical Journey is over to award. He will not easily push this Fizz around, but you're seeing how far back Gamsu has to play. Both top laners very low in minions here. It's true, but the main difference, of course, that turret, it wasn't even a turret trade, it was just because of Dyrus' teleport down to the bot lane, it's just an entire turret yeah. that TSM was able to get. Quite rare. And it's interesting as well, TSM's lane assignment afterwards. They've left Wild Turtle in top lane. Oftentimes you see a turret go down, they'll recall for an item, and then try to like match the lane or knock another turret down. TSM are staying in this two-on-one without a turret, which completely zones Fizz away. He's under so much threat. <sighs> Nearly ends his done. <laughs> but he, like we saw this happen with Cloud9 when they played, I think it was Dignitas, when Balls was forced to play Jungle Rise. Right. The turret died. He was in a bad matchup that he couldn't deal with. It was Gravity, I think. Um, and we're seeing the same thing happen where Gamsu is not allowed to lane, really. And this Fizz just doing nothing. Where Dyrus yeah. now has 27 CS, 29. It's still growing. It's in these situations where Kiwi Kid needs to be the roamer that assists this. He needs to be helping Gamsu out in these lanes. He is not doing anything in the bottom lane to Core JJ. He's not denying Dyrus. He's not saving Core JJ. And it's allowing TSM to apply this huge amount of pressure. So it's really just Kiwi Kid not being able to follow Lustboy or the rest of TSM that's resulting in this really big turret damage on this middle turret. I don't think they'll get it, but man, that is a lot of damage on it. That's yeah, an itemless Callista, and she's still getting it down to one quarter health at this point. The Gutas now have three members defending, and it may be enough to scare everyone else away. But certainly a great thing for TSM. That turret does not regenerate, and the shield's only 30 points big, so the next trip over will certainly do plenty of damage. Are they going to try uh Yes, they are. Big old There's the W. Shifter. There's everyone. Shifter flashes and ghosts, and he will survive and nearly kills. He, oh, does, he does kill Lust Boy. The overextension on Bard. Shifter says, please, what are you guys doing? He dodges all the CC with his flash. Lust Boy takes too many turret shots. No one lands onto Shifter. It did cost him both his summoner spells, but that is absolutely worth it. A three man gank onto Shifter, and he's the one that walks away with first blood. And speaking of walking away, Wild Turtle also found himself in a bit of a 1v2 in the top lane uh, jungle and was forced to flash away from a Kiwi Kid binding. So uh, now TSM, despite their great level 1 play, have started to get a bit farther behind by overstepping their bounds twice in a row. Dyrus, though, level 7 to Gamsu's 5. You don't want to fight that 1v1 if you're Dignitas. Yeah. 
macro game for TSM, much stronger than the macro game from Team Dignitas, but at the same time, TSM needs to be able to execute their plays. Uh, kind of similar to what we saw last game, Teammate versus TDK, where Teammate had a superior macro game, but then messed up some things. Obviously, TSM still has a 900 gold lead here. Slight misstep for them, but mm -hmm. it makes this lane where Bjergsen was supposed to be dominating Shifter kind of tilt in the other favor. Uh, much faster trip to Luden's Echo, yep. and it means Shifter does have a small gold lead on Bjergsen. Of about 70, but you're right. It, I mean, you said if, if Bjergsen doesn't win the lane, it's a loss, and he's certainly not winning the lane anymore thanks to that kill. Bjergsen's going for the same build. Inox did double Doran's ring into Morella Namakon, so... For all the mid lane echoes out there, if you want to play like the pros, that's what we got so far. We'll see if he does the same Luden's Echo cooldown boots build into Lich Bane. Bottom lane turret, I'm taking a lot of damage. Wild Turtle does have a BF sword, but so does. Yeah, exactly. That's going to be a great binding. A lot of damage. Wild Turtle Whoa! could die to the Ignite, but he almost kills Kiwi Kid. But Core JJ will get it instead. 2 0 Dignitas. It looked like the Ren was going to kill, but then when it didn't, it baited TSM in for more kills. And another micro outplay there by Team Dignitas over TSM gives them a two kill to zero lead. Pop in the heal and the ignite at the right times to negate Wild Turtle's heal as well and get them the kill. Wow. Well, TSM, though, still trying to play aggressively because... While they might be losing kills in various lanes, they're still just farming the map so much better. They're 0-2 and yet still up in gold. And we saw Santorin and Dyrus try to come back to Bjergsen's lane. Whoa. Now Lustboy looking to battle. Core JJ has a three-level deficit because Dyrus is here, gets the knockback because he rampaged at the right time. Explosive cask goes the wrong way and the TP from Gamsu keeps him safe. Flash from Core JJ kept him alive. Some really nice plays by Core JJ. Perfect timing on his heal with the Kiwi Kid kill that he was able to pick up, and then a great flash there uh, to escape the gank. That was the whole Hecarim interaction to use your Q to break the spell shield and still get the knockback. So yep. Dyrus did that properly. Not much Core JJ could have done to prevent getting knocked back by Hecarim, but then flashing the Gragas ultimate, exactly what Core JJ needed to do to escape the gank. So pretty well played across all. Uh, champions right there. Yeah. And Corte J comes out alive. It's actually interesting. I know a while back there was like a debate like what would a perfectly played game look like? And that's like just a small microcosm of it where like Hecarim is going to stun the the, the Sivir. Hecarim's gonna knock gonna Sivir back. But yeah. Sivir's also going to be able to flash the Grog Assault. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it's just fun to see like when things are played perfectly, that's what you get the result. Or Santorin could have body slam flashed into the Sivir with no spell shield and knocked it back during the duration of the stun. Oh. She'd flash the body slam flash. You would have to Same result, bro. And then you'd ult it. Ah, good point. All right. <laughs> you win. I agree with you one more Aha! time, Jat. Look at you being smart and stuff. Of course, all that happens within like a, <laughs> point oh thir a third seconds. of a second, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, well, back to regular lanes. It's worth keeping in mind, we've talked about this matchup a few times. Callista is supposed to have the advantage over Sivir. It's been a lane swap game. And, and, and Dignitas swapped it and then got a fight, a, a kill rather, when it swapped back to a two on two. Mm -hmm. While Turtle miscalculated his rend a little bit. Something that also wouldn't happen in a perfectly played game. True. Yeah. We're going to stop these comparisons real quick. <laughs> <laughs> They're fun. They're fun. Join me in my insanity, chat. Helios. Done up. Done up. Lurking in the wings. Santorin revealing himself, though, of the Helios is fight. first gank as a Team Dignitas team member. And it's a flash three man stun for Kiwi Kid. Wild Turtle gets bound. Black Shield keeps him safe from Lust Boy. But Dyrus shows up. Explosive cast knocks in Helios. Turtle gets a kill. Bardolt actually disables his own turret. Or sorry, disables the enemy turret. Yeah, making the dive much easier. Team Solomon now with the fifth member in the bottom lane. Approaching, so nice gank there by TSM, abusing the fact that Gamsu didn't have his teleport to match and the fact that they had bards, so a pretty indefensible gank there by Team Dignitas, mainly just executed well by TSM. Yeah, good job, then TSM sitting on a 2,000 gold lead as that turret kill was grabbed off of the team fight victory. And with Morella Namakon done, Bjergsen might feel really good about this fight. Wild Turtle still taking some damage. Helios smites, he does have flash, but does not think he has the damage. CS is even out in that lane as well. Wonder where Wild Turtle will go. He goes boots two on the Callista. The jump rank, the jump distance for Callista is actually 
based on the boot rank, not your movement speed. So boots two, early rush for Callista not only gives you attack speed to jump more often, but you get to jump farther mm -hmm. because it's boot rank two. That's going to be a good thing for his kiting. He's also got the recurve bow in as well, so looks like he'll be doing BF sword straight into Hurricane. I do like early Hurricane builds. Sometimes even before finishing your first like attack damage, like major item. And specifically in this matchup against the Sivir, he needs to be able to match the wave clear. Yeah. So he needs Hurricane very quickly. He got the BF sword because he had a big enough gold yeah. in lane. It's almost always worth it to pick up an early BF. Definitely agree. We're agreeing a lot today. It's great. I know. Well, sometimes you just get smarter than normal, and then you then I end up agreeing with you, that's Jat. That's what happens? Yeah, yeah. That's, it's that's it's that's all on happens. you. You've made great strides today, right. Jat. Great. <laughs> 1,500 gold lead for Team Solomid. Bjergsen sitting on a small gold lead, or at least minion lead here. And Shifter does keep his turret alive. Looks like it's not too hard for this Kog'Maw to keep the wave clear up. He's have mostly made plays around Dyrus Roams, actually. He's been getting out of his lane. And due to that, the CS deficit in the top lane has gotten smaller. Gamtu's been catching up, but has not been having the same map impact that Dyrus has had. Yeah, and no dragon taken now 15 minutes into the game, and Shifter has made it to lose on Kog'Maw. That generally means objective control for the team with the Kog'Maw, if he gets blue buff. Yeah. Which is the critical thing. Doesn't He's also level 11 just now. Yeah. I don't know when the blue buff comes back up, but... Really huge. As far as monetary and experience gains go, this is the first time Kog'Maw becomes very scary. Santorin showing himself in the enemy jungle. Lust Boy has to journey away. Good job, but Helios is around. Smite comes in, the TP from Gamsu. Shark lands. Lust Boy is going to keep himself alive against Earth, but for how long? About two seconds. Shifter gets his second kill of the game. Dig the toss and control a dragon. Yeah, they burned Siveralt and Fizzalt, but that's for a kill totally worth at this point. Dyrus is now here. So Team Dignitas is going to try and force this dragon. Oh, man. Binding into Kog'Ma poke. And Helios comes in. Ignite gets Kiwi get another kill. Chased down on a Santor and Dignitas look to be real contenders here. Five to one in this game. We said that that mid lane matchup will be a lost matchup if Shifter can go even. He goes a little bit better than even, gets his Ludens, and then the instant that happens, oh, he forces the fight. Bjergsen in. Bjergsen goes really in. A lot of damage comes through. Oats back, but not over the wall. Has to flash to get away. Unlikely steal coming in, and it will go to the red team. One kill answered back by Bjergsen, but Dignitas ahead. Yeah. They're down 900 gold, but honestly, because of the three kills onto the late game monster of AP Kogma, and the fact that that's a gold deficit despite being down turrets, uh, means they're actually in pretty good shape, yeah. team composition wise. Absolutely, at this point in the game, after you recall for some mana, Sivir Cog can easily knock some turrets down, so those outer turrets are just kind of gold waiting to be picked up at this point. It's if they can get the vision control as well. True. Uh, because now this game's in a really unique spot because you actually you rarely see a team that gets the early turrets but then loses a team fight around the dragon because now Team Dignitas kind of has the, the team fight priority, assuming they can get picks like that, whereas TSM has the map control. So it's going to be very hard for Team Dignitas to actually find team fights since they are lacking that map control. Everywhere they go, they have to go much further from their points of safety, which are their turrets. Even the mid turret is extremely low. So still a lot of opportunity for Team Solomon to find fights, yeah. but some real danger of losing this game since Luden's Kog'Maw with three kills and the late game composition that some members of Team Dignitas have. And it all means scary things for Team Solomid. The one team fight right after the big power spike for Kog'Maw and Shifter is so far showing up quite well. 3-0 and 1. Highest co-participation on the team tied with his support and AD carry. Those three have been doing quite well all season long. And we're going to see Core JJ jumped a little bit, but not taking meaningful damage. There's a very early uh, distortion upgrade on Shifter's Sorcery Shoes. Uh, it's, I think, because he has the early three kills. He's just looking for that extra mobility, knowing that Bjergsen needs to assassinate him, or Dyrus for that matter, getting the cooldown reduction on his Flash and the Ghost. Uh, just really high priority for Shifter this game. I think yeah. he wouldn't have gone this way if he wasn't ahead, but because he is, just staying alive is more important than getting that little bit more damage earlier. I tend to agree. And really, like, the big power spike is Magic Pen plus Ludens in the first place. There's not... Mm -hmm. The gains get much smaller since then, so... Uh, I definitely do agree with you. I think it's a cool build. We'll see if T TSM can keep the siege going. Oddly, they're sieging against Cog Siver. I feel like the waves will never die first for them. 
And you see Wild's gonna chunk to half already. He does not have life steal yet. By going Hurricane, he didn't finish Bloodthirster, but he can get chunked out so much easier now. Santorin forced to smite to wave clear. Yeah, TSM's in a very dangerous spot right here. Their team composition itself does not have very good wave clear. Bjergsen can kind of clear waves. Hecarim cannot. Callista with the Hurricane can do it from a close range. But because they're against this AP Kog'Maw last pick, uh, they're in some real trouble getting getting back here. If TSM was farther ahead, they'd have kill pressure to prevent some of this from happening, but they just don't right now. Absolutely the case. So TSM, I feel like playing the split push game may work a bit better for them. They have sent Dyrus back to the top lane here. That top lane advantage, though, all but squandered as the gold lead is only 550 between those two top laners here. This is a game where Dyrus had literally doubled the guy's CS and a two-level lead. And now the levels right. are 11 the same. To 11. And actually, yeah. Fizz is going to level up first. He's 12 in three seconds. Yeah, we've already seen Gams use ability to create picks as well. When he teleported in, he killed Lust Boy. Now the teleport timers are probably going to be uh, the same. Yeah, you got like 12 seconds on Gams use TP. Dyrus is up, but there's nothing worth teleporting to right now. So you're right. That's going to be... An even match. We're going to see interesting Iceborne Gauntlet for Gamsu is his second item here. Potentially, yeah. And Sheen it's plus Cloth Armor, I have to imagine. Cloth armor. Well, I guess he just bought the Cloth Armor to fight Hecra. Maybe it still goes to Triforce. Bjergsen, though, in the battle against Gamsu. Fish is going to land. Explosive cast back, though, and there's not a lot of plays for Fizz to go. That will be the pickup in the top lane that mid's getting pushed down. Yeah, that's... One of those distraction plays. Gamsu was a tank, Fizz wants to be as annoying as possible, but now Team Dignitas gets the mid lane turret afterwards. This is what could potentially start a series of chain reactions. Uh, Dyer is trying to push up because of three people mid. Let's see how this plays out. Well, right now it plays out as Bjergsen pushing the top lane with only 400 health, but it seems like because they see the rest of Dignitas, he is safe to push. And they got the turret down. down so low earlier in the game, they end up making it a trade, which favors Team Solo mid. They lose their mid lane strong, uh, fortress hold, however you want to call it, with that mid lane turret going down, but they equalize the gold pretty nicely with that next one. This next dragon fight, uh, TSM could not get caught. It's been very impressive for Shifter and Team Dignitas to get this Ludens Kog'Maw to the point where they can force these dragon fights. So the way Team Dignitas wins is by warding well, either getting a pick, mainly making sure Shifter can poke with his ultimate. But for Team Solomid, they have to be very quick with the way they enter here. They have to avoid all of the Kog'Ma poke because they don't have good enough sustain, just a barred health pack here or there to help them out, that they almost have to fight immediately when this dragon comes up. Well, that sounds like a difficult task for Team Solomid, but they do have the home guard teleport up for Dyrus, so maybe that'll work out. Got the Spectre's Cal to tank some magic damage, then going for probably Frozen Heart, which will help against Core JJ, and it puts it down to really just shift her then for damage output, if that does happen. TSM are going to play the Dragon Control game. They've been able to get a couple of wards gone and put quite a few down themselves. And one last recall looks like it'll come in. 18 seconds. Oh, just kidding. Good poke. Yeah, it's going to be late recalls now for TSM. And, and think about how cool Rek'Sai Kog'Maw is. Rek'Sai can spot them out for Kog'Maw Kog to shoots. land the poke, even without vision. Really good synergy, as well as the blue buff coming up just now. Team Solomon not able to harass that, so Team Dignitas with a ton of advantages coming into this dragon fight. Bjergsen is just looking for an assassination, but I mean, most of it is spotted out, either by the Rek'Sai or the Ghost in the Jungle. More Kog'Maw just raining terror. Dyrus is recalling in order to get the home guard. Maybe he can stop this reign of terror. Team Dignitas giving up a lot of ground here, and they can't necessarily push down the mid lane turret because they already took the outer tier. Well, they're going to try anyway with a full wave of the entire team there, but Bjergsen split pushing the bot lane here. It's going to be a trade, maybe, but the turret's going to take a lot of damage. Looks like TSM going to be a bit slow to react, but maybe they're trying to pincher these guys in to look for an engage. Lust Boy gets the ulti on the two. Will the TP come in? Will there be an engage? There's Dyrus, goes for the ulti, knocks around Core JJ and Shifter in the back line, forced to cut away. But Dyrus takes so much damage that he will drop, and Shifter's on a rampage. The chase on the Gamsu, they trade that one back, top laner for top laner. Kiwi could force to flash away. Lust Boy's here, can't land the damage though. Yeah, they traded tanks. Both top laners went on the mid laners, and the teams just collapsed on those tanks. Now TSM kind of low. Shifter still alive, still with the summer spell. This dragon almost surely will result in a fight. 
And it's going to be a lot of damage at the very start. Bjergs is going to land the stun to Helios. Core JJ Spell Shield keeps him fine. Bjergs and pops Azonia's ults back. He's nearly the dead. The is still hitting them. DSM about to die. One more hit would do it. Shifter doesn't land either of these spells. Santorin running, running for his life. Helios not far, but Dyrus is going to re-engage with Home Guard. He's going to look for Shifter. The damage comes through. He gets the shutdown. Will they get any more? Gamsu rejoins the fight as well, and Dyrus one hit from death. Literally one more living artillery on about four different people on TSM would have killed them. They're all still quite low. Dignitas still trying this dragon. They would have a smite on Gamsu, but he used them in the fight. No smites up for this dragon. Santorin does have his for a potential steal. And he's going to get bound out of range. That's turret number two for Dignitas, and the kill comes through for Fizz. A trade from Dyrus. He's running away. One more hit will do it, but Bjergsen takes him down. Gamsu on the backside kills Kalista as well, and now time for some action. Oh, Good dear. Bjergsen died, respawned, came back in. No, sorry, actually ran away, recalled, and walked back in. Burns the summoners, get two kills back up, 4-0 and 1. Yeah, we knew that was going to be a highly contestable dragon. Team Dignitas does come out on top, but because of the chaos that happened within there, and honestly, the timing of Dyrus' teleport, they barely come out on top. Once again, if Shifter would have landed one or two more living artilleries within that fight, maybe he wasn't in range for all of them. Hard to see in that really long, chaotic team fight, but it was it's on a razor's edge, this game. It's incredibly close. It's a fun to watch game as well, but it ends right now with TSM up 3,500 gold. Yeah, so this was the later fight after they were already teleported and already picked up a kill. Santor was there because he wanted the smite steal. He was the only one on the map with his smite up. Dyrus rampages through one person, gets around Gamsu because Gamsu was trying to get the kill on Gragas. And mainly, in fights this long, it's really hard to track death timers from base. Nearly impossible to know when someone's coming through, especially when you don't have the perfect ward coverage all the way up to their base like breadcrumbs. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's what ended up happening. Team Dignitas stuck around a little bit long for the dragon. It allowed Di our Bjergsen to come in and now pick up his fourth kill. I actually want to point out a cool little mechanic that Bjergsen did there. So he got in the melee range, tossed the Q out for the slow. After two more auto attacks, triggers his passive to slow his opponent and haste him, which allowed him to zip past and make sure that the second half of Q went through Fizz yeah. to make sure he got the kill there. Little things to see from Echo players. And this will also be another one of these big tests. We, we see a lot of Echoes start off the game well, mm -hmm. but we almost never see them carry the game. Or win. Or win, for that matter. He has a losing record in competitive play in the major regions he's seen play. LPL, EULCS, and 0-1 now in the NALCS. Yep. You were correct about the Iceborne Gauntlet on Gamsu, so not the completely traditional Cinderhulk Smite Fizz. A lot of times they basically build exactly the same things as Hecarim. <laughs> yeah. So Cinderhulk, Frozen Heart, Spear, Fissage, and the Trinity Force has four core items. That's true. Well, it looks like TSM start Baron, but then immediately stop. Looks like Dignitas was wise to their ways. The reveal comes in. Bjergsen will not land the stun on the Kiwi Kid. Gets a shield, though. And jumps to a ward that dodges the Dark Binding. More ward clears come through, and TSM really want to take control of the Baron area. Bjergsen's still in the split, pushed 254 minutes on him. He's got the highest farm in the game, constantly farming these side waves. Level 16 as well, highest level in the game as well. And the map pressure advantage we talked about earlier is one of the main reasons that TSM is still winning this game. Uh, four turrets to one and it's allowing them access to better wards and slightly safer farming spots. Of course, the one game Team Solomon has lost this split was against Incarnation's Kogma. Now we have Shifter's Kogma, who's off to a much better start, even stronger Kogma. A lot of the win conditions here for Team Dignitas revolve around Shifter and his ability to get off poke. And he's so far done a decent job of it. He's done a great job. Yeah, four kills. He's got the finished Seraphs as well. Void stat. Ooh, nice. Again, just yeah, outplayed. Outplayed, man. Slick use of little ways to farm. At this point, with Ludens, farming is very easy, but every little bit counts to yeah. the opponent as well. I mean, those two are the ones kind of racing for highest CS in the game. They kind of keep passing each other back and forth. Right now, the lead is with Bjergsen, and he's looking for Kiwi Kid now. So I'm, that waiting, spot I'm waiting to see a Bardalt into Echo W. 
to make sure it procs for the stun. If TSM could pull off a combo like that on a priority target, that would be one of their big ways to winning the game. That's almost one of the only ways they can actually get in on Shifter properly, is if they somehow catch him in stasis and chain lock him. Part of the reason he went distortion, I imagine, to make sure he has a flash, flash or a ghost to get away, yeah. So everyone kind of reading the situations pretty well, but you're right, the hard engage, you know, Hecarim has, I would say, good engage. Bard has good engage. Greg is okay. I feel like there's enough tools for TSM to break in, but I think the Toss have been playing it quite well. I mean, keep in mind, Black Shield plus Sivir ulti, you can't even catch those off in time. So Dignitas are able to kite quite well. They've built around Shifter. I like this team, Dignitas team composition. Great damage, good mobility. Frontline and Fizz and Rek'Sai. Black Shield to prevent some initiations. So Void Staff also being completed on Shifter. And soon go. to be level 16. That will be very important for the man. Hopefully they don't siphon off too much of his experience because the range disparity is really big. Kogma, probably the most level dependent of all the mid laners. I feel like the rank of ulti is, has the biggest change compared to other champions in the role. Whenever your range increases on the ultimate too. Yeah. There's very few ultimates in the game that are like that. Urgot ultimate's another one mm -hmm. where you can position reverse or something from further away. Like it, a game changing effect like that, not just a slightly more powerful spell. And right there, Dyrus, the max range binding hits him. He's right in the face of Kiwi Kid who pops Talisman of Ascension to ascend up the map and try to get away. Bjergsen finds Helios though. A fair bit of damage, no stun will land. They keep getting away from the W in time. Yeah, flash down on the jungler, though. With the dragon coming up right now, this is a very important dragon for Team Solomon to get. Yeah. If they go for dragon, they have to burst it down very quickly because if they stick around and allow Shifter to poke them, they're going to be in trouble. They will be missing, though, tempered fate on this one as Bard ulted and missed. And Dignitas rushing Baron. They're letting TSM get dragon and hoping they can get some meaningful progress here. Hope they can get the fight started. It's going down rather quickly. Dragon goes down to Callista. And there's no Bard ultimate to slow down this Baron take because they've already used it and missed. Dyrus is going to have to go in pretty much blind. They have vision. They got to go. They have vision. Here comes the dive on in. No, it gets picked up by Helios in time. Pjergsen pops the Zodius and the engage has started as already. Lustboy is died. A double bind is massive. They're going to chase down into Gamsu. Dyrus takes a ton of damage. Gamsu lives somehow. And the cleanup may just happen, but TSM have already picked up two or on the chase. Yeah, they kill two, they lose one, and the Baron somehow Gamsu escapes with his life. Really bold call there by Team Dignitas, but they bursted it down quickly enough that TSM could not follow. I like the aggression there from Dignitas with the call but they have to make it back to their turrets quickly. And it's going to give some time for TSM to push 4v3. Baron or not, you're still outnumbered. One hit, and they don't kill the turret. They get the stun out of Helios, though. Gamsu taking some damage as well, but no turret will actually fall. Yeah, I have to point out uh, Lust Boy's double bind in that fight as well, but then also the fact that Shifter stayed alive the entire time and rained some really quality poke down onto TSM. This is actually a really close and good game that we're seeing from both sides. What, what you're expecting if you see a Team Solo mid versus Team Dignitas matchup from last split is definitely not the game that we're getting right now. Team Dignitas 3-1 and one this split, bringing in a new jungler, definitely on the path to some significant improvement here. Absolutely correct. I mean, this is them battling the defending champions of North America and really battling them very close, all things considered. I think the Tasa team that was faced relegations, they went to game five in that tournament. They picked up a jungler who also faced relegations and lost them. And now they're battling the number one team in North America. And flanks are kind of the name of the game right here. Team Dignitas wants to prevent the flanks. And TSM wants to make them. Darius does have his teleport up. He's getting to be very, very tanky on Hecarim. That's why it's dangerous for Team Dignitas to push up the mid lanes because they don't, so they haven't had enough map control for wards to expire behind them. So anywhere Team Dignitas pushes, uh, they're risking a home guard Hecarim from any side. They, they don't have nearly enough sweeping capabilities to get rid of those wards. The main way you set that up is if you have map control for over three minutes and the wards just time out. Yeah. Well, maybe the wards will time out. Yeah, maybe, but at the same time, they pushed up, now they all back. TSM has time to invade again and get the wards down outside of their outer turrets, so they always have the wards out to make the teleport place. 
And you can see that dragon, sorry, Baron fight one more time. Dyrus dives in, he can't land the smite in time. It's a really good engage by Bjergsen. He kills off the support yeah. before he gets to ult. He really does, and then also Shifter. You can see how much attention Dyrus wants to pay to him, but they just can't quite get to him. And like, that's one of the crazy things about AP Kogma. He still does a lot of damage just auto attacking there. Uh, once you do close into his engagement range. Beautiful double bind there by Lust Boy's Bard that created the rest of those kills. And yeah, definitely powerful stuff coming through. And it, it was a team fight win for TSM, if only a little bit late as Baron had already been picked up. But Baron times out here. It gave the Gatas some gold back into the game. But these guys are still down in turrets and they're nearly down another one as this has maybe like 12 health, 32. Which is crazy when, well. you, when you consider the wave clear capabilities that Team Dignitas has. Mm -hmm. Sivir, Kogma, and even the even the tank Fizz, they should be clearing these waves, but Team Solomid obviously had that great macro game to open, getting one and a half turrets before Team Dignitas responded. Dignitas will get number three right here though when they choose to hit that turret one or two more times. Cory DJ finally walks up, they get some damage in their Dyrus. But Bjergsen answers on the other side of the map. The split push Echo, 342 minion kills in a 34 and a half minute game. He is continuing to scale up 5-0-3. Oh, and, and this is honestly the kind of game that we needed to see from the enemy esports squad, where they were facing a very scary team fight comp and needed a split push to win. We're seeing Bjergsen do just that and just get around this whole Kogma wave clear deal. And also we saw there the effectiveness of Helios is going to be very muted for the rest of this game. Uh, very, very mobile champions that he's against. Uh, early ganking and early pressure. Mainly, uh, Helios is most useful for his Tremor Sense right now. He can't really do much to Callista. Everyone else can also dance away from him fairly easily. Maybe as a form of peel, but everyone is so mobile on TSM. It's going to be tricky for Helios to be involved. Yeah, we'll see if he can do anything except maybe just peel Bjergsen, get a knockup, and maybe that'll be enough yeah. time for the Kog'Maw to do something cool. But meanwhile, Solomid still sitting on this 5,000 gold lead. They they lost Baron. They have to deal with this level 16, 17 now AP Kogma, who's got all the items in the world. And Solomid's still able to play the map aggressively. Every single wave is on Dignitas' side of the map. A lot of it has to do with the vision control, you know? The six turrets being down, but because of that, the wards, the TSM, could get in to the jungle now, and we talked about flanks being a danger for Team Dignitas. Well, here's a flank. The ulti's gonna not land, though. Black Shield early on the shift there. Are we gonna find any kind of engage? Saver knocked back. Santorin forced to retreat. Bjergsen running backwards as well. His clone not anywhere offensive right now. Another W comes in, looks for Team. We can get some now to chase on him, but the Shark drops him dangerously low. The Bard Q will not do much, but Wild Turtle's already here to play cleanup. Two kills picked so far. One more stun attempt for the Echo. Wild Turtle Whoa. dual Gansu and loses it, but Rek'Sai drops three kills to one. Gansu to retreat, but Bjergsen... Some fancy footwork. Dyrus is teleporting in behind with home guards. And he's gonna find Shifter and take him down. Four kills in the fight. Gansu gets away, but that is clearly a win for TSM. What a crazy fight. Bard opens, not landing the ultimate, but it's a zoning Bard ult that pushes Team Dignitas towards him, and they decide to go in anyways. We wanted to see some echo carries in this game, but that was Callista doing work in that last fight. Wild Turtle doing so much damage, and with these death timers, TSM takes a big inhibitor down. That is absolutely massive. So now Dignitas forced to play the back side of the map and continually defend their base. Dragon is already back up, but TSM realized they cannot risk Baron being in the second half of this one. Dyrus will try to solo the Dragon. Gamble oh. stops the recall. Lust Boy, sure to die. And that makes now a 5v4 on the other side around. Dignitas have time. Yeah, they would have time to go and get this dragon and put themselves up three dragons to one for that nice little blue speed. They could risk Baron without the support, too. Maybe, but we got to watch this replay. So first off, Bard alt misses. Also, the black shield on Shifter gets you, so it wouldn't have caught him anyways. Just watch Bjergsen in this fight. He's using his move speed to dash in and out so much. Then he dashes in. The big thing about that was Wild Turtle to create the opportunity with his Rendo, slowing them down. Then T TSM just kind of pushed through. Since Team Dignitas didn't get the initial setup that they needed, that was really massive. But look at this Baron. Team Dignitas in the side. Looks like they're going to be securing it. And TSM not the wiser at all. So Lustboy caught on a greedy recall. Great play by Gams, who earns his team the Baron. It's still a 6,000 gold deficit for Dignitas. They're down the inhibitor, but... They've still got Dragon 2 under their belts from earlier into the game, and with Baron, they could definitely push. 
actually worth pointing out the threat that Bjergsen has. Uh, in that last team fight, I counted. Uh, Corey today literally auto attacked twice, all team fight. He ran back and forth, being like, I'm afraid of Echo, I'm afraid of Echo. Okay, yeah. I died. Meanwhile, Wild Turtle. Yeah. All of the auto attacks. Absolutely. Or even worth triple. Yeah, no magic resist on Core JJ. Uh, trying to live based on his spell shield and basically playing very, very passive. Super interesting game here. Yeah. Bjergsen, if he can get his death cap, takes, or even Eludens, but death cap probably the better item here, uh, takes his damage one step higher, meaning he wouldn't really need his ultimate to just blow somebody up. Meanwhile, Death Cap was completed by Shifter. AP ratio is not that amazing for AP Kogma, uh, but still relatively impactful, especially for his Q and his E. And it's going to be enough to continue threatening. We do have the Quick Silver Sash going through for Wild Turtles. We did make a pit stop to be able to drop the fish or to drop Morgana CC. And a little bit of magic resist maybe helps him survive Kogma. But Sorcerer's Elixir definitely going to help Cog's damage either way. Yeah, once again, the team with Baron, because they've been losing the team fights and because they have not been able to stop the TSM flanks, are pushed back into their base. They're just too worried about being flanked out here. I mean, a lot of credit to Dyrus for always... He's turned a couple of fights here mm -hmm. at the end because he escapes with a low amount of health, goes back to base, comes in with Home Guard TP at the end, and then just eats the Kog'Maw. And it's impressive as well. I, I agree with you that Dyrus has been having a really good impact this game. Just TSM's ability to play the map. You look down the line and every single role is winning in farm. And in some cases by a significant margin, like Dyrus is plus 60 as his Bjergsen. TSM's just getting more farm. That's why the gold lead is this big. Three kills versus two Barons is very much in the favor of Barons, but the extra turret kills that they've been able to split push down and just the extra farm they're getting means that TSM are the team with the lead, even against that aforementioned Baron buff. And it feels like because Team Dignitas got the Baron as they were trading for the Dragon, uh, this game is in a significant role. Uh, team Soul Mid won't really find fights unless Team Dignitas leaves their base. It looks like they're actually leaving their base right now, though. Maybe they catch Lust Boy again? Ooh. He had all the saved up move speed. From the chime pickups, yeah. He's also at 63 chimes collected, so uh, when you hit 55, you get a third meep to follow you around. Lust Boy's saving a lot of his auto attacks. Uh, against champions there, so three auto attacks in a row will apply a slow to an opponent. Actually, a significant amount of peel in team fights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he can really like slow Gamsu down and keep him from uh, staying on Wild Turtle. Have to use his move blocks, which leave him vulnerable to everything else. Baron buff looks like it has timed out now, so Suleiman might be back on the way up. Shifter just consumed his blue elixir, thinking there will be an imminent fight here. Bjergsen's also hit six items. It's a 723 AP Echo with a Lich Bane. Yeah. Lich we wanted to itself. see if Echo could carry a game or a late game team fight. We may be about to find out. Yeah. Bjergsen's E auto attack does 700 damage just from Lich Bane and the spell damage. That'll do it. J just from that. If he gets in range of Shifter's Kogma, there's no magic resist on him. Yep. I think Sword Void Staff makes it do true damage. So, good luck with this one. They're going to engage on with Wild Turtle. The Gamsu flank will get stopped by Tempered Fate, but how long will they get tempered as Wild Turtle is going to get picked off by Core JJ? But here comes Bjergsen. Wow! Bjergsen evaporates, can't pop anything. So, Dyrus is here for the cleanup. He does knock down the AD carry. He's running, but Gamsu will kill him. It's a 4v2 and a push for Dignitas. You can play the map for 42 minutes, but if your two carries get ganged up on and killed at the start of the fight, you will lose right there. Team Dignitas, they come out of their base, they pop the Sivir ultimate, they kill Wild Turtle, then Team Solomit tries to jump in for assassinations, is unsuccessful, and this could be the game. So now it's solo split push barred. Lustboy can't do anything but hope to push a turret down, and now he's going to recall. Fate's call still far away. Tempered Fate, I should say. And it's there, going to be the push in towards the inhibitor number one. There is a cannon kill. minion in this wave, so it's harder for Santorin to clear. He needs to be using these barrels to clear the minions, otherwise this game will end. And they're going to try right now. 15 seconds on Wild Turtle. Dignitas to prove they are contenders for the throne. Kiwi Kid is low, pops the Zonias. Now into the Nexus, and will there be enough damage? It does not look like it. Three members alive. Wild Turtle respawns, but that's going to be the game. And team Dignitas are in number one. 
Who would have thought from relegations to now halfway through week three, the sole number one team in the North American LCS. Helios' first game with the squad. Shifter's great AP Kog'Maw. And a defeat of TSM there. 14 Dignitas. Man, it's been a while since Dignitas. Fans could feel like they were supporting one of the top teams in North America. A four to one start in the North American LCS to take down defending champions Team Solo Mid. Helios finally finding himself in the playoffs here in North America or in a, a team that might look like they make it there. Yeah. What a good look for this team. It was such a close game, back and forth. We knew the late game potential of this team, Dignitas team. We knew the Team Solo Mid was putting so much pressure, just keeping Team Dignitas contained and constantly threatening them with flanks. But then, 42 minutes into the game, Wild Turtle gets caught by a Sivir Ultimate, and Bjergsen tries to go hero mode, fails, and Team Dignitas just pushes down the mid lane and ends the game. Well, unsurprising, the damage graph does show Kog'Ma leading. And that's a poke champion, it's what we expect. We had an Echo that was 7-1-6. and six. Just a minute ago, he was 7-0-6, and, and yet again, Echo having a great time. He's still pushing really well, and then in team fights, he's having a yeah. hard time pushing it through. A lot of things could have changed that game. Looking at that last fight, Bjergsen underestimated the damage that was going to come in from Team Dignitas. He didn't yep. use his X name. Team Liquid would keep them in a tie for first place and help distinguish them as a contender for the summer playoffs. Yeah, so Team Liquid, they're 3-1. It's a good record, but two of their wins so far are against 0-4 and four teams, so it's not like the hardest schedule so far. The real test for how good Team Liquid actually are starts this week. They start playing tougher opponents. Cloud9, honestly, is one of them. Yeah, and Cloud9 Incarnation, you talked to him a couple weeks ago about who he thought were really good mid laners, and he said that Phoenix was the hardest person to lane against in scrims. Now, he gets to face Stage Phoenix, which we know is a completely different beast because Scrim Phoenix is apparently crushing everybody. I want to see how Incarnation holds up against Phoenix in the mid lane and if his assessment of him is still accurate on stage. Yeah, of course. Then you look across the rift at Cloud9's record. They started last split one and three and still managed to finish second. However, that was with their tried and true roster. And this split, they've lost three games in a row, their longest losing streak since joining the league. When you factor in, they're still adjusting to their new mid laner. Is it... Still too soon to hit the panic button? I mean, I don't think it's too soon. I, I don't think you need to hit the panic button, really. Like, I talked about it on PTL last uh, earlier this week, and TSM did the same kind of thing. They dropped their big shot caller, Reginald. They put in this new all-star mid laner, Bjergsen, who was up and coming, hadn't been tested very much, was a great player, and this happened again. TSM took a split, and then they were the best team in North America again. And I think the same thing can happen here with Incarnation, where... When they grow as a team, his individual skill gets better, he adapts to playing competitive, this team can definitely improve. Yeah, and I do think that the transition with Incarnation is just going to take time. But meanwhile, the rest of Cloud9 is on a downward trend as well. Meteos, he's picked up the shot calling role, and it just hasn't been going well for them so far. The fact that they've lost more games in a row than they ever have is a big sign of that. And they've been flailing losses where they don't know what to do. And at the same time, Balls has also been consistently losing lane, which is really surprising for this top laner who was so dominant for so long. Yeah, I actually went through and through the help of some of the guys at Riot, went through a lot of the stats of Cloud9 players, and I actually couldn't find like a weak link where it was like, High is clearly much worse than he was in 2013, or Media is clearly much worse. Like, they're losing lane right now, and you know, same thing happened when they went one and three and back in the spring split. It just feels like right now they're having early game difficulties. And after a certain point, they'll probably get back into shape, and it should be okay again. All right. Well, we're going to send it over to the guys for the play-by-play. -play, but first, Dominate explains that Cloud9 still have all the pieces they need to be a great team. They obviously must have learned things from having such a good shot caller for such a long time. If they're just able to like fill in the gaps, um, they can be strong. They just need to uh, be able to like adapt to incarnation style, which is like a more passive carry oriented instead of just like somebody who's trying to do as much as possible with very little resources. So I think that they they just need to get more comfortable. But I don't think they'll be like a bad team by any stretch. Not a bad team by any stretch is probably the right thing to say. Just working out the kinks right now. And as we get into our next game, I am Riving to Biz in the third. And camping the caster desk with me is going to be Sam Kobe Hartman Kensler for the next three games. We're doing an early switch here. So let's get into that game with a look at the starting lineups on the blue side. It is Team Liquid. That means it's going to be Quas in the top lane, dominating the jungle. Phoenix in mid, Piglet at 80 carry with Expecial at support. And on the red side is Cloud9. Up top is Balls in the jungle. Medios mid incarnation. 
Star Nation, 80 Carry Sneaky, and support Lemon Nation. And it is a question. Will Cloud9 kind of be able to iron out all of these things that have been plaguing them? It does seem like Incarnation could even maybe kind of take a split to get things going. We've seen teams have to do that, but then come out big once they have that time. Yeah, I'm very curious, you know, what style Cloud9 like to, will like to go to in the mid lane. Mm -hmm. uh, there are plenty of poke choices now. So if Incarnation does want to play that more hangback style, yeah. passive oriented carry laner, then, you know, the Varus, the uh, Kogma are all very viable choices for him right now in the meta. Uh, it's just up to Cloud9. Do they want to go that direction as uh, Dominate well, that Kog thought that they did? That Kog'Maw being very big now, pretty much a nightmare in the eyes of Team Solo Mid, being the reason they've lost, well, one games in the end. Yeah, it is a very strong late game for us, but man, the early game is very weak, and that has been yep. one of Cloud9's biggest pain points this split. Their early game has been very, very poor. Uh, they've had a real difficulty getting out of the laning phase without a severe deficit. Looking at the bands as they go across, Pretty normal from what we see between these two teams. Sneaky Silver gets taken away for Team Utility. The Kalista and Rise we would yeah. expect to see as well. So Alistar still up, as is Thresh. Yep. Uh, a couple of the high priority um, supports, but both early game junglers take it down. Yep. Yeah, there's the Alistar. There Good call. Is. Rek'Sai does get taken out, so a little early game pressure will not be had here by Dominate if they were to first pick it. Echo still left up within the pick ban phase here, but a lot actually is in those high tiers. <laughs> I am so excited. I hope that the Echo trend continues and we get some Echo I games do. as well. I feel like we haven't seen kind of top tier Echo play. Obviously, everybody's still getting the plays in there. We heard that Lost Boy on his Bard had some 100 plus plays, so the teams have had time and have probably focused him, if you're a mid laner, pretty well. But we've seen him on the other positions, so I wonder how much time everybody has been able to get onto Echo. Like I said, I think we're still waiting to see the real big outplays with him. Yeah, I don't think that Cloud9 will go with that style, uh, sadly. Just the melee carry is not <laughs> sadly. Uh, incarnation style, definitely. Uh, they'll probably go with much more long range for him. It's what he says he likes. When you know, when they talk to Incarnation, he says, I like to be that assassin. I want to yeah. be that aggressive guy. So maybe he'll get a chance sometime. That Fizz picked up could actually be balls in the top lane with that Cinder Hulk. And the meta recently, Meteos picks up Nunu to be a big giant bully in the jungle. We'll see if he can get that to play out for the team as we're looking at an Echo float here on the side of Team Liquid. Yes, Phoenix definitely someone who can do it, as they mentioned again. Incarnation versus Phoenix, highly hyped up mid lane matchup. See if he can get the edge there. But I really do think, yeah, top lane Fizz, very, very popular. Mm -hmm. um, Opting for uh, another Cinder Hulk. So they will have a pretty beefy front line here for Cloud9. I'm very curious to see what Meteos, how he utilizes the Nunu though. Nunu works really well with strong yeah. lanes. Uh, and Incarnation has not really been a strong lane for Cloud9 to work off of. Makes it really difficult to abuse the strengths of Nunu and get counter jungling done. Yeah. You know, get those deep wards down and try and punish the other jungler. If you don't have a strong mid lane to work off of. Right. Because if the other mid laner collapses before, uh, then even Nunu can be taken down if he gets a little too deep. Well, basically what... Incarnation is looking at if he does decide to pick that, he can still wait to round it out, is what we saw last game. Echo versus Cog. There was also a Hecarim on the side of Team Solo mid, so he kind of just watched a little bit of this matchup. If he feels confident in being able to dodge three people under turrets at times and come up with first blood, then so be it. But right now, definitely waiting and letting that clock tick down here for Cloud9. Yeah, so, so far, it's actually fairly scary for Incarnation because even if he likes to play long range safe, which works. He's facing Echo, Hecarim, and Alistar. Yep. That's that's some serious dive potential right there. Yep. Yes, they will have to go through Nunu um, and Azir Wall as well as another good defense for them to lock in. Yeah. Uh, but if they can get around those things, Team Liquid does have very strong dive potential at the moment. So waiting to round out the pick bands here. The three and one Team Liquid versus the one and three Cloud9. Corky is going to get locked in. A little bit more poke for this team. Yeah, and some, uh, before. some of that mid-game power as well for yep. them. So Team Liquid setting themselves up to make a good mid-game push. Uh, Hecarim. Awesome. 
Do it. It's definitely going to be top lanes. And it looks like Quas will be opting for the Ignite. So that shifts Hecarim power up, up more towards the mid game rather than super late game mm -hmm. of the Smite teleport. Uh, so I'd actually like Team Liquid to keep the Ignite teleport and not switch over to Smite. Uh, and then last lock in is the LeBlanc. So it'll be a jungle uh, echo. High probability of going tanky build, so yeah. maybe not as exciting as the mid lane one, but LeBlanc will take over assassin duties. This is still the full speed LeBlanc, by the way. <laughs> Has not been slowed down yet. I actually like how much the Echo in the jungle can fare. I feel like he becomes yeah. less of a priority. My eyes are on this guy, Target. You still have a Blanc to watch for, and he can do more things. Be mischievous. There's definitely a lot of advantages to being in the fog of war as Echo. Right. Namely, uh, his W active. You know, we actually, we actually have seen already teams not looking for it when he isn't in right. view. Using but if he's not in view, then it makes really well. it much easier. Uh, to land. It's hard to use. We've also uh, pointed out, you said, using that timing is definitely something people are getting used to, so we're seeing a bit of the misplays catch people out. And using those new champions can definitely also get under your skin if you're not doing it correctly. We do see the round out, though. Nautilus is going to be picked up here for the team, and Incarnation is going to go with Azir in the mid lane. Once again, he ended the week doing this, also brought out Victor last week to no avail. So Cloud9 looking to stop the bleeding, a three-game loss here as we come into week three. Team Liquid, they've only lost to Gravity last week, and that's another one of the teams sitting at the top of the standings. Yep, all right, so Cloud9, they do lock up the very strong uh, Nunu plus Azir combo, yep. which will provide them with a large amount of consistent damage if they can keep that uh, Azir safe. Zoning of Nunu, as well as the uh, ultimates from Azir and Nautilus, uh, should do uh, their part as far as controlling the battlefield. Definitely going to be hard to keep that Hecarim in check, though, coming in with that home guard teleport. It's going to be interesting to watch as well. Echo gets his third game of the day here. We'll see if he can get some more play and another victory on the board. If you think Team Liquid's going to keep their hold on first place, tweet hashtag TLWin. Or if you're calling this game for Cloud9, tweet hashtag C9Win to at LOL Esports. We'll see where the fan vote stands throughout the game. And still speaking of that Echo pick, it really comes kind of in your mind, you're just saying, that's weird that nobody's going to ban it, but everybody wants it, but it's not really working out for anybody. So who has the right idea with e Echo Pick? Everybody wants their chance to be uh, to make their name <laughs> and become immortal. Talk about Echo a little bit later, but big matchup will be the top lane. As we said, Quas did decide to stick with that Ignite teleport. Yep. And speaking about Quas and the top laners, Ball shared his thoughts on what makes Quas such a tough top laner. Quas is known for playing, uh, doing really well in trades in lane. And uh, whenever he gets ahead, he knows how to use his advantage. If we have the same champions, we play pretty similar. But Quas is able to play more other aggressive champions. Well, in that aggressive pool that Ball says Quas has a little bit better handle on. But he can still bring out the Fizz here, and Fizz can impact the game greatly. Yeah, and as he said, you know, if Quas can get that early lead, knows what to do with it on Hecarim. Yeah. Get some teleport plays towards the bottom side of the map. All right, so far, though, Invade spotted, so we will have mirrored wards. Both teams going to get down the lane swap wards. Try and figure out the matchup here. All right, so talk a little bit more about Echo, just because, as he said, he's going to get through a lot in the early stages here. He did come out powerful, but uh, yeah. and we'll probably see him picked a lot as well, just because everybody wants their chance you know, to make those famous plays. <laughs> I also really like the theorycraft um, whenever a new champion comes out. I really love the plays where you get to name the play after the player, just because it's so magnificent. <laughs> And I'm very excited to see somebody utilize Echo's full potential. So you're saying we're going to get to dominate this game? Um, what I want to see <laughs> is the most amazing recall bait. You can pull this off with oh, Echo. Okay. If you recall back to base, you can still ultimate back out right. onto the map. So if you recall by a ward or something they're going to try and base uh, bait with or an objective like Dragon, and then re use your ultimate back out onto the field and use the massive AoE to take down a team, that 
is the type of play that I'm looking for. And I hope that some of the players have been, you know, thinking outside of the box, looking for those types of plays, because those are the ones that are named after you and make you <laughs> yeah. immortal. It becomes very, very difficult. We're probably not going to see any of those plays from Dominate's Echo just in the early, type of the early part of the jungle, rather. He is going to be harassed here by Meteos, which will, one, slow him down. Yeah. And then two, make it harder for him to get those levels to even want to get into lane. Already using parallel convergence for the shield to make sure his safe farming. Yeah, and that's an, an important indicator. We were going to watch, you know, not only the jungle matchup, but the mid lane. Meteos already having the confidence. Get in there, steal yep. away some of the echo jungle. Keep him down. And you're very right. Uh, jungle echo, a lot less possibility to make those huge uh, YouTube plays just because <laughs> uh, a lot less farm in the jungle. Uh, it's an underpaid position. Mid lane gets way more opportunity because it can build full AP. We'll see what Domini decides to go for, though. He could opt for the AP Echo from mm -hmm. the jungle. It's just much, much more difficult to pull off, and you need to snowball. Also could hurt from Incarnation's pressure onto Phoenix. If Phoenix has to go back, take Raptors, start taking the jungle as well to get in this one. Could be pretty tough. Seems like he got enough minions here to clean up and Ooh. make it pretty even, but he's going to miss these ones, actually. No, he won't. They don't push up to the turret. Actually plays it very well with the melee. <laughs> the crowd still did. feeling the crowd, his pain. The crowd felt it. Getting in his own head there. Four minutes in, Incarnation places a ward just above himself. He knows that Meteos is on that side as well. And actually, uh -huh. this would be great now. You see Dominate going for the same spot. Also, little tricky action up on the top side right, of the map. Right. Quas, he's shoved in his lane and immediately looks to use that advantage. He gains a small amount of time where he can leave the lane because he pressured balls into the turret. And he goes to help dominate with the counter jungling, try and get it back from Nunu. They're able to get that red. So no three buff for Medios on the Nunu. And really, Dominate has Quas to thank for that. Even though it's a jungle play, jungling is always a yep. team objective, a team uh, activity they need to bring and involve everyone in. Very nicely played. Seems like they got the lane matchup so they could make that happen with Quas in the top lane, being the ones who got the deep rewards using that knowledge to their advantage on the side of Team Liquid. Yep. So with that play, we'll see where they actually go here. Dominate knows he has kind of an idea of where Meteos is going to be now. Helps him to be a bit safer and not have to pressure too much for his early Echo Jungle, which he seems he's doing pretty well at. 12 to 19, so still looking to get himself back in. Double ranks for Phoenix in the mid lane as he's getting pressured out pretty hard here by Incarnation, who looks to go back soon. Meanwhile, we see Echo in the jungle. <laughs> slowly, <laughs> slowly making his way. He might have to go down to bottom soon. Sneaky and Lemonation both continuously pushing in Pig Limit Special here. Not too much damage has been traded or CS in anybody's favor. But yeah. they're trying to make sure that if pressure has to be given, Dominate's going to have to give it to the bottom. So lane. here's Meteos going for a risky play. Because, yes, his, his mid laner's doing really well, oh. but the mid laner's not there for him. So even though there's that advantage, very risky, and it might cost them a summoner spell if the bottom lane cuts him off. It does. Yeah. I was going to say, let's see how the interaction works. And at the cooldowns, Dominate didn't have too much more chase, but a good flash blown there All by right. Meteos. Yeah. So that's the whole point of relying on that strong mid lane matchup. Yeah. Uh, you can get chased out right there. It does cost him the flash, but... Bottom lane may be the ones to pay the price in the end. 3v1 right now. Sneaky doing what he can from the outside to save Lemonation. It's only going to be a few more shots. And Sneaky not being able to provide too much. Very low end man in this first engage. They're still looking to get anything back off the auto attacks. One more relentless Inblock. pursuit into the fight. Focus on to Piglet. Focus on to Dominate. They do get the summoner heal out. So getting a little bit out of re-engaging. Good first blood, however, from Liquid. To come up strong in the bot lane really focusing more onto Piglet throughout this season, way more than they did last season. Yeah, another strong move there from Dominate. Early on Echo, and they're able to catch Lemon Nation out. Mm -hmm. That's where a lot of teams have found success, attacking Cloud9's bottom lane, because Sneaky has been the main damage source for the team, the consistent. Ooh, nice interrupt there on the LeBlanc W. Distortion block, I like it. Also had the shield for Shifting Sands, so he didn't really get hurt at all either. Yep. The Emperor's Divide goes down. And I don't think we're going to see Dominate here anytime soon. So you can see Incarnation, even without that many wards on his top oh. side, still pushing in right underneath the turret. Incarnation makes his way out of any aggro range. 
He's safe, yeah. but he's winning this lane. Incarnation with no mana, but Phoenix with no health, so. Right. Health wins out. Yeah, Incarnation, you know, despite what... Uh, Gotta know it's a bait. Despite what we've heard about the uh, Phoenix matchup, yeah. doing very well. He's got all the key points to the Azir LeBlanc matchup down. Uh, the interrupt on the distortion before she can hit the... Uh, destination, so yep. she doesn't deal damage. Shoving her into turret very early, as we saw, to force Miss CS. Uh, and Phoenix definitely paying the price there. So, eked out a small CS lead for himself. Incarnation has. And provided that mid lane uh, pressure. All these forward wards placed in by Medios, that early sight stone, just allowing them to grab that dragon very easily. And you can see they still have a bit of vision on Dominate as he enters into the jungle. So he has not really been able to go anywhere without Cloud9 knowing, yeah. except for the first hit they had on Red, which has not seemed to stop Meteos whatsoever. Still playing strong. He heads to the top side. Looks like Lemonation's going to go ahead and tend down to Sneaky so he doesn't get dove here. Yeah. So Lemonation finally makes his way back. He did go on. Uh, that very common uh, support journey yep. into the enemy jungle after recalling, grabbing that, yeah, uh, early sight stone. grabbing that sight stone. He went to play some deep wards as well uh, to help out with that vision game, and arrives back in time for the minion wave at the turret. So the CS up here. So here they go. Push the shield on. Ardent Blaze connects, but no follow up. 69 to 69 in this lane. Very, very even with still Piglet having the kill. He's rushing that Sheen for a little bit more front end power in the engages. And we'll see where Incarnation, the rest of the team, goes after this. Yeah. Not only does he have that kill in Sheen, but he's hit level six now, so he's mm -hmm. got the barrage of rockets available. Really turns the lane. A lot more power here on Corky's side, and he should be just fine. Plus, they invested in that first pick, Alistar. Yeah. The perfect bodyguard here. Still waiting for that Quas teleport as well. He comes into the bottom lane. Somebody gets pulverized just like that. And with the Hecarim on board, you would be a dead 80 carrier support. 86 to 70 up there, and he's consistently pushing Balls back. Balls has just pushed his wave to go back and try for Krugs a bit. Yeah. So he's trying to get that CS back right quick. A little bit slow on that one. Phoenix mm -hmm. does get a nice trade in. Bonus for Phoenix. That top lane, though, very good to mention that because Quas is doing really well and he is invested in the early home guards. Yeah. A couple of games we did see Quas just decide to go pure split pushing and he just straight rushed Trinity Force. Yep. But he is looking for a cross map play this time around because uh, he pretty much already has the matchup in hand. Yeah. Working with that uh, early CS lead he's worked up against Balls. That kill potential as well with the Ignite teleport instead of Balls running the teleport smite. Very true. So, probably catch somebody off guard at least once. In order to do that, they need to get more wards out on the field, though. Team Liquid yeah. are having a hard time. Just because it's double Sightstone Rush against Nunu, it's really hard to keep up that vision game against this Nautilus-Nunu combo. Uh, Meteos doing a good job not only smiting Raptors for the buff, as Dominic has as well, but uh, dropping pink wards and keeping that vision game up. A lot of control wanted right now on the bottom side of this map. It looks like they also know where the wards are being placed. We see a few pings coming in from Team Liquid here. Yes, they play it safe for the time being. Once again, that engage. It is a level six special. He's going to throw down the ultimate. He finally does, oh. but it might be enough to take him down. A special's forced to go back oh. in to finally save Piglet. Sneaky flashes forward. Parallel Convergence comes in. Dominates now in the fight with the phase dive. Could it be enough to carry him off, though? The early damage may not be there. Dominate looking for the time winder, but it's just going to be an auto attack. Now on to Lemonation. If he can get out to slow, he might get the catch, but I don't know if it's going to be enough damage to finalize the big tank. Lemonation just walks away from that one. A little bit repaired there from Team Liquid, but a good engage by C9. And that is exactly why so many teams are now focusing the bottom lane of Cloud9. Sneaky and Lemon make a huge play. They make a 2v2 outplay by themselves, yeah. but no deep wards. They've all timed out, even with the new new jungle, so they don't see Dominate arriving, and they do get caught. Dominate with another move down bottom to capitalize help out Piglet and get a kill for himself this time. So help all around. 
Dominate 101 having an assist in the kills all around the map so far. As we see, Expecial just playing the ward game, trying to get a few forward and see if any more will come his way so they can defend those. Wants to go back out and get the pink. So just a little bit of breathing room here for the rest of Team Liquid. Mid lane, Phoenix seems like he wants to go pretty aggressive and he is not winning these trades by any mean off the bat. Yeah, completed Morella Namicon already for Incarnation because he had that earlier recall. Got to use his slight advantage to complete the item. Since then though, Phoenix doing a good job catching up. Double support roams with the uh, task of clearing out wards around mid. It's a back and forth between the items. Some finished on the side of Cloud9. Merlo Namicon, as you were saying, BS Sword Pickaxe, but you're going up against Fade Sheen now, so you got that poke as well. It's definitely going to be a good fight from both teams here, barring the fact that they take too much damage to start it off, and I think that might be what we're seeing right here. Liquid trying to get in a good spot. The teleport is first from Balls. Quas is going to answer, but it's not a home guard Hecarim coming in here. He is able to grab the kill, actually. Coming in first, nicely on to Lemonation as he was trying to route the other side of the fight. Balls is right in the middle. Four members of Team Liquid able to focus him down. Meteos going down in the fight to the hands of Piglet throughout that, but just not what Cloud9 wanted. Yeah, Cloud9 with a little bit slow there on that invade. And Team Liquid, good collapse. Dominate was able to land the slow, back off, and then get his W up. Yep. Wait for that uh, small travel time. Ooh. Close off the exit. 50-50. <laughs> like it. So the teleport's coming in big there. Quas actually not even using the ignite within that one. Team Liquid finding pretty much everything they want. Dragon's still going to be what's coming up next, and that might just go over to Cloud9 here with what TL had to expend in that last fight. Yeah, so far with the Nunu, these are, this is the advantage of Cloud9. It's trying to stack, nope. stack the dragons. It's really difficult though to fully utilize a dragon advantage when you are re significantly down in gold. So yep. at this point, the gold disadvantage is manageable for Cloud9, uh, but it's going to become very, very difficult for them as we get to number three and four. Even though they have stacked up the first two, in order to win the next dragon fight, um, Team Liquid would have to be out of position uh, and they would have to make a misstep as far as uh, yeah. allocating resources because Team Liquid... They have to make a big misstep. They're relentlessly pushing their wards forward here. They see everything Cloud9's doing. Plus, they're about to hit oh. the double Trinity Force spike. Oh, Miss Quas, though! <laughs> misstep, why, Kobe? Here comes the call in. Quas still going to be pretty tanky out of this. And Parallel Convergence is going to keep everybody just from re-engaging. I don't think they want it anyways from the side of Cloud9. They're still trying to repair what happened here in the early game. Put them 2,000 gold down. Right now, bottom lane just crashing into the turret for Liquid. Nobody's picking that up here. Cloud9 just has to focus on other things. Right now, to deny the blue buff would still be pretty good. All right, collapse here from Team Liquid. They want to answer. Five people moving up. Quas does not have teleport. Or Balls does not have right. teleport, so Cloud9 are going to be outnumbered. Oh, Meteos thinking he can get in. Gets bumped out of his absolute zero and only a few more shots needed to take him down. Quas picks that one up. Now a 202 horse only getting bigger. Yeah, outnumbered, going for the invade and Cloud9 pay the price here. Strong lane, it's, strong game for Team Liquid. Even. Yeah. And it's happening again. Their, their dragons that they've gotten do not give a lot of power in the early game. The main power is if you're ahead to be able to force the uh, right. hand of your opponent but it should be Team Liquid's time to take over the game. As we talked about, mid-game focused. They've got the Trinity Force on yeah. uh, Corky already, and Hecarim like. should be close to completed his. So as if they do a good job with their vision, then they might be able to make a play. Let's see if uh, Balls can make a play down here. He's waiting patiently for it. See if he can. He's we, hoping for a face check for Piglet. We heard him talking earlier. You know, Quas can play more of these aggressive champions, although they share some of the same pool. We see Hecarim just kind of take out oh, Balls' fizz within this game. So he said it himself that this would kind of happen in lane. Expecting it, still now trying to repair. Only seven CS behind, but not able to make the same impact in the team fights here. Yeah. Sneaky now to clear out the top wave. A little help from Lemonation so they don't get themselves into too scary of a situation. Able to even up the turrets now, but still, uh, the extra kills for Team Liquid. They're working with the 
fairly significant item advantage still. And they have an approximate timer yep. on Dragon as well. So they should be able to set up for that in time. Plenty of wards as well to set up a teleport play. As Dominate has opted to go with the uh, full tank Echo as expected coming from the jungle. Going Sight Stone for utility. Um, and he'll be relying on his passive yeah. triple hits. As like well it. as the utility that he brings with his giant AoE stun. It's a big nuisance out of the jungle. Time winders everywhere. Parallel convergence. Huge cast range, actually, which can really separate a fight if a team doesn't know how to get around it. Or yep. that they can just walk through it without him being there. Phoenix going deep. No real chains to come out there and any extra damage. Expecial may find himself in a spot he does not want to be. There's that parallel convergence. Just kind of separating everything for a quick second. Here. Yeah. Balls in the bot lane should be able to get this. Let's see. Uh, uh, actually, I don't know. Let's see Aquas is heading down there to try and cut him off. He's definitely going to push him off before that wave can be of too much help. Got the cannon. And that's just when the wave reached the turret. We saw that previously, I said. That was crashing into Cloud Nines. They were not picking up that CS. So they're kind of a little late to the janitorial duty here in some of the lanes. Not giving them the lane pressure they want just outright. They're always trying to clean up and trying to recoup here. Coming up on 20 minutes. Good lead by Team Liquid so far. And if Phoenix can keep doing that, Cloud9 is not going to want to start any fights. Trying again. That could have been Incarnation going down if he connected the chain. Well, good thing for Cloud9 he did not because Incarnation is going to be the main focus for the team now. Keeping him up, keeping him blood boiled. They need that Azir. Constant DPS to actually turn uh, the team fight if they are going to take one mm -hmm. at during these mid stages. Otherwise, they should just play defensively. They should probably not try to contest this next dragon uh, because they are, you know, out itemized at the at the moment. Yeah. Well, gotta say he's definitely having a bit of a better game on Azir. Last one was last week versus Xiaowei Xiao on Impulse, and Xiaowei Xiao went 808 in that game. So Incarnation is right at the ship here, at least in that matchup. Kept himself alive throughout the landing phase. Yeah. All right, though, Team Liquid setting up for Dragon, 40 seconds ahead, getting all their vision down, really nicely set up by them. They've got the double Trinity Force. They even have a Teleport Ignite opportunity with Quas if he wants to go sit in Fountain yeah. and charge up his home guards. So uh, Cloud9 definitely need other options. Nunu does open up early Barons since the Cloud9 are focusing a lot of vision over yep. here. Maybe. You have they a, go with a risky play, and they you try have a to trade the early over the Baron for Dragon. We saw it in Europe. Very risky, though. You have a team that can get over the backside of that wall. Prepo was going crazy when they did it with Bard, but this entire team, except for Nautilus, can get themselves over. Good pressure by Liquid here in mid lane, and they're not going to find anything. The pressure here from Sneaky and Balls on the outside says this is what we want to focus on, and hopefully they can drop this outer turret. Sneaky's already going to have to back off, but Balls does finally get that one to go down so they can start to open up the map a little more. Still looking for the mid turret, though. This goes to show you just how much pressure Team Liquid has had in general on the map when you still have that up. Well, yeah, a fairly good trade there for Cloud9 to... They know they can't handle that poke. Uh-oh. Woo! Bye-bye. Oh, maybe, maybe. Cloud9 Great going flash. pretty hard here. A little bit of a tunnel onto Phoenix. They're still going to depth charge, so he can't follow up on any of the executing kills, and they are going to be able to get out of that. Few too many ultimates used, though, to disengage. Yeah. Cloud9 try to get with the collapse. They have to be very careful, though, when trying to go for these trades. The 1-3-1 one, one split push while Team Liquid shove up mid and trying to abuse their LeBlanc plus Corky poke at the turret. Yep. So clean up the side lanes now for Liquid before they really get themselves into any fighting. Great forward ward so far. They're sitting on the Triforce Spikes. They can really get a good fight out of the team if they get the right positioning. We've seen Phoenix trying to pick people off, and right now, Incarnation has been that target over and over again. The calls coming from Medios and Lemonation throughout the game, mostly Medios, especially during times of being down, trying to get the team back in line. Yep, strong vision control. 
There's the dragon. Cloud9 should not and will not contest. Uh, I talked about the possibility of that sneaky new new early Baron trade for Dragon, but because Team Liquid covered their bases, yep. they were able to get wards up on the Baron. That's not a possibility. You do not want to get your hands caught in the Baron jar this early in the game. <laughs> so not on the table for Cloud9. Dominate definitely no stranger to those sneaky new new Baron plays. Nope. And you will not be able to pull that off this game. He goes side to side on Echo. Now at the top side of the map, he's going to be getting scuttle control for the team. And it looks like a little bit of that Baron control is recognized that the fact Nunu is on the side of Cloud9. So they want to start locking down the vision on that. With 6 to 2, the fight's going to definitely be in their favor. They find it first. They're more powerful. Phoenix already able to put that needlessly large rod inside his inventory. His incarnation's looking for the Abyssal Scepter, saying, it hurts too much, but I still want to do a little bit of damage myself. Righteous Glory on Delemination. You guys need a little bit more of a way a, to get uh, back into the front right here. Quas is on the chase there. Balls it looks like he's kind of in the enemy jungle, but playful trickster away. A little bit of love. able to escape. A little bit of love indeed. Or trying to take he? down the huge horse. Dominate. Getting out of balls. You can see not too much damage. Just trying <laughs> yeah. to facilitate more of the team being able to get there and collapse down in the fight. Cloud9 putting their foot down now saying we want to start being the ones to pressure. And we'll see how Liquid responds. They've been on the foot on the pedal the whole time. It looks like now oil. they're on reverse. Good turret there for Cloud9. Cross map move. Medios though takes a bit of poke on the exit. So they were able to use balls getting caught in the jungle. Quote unquote caught. All right, well, let's see here if they end up paying for it. Ooh, Dominate trying to run out. Depth charges on. Medios is trying to follow the back line as Balls comes in here. Dominate should not be living too much longer. Goes for the chrono break. He escapes. Parallel conversion. Oh. Not going to be able to come out and shield him at all. And there's just too much catch up. He was not able to use that phase dive to a champion to get the movement speed. Cloud9 crawling back into this game through shot calling. Able to make a play on the bottom side of the map. And a little bit of a misplay there from Team Liquid. Yeah. They get a kill on the back of the turret as well. Smart game plan from Cloud9. See if they can keep it up, though, because they do have to deal with minion waves now. They spent so much time bottom. Mm -hmm. Looks like they're going to be able to uh, recoup the rest of the gold. So we saw the first time they had to react, a little bit of a mistake. Went a little overkill for the fight and lost one of their own members there. Two to one in the Dragons. So it would be good if Team Liquid could stop that move to five here from Cloud9, and they have with the most recent one. So that closes the gold a little bit. Also allows Cloud9 to get more wards in the forward part of the map than they had before. It was real dark before, and now they can start to get a little more pressure on this. Yeah, good job by Cloud9. Recognizing the strength of grouping versus the double assassins from Team Liquid. We yeah. saw them control the double assassins very well in that last engage. Even though Phoenix jumped back out. Hello. Dominate was in line for the calling. Feeling pretty confident about disengaged. Nice dredge line to the terrain. Oh. It's going to get Lemonation to safety here, but Team Liquid still focusing in on this one. Quas with the TP home guard goes right for Sneaky. He's down to about 30% HP immediately and is trying to kite the fight out now. Dominate in the front line. Phoenix and Expecial on the top side as they still go for Sneaky. And Lemonation, Sneaky's now in a bad spot, but he relentless pursuits trying to get the safety. He still goes down. A nice sigil coming in from Phoenix. Takes down Lemonation as it's going to be. <laughs> special in the trample to get a final kill. Ball says fishy stuff on the backside, but Incarnation cannot follow up. And Liquid in and out, basically unscathed. Everybody's got pretty good health bars. Ball's with the free willy right there. Lands his fish <laughs> and then hops right over it. Expecial's head. And no effect on the fight at all. So Team Liquid able to use the teleport. Home guard, they get to the back line. Quas does his job. And they've got control of Baron Pit. Woo! Going in. Nice dip back and use of that distortion by Phoenix, making sure they don't have any chances to get themselves closer to that Baron. Balls really wants oh, to, he wants to make a play. one more engage. The focus needs to be on Baron. He did it. Balls gets in. He steals the Baron. He had the smite and he used it perfectly. The team is up. So Cloud9 gets that on four members. <laughs> All right. He made up for his lack of team. They were so worried right about there. incarnation the whole time. Well, they've it's also got a minion wave to work with. They're going to get a turret off it as well. Absolutely ridiculous. Beautiful play by Cloud9 to persevere. 
at the Baron pit. Ball's coming through with a huge play after being put down in lane all game to bring the team back in. It's the kind of thing you don't want to have to count on, but you'll definitely be glad <laughs> when it, it comes through for you. Now they've got three members in the enemy jungle. Can they make a play on the Blanc? They've got the Raptor buff on Meteo, so they know that they are... No. Oh. Oh, they got it. Oh, quick move. That's the depth charge, and that's the call. <laughs> oh, man. They pop the clone. They pop Phoenix. He goes down, so they are going down all across the map here, Kobe. Let's watch this one more. So much right. focus on Incarnation when this guy's the problem. Yeah, they Balls. You, you're not used to having to deal with two smites, but Balls, he just gets up to the edge of the bear Whoop. pit. His ward that he dropped over the side, oh. and he outsmites. Drops the trident. Thank you very much. Woo. Walks out. 16 seconds on Dragon. You can expect Cloud9 to force this a bit. They have all the wards they need to chomp that one down, especially with Meteos. And it's going to have to be lane repair here from Team Liquid, at least in the bottom side. Looks like Phoenix has that under control, so the rest of the team might try to give a little bit of pressure to this Dragon. Oh, man, yeah. I was downplaying this early stacking Dragon of Cloud9. But they still have Nunu. They still have the double yeah. smite. So neutral objective control now that the game is uh, coming back towards even and they've been able to make up for the early game losses. Cloud9 sitting very pretty here. They've got the late game of Azir Nunu to rely on. They've been able to work their way through you know, their mid game hardships. That's almost two in a row we see quick mistakes as Team Liquid is pressured. In the bottom lane, we saw Dominate go a little hard after they dove onto Quas, mm -hmm. he got out with the ultimate. Now at Baron, they kind of get themselves into a sticky situation. Can't find themselves out. Both of those times have given Cloud9 a huge, huge chance to get uh, back in this game. And now it's only about an 800 gold lead. That kill under the turret. It'll be a little bit harder until you can break the shield. But yeah. Piglet and the rest of the team still looking to go hard for these kills. They're not giving up. That is definitely a full tank fizz right there. LeBlanc sh shrugged off. Just finished that frozen heart from the last fights. That was very little. Yeah, that's exactly what Cloud9 want. Fizz to be the focus. Yeah. They want Balls to get into the fight first to try and start baiting people. Because not only is he extremely tanky with the build, but he also has the low cooldown playful trickster. It's also maxed just to create uh, some havoc. Now, what I like to top off this build with, yeah. I don't like to go 100% full fi uh, tank Fizz. <laughs> A Blade of the Ruin King for the last item, since you already have Spirit Visage, uh, makes him really good at taking down any other tanks in the game. Uh, not only because of his W and right. the Blade of the Ruined King, but the mixed damage as well. Zero Turret going to try and make pressure by time for the Fizz split push. Oh boy. He has Quas. teleport. Quas coming in again. There's the TP coming in for Fizz right in the middle of the fight. That means he has the back line in his eyes if he wants to, and he goes right for Piglet. It can't be helped. He misses the fish, actually. So Qua or Balls, rather, not getting what he wants out of that fight at all. Meteos gets pushed out. Expecial's getting the rest of the peel for their team on. Now they're on to Lemonation. Liquid has all the focus they want after that error. Ooh, Team Liquid able to get another great initiation with Quas from the Hecarim. They force the issue and run straight up mid. Straight up mid, special to be a brute force tank here, being the first guy to put his old butt in the way, and they'll be good. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. He's a veteran. Gets that, quickly kicking these down, and it looks like they're going to be out with an inhibitor nicely. I don't think any real danger is going to be coming their way. Phoenix getting a little edgy there, but he also takes Sneaky down to about 20% HP on the way out to make sure they cannot just flood out the base and stop these backs here. Great play by Team Liquid. They actually stopped on that one. After they got the advantage, they didn't go too hard. That's what they fixed through the past fights now. Ooh, what a close game we have here, Riv. All right, so yeah, Quas, great move right there to get around Nautilus. So did Piglet dodge this, or did he just miss the fish? Let's see what happens. And Piglet on the outside. Yeah, he's just able to kite she just kited it out, the yeah. entire time. And uh, uh, Lemon Nation also got hit up by the parallel convergence. Halfway through, they were able to land the one-man stun, and it really separated the team fight as well. Yep. You do get a lot of zone control out of that Echo, and the uh, Azir Lucian locked up on the other side of it, so splitting the DPS from Cloud9 off from the rest of the team. Yep. Like we were able to collapse. 
right, what kind of core items are in inventories now? 80 carries or three items each. Frozen hearts for Quas and Dominate here as they're really trying to shut down the damage this Fizz can do, that this Sneaky can do as they get into the fights. And that teleport was probably one of the best that Cloud9's gonna get into a fight, right onto the back line. And somehow Team Liquid were able to dance it out very, very nicely. 32 minutes in, those Triforce is still doing a good amount of damage. Liquid pushing top, Quas in the bot lane, so it looks like they're gonna start spreading Cloud9 thin here, and we could actually get a fight if this wall of offense does not show themselves. C9 doesn't have the wards here. Cloud9 should get their wall up there with Azir, yeah. bring him up, and they could defend this turret. A little bit slow on the rotation, though. Very, very slow on the rotation. Especially for a turret that you can route a team and get behind for the engage. Team Liquid only want the turret, though. Playing it cool and collected in this one. Yeah, Cloud9 have to be very careful because Quas was able to make that initiation on Hecarim without using teleport previously. He does have teleport now. Leave it up to everything, Kobe. And a pink ward is what you start the fight over. Dominates a little too close. Chrono break back to the fight. He's nice and healthy now. That's going to be Medios going down to the Ignite. Balls to the back line again, not able to hit that fish as much as he wants. It stays alive, even through the chain, and Phoenix goes down, and now the fight is on to Echo. Oh, Dominate gets hit up, and Garnation gets himself out of the fight. Sneaky's trying to kite this one out. Balls, or rather Quas, able to chopper him down, cut him down with the Hecarim Q, and now they're on to Lemon Nation. It's only going to take a little bit here. <laughs> they know they don't have to worry about King Carnation at all, but they also could be getting a push off. Oh. That's it. Leave the kill to Piglet. Very smart move and start heading towards all the right. objective. Well, can they finish this off? Because Incarnation is going to do his best to delay them and buy time for Medias. All right, just the threat of Incarnation poking over the wall with those Sand Soldiers. Is it enough to dissuade Team Liquid for Woo. full commitment? And we see another drawn out team fight with how many ridiculously tanky champions we have. Whoever's mid or AD carry goes down first mm -hmm. is the team to lose the team fight. That's, uh, okay. So keep track of Piglet Phoenix, Incarnation, and Sneaky. Those are the four main ones. Special gets chunked out extremely low at the same time as Midos. Those are pretty much you know, frontliner for frontliner. Midos tries to stay alive by eating the wolf here, but. This is basically everybody converging on uh, balls there, Fizz in the back, and the opposite for Cloud9. Incarnation able to get away for a second here, dodging this missile. And that's the only thing that saved Baron for Cloud9. Yeah. If it wasn't for that, it would have completely cleaned up the entire fight. Cross on Hecarim. Very, very strong force as far as this game is concerned. Doing a significant amount more than the Fizz in the team fight. In the replay, I noticed that Chum the Waters actually hit the clone and Ooh. not Phoenix. So that, that's one of the that'll things. smart. That's one of the things that'll that Hecarim smart. has over Fizz. <laughs> Since they build very similarly, they want to do very similar things. Yeah. Hecarim can just guarantee his ultimate to the back line. Fizz has to really work that fish around. Right to try and get it on the right target because there's so many strong frontliners here, it's hard to get to the back line. To Team Liquid's credit, they are dodging and being in the right spot for Fizz's ultimates. Balls has got himself to the right spots. They are just making it very hard for him to actually come up big on any of them. Parallel Convergence gets thrown up towards the top side, so Dominate has that down as they try to lock down balls. And Sneaky here, Sneaky not in a good spot. That's gonna activate Baron. Baron takes down Sneaky with the help of Quas on that one. They're gonna get a good hit onto Piglet here, but they're quickly also just gonna trade the damage back over to Balls. Another victory in the favor of Team Liquid. Piglet has actually gone down to the fight and the, I believe, oh right my. in the end on that one. A good hit coming up, absolute zero. Able to do a bit, but not enough to the health bars of Team Liquid as you all right, Kobe. Oh my, the triple kills. Phoenix starts dishing out some huge damage. The benefits of a full tank echo is that you can stick in the same spot yeah. for long enough for the four seconds to catch up. And the ultimate from Dominate there, not only healing, but landing yep. a big chunk onto Incarnation. Baron up for Team Liquid. They should be able to now take the inhibitor. This is the, the basically the biggest swing that we've had in this game. Yeah. Finally, Baron going to tip the scales and get them that pushing 
power. We're sneaking down at the beginning. There's no way Cloud9 come out of this with anything beneficial happening. There's so few DPS, you know, players in right. this game. If one of them goes down at the very beginning, even though you've got two versus two, uh, three over here for Cloud9, sticking around for that, just waiting for Team Liquid to collapse, they all end up going down. Whew. Like it. Echo able to be used in these skirmish fights that just last forever. You got two on one side, another two or three fighting on the other. As long as he can get his ghost in the right spot, he's definitely going to be helping. Especially we got Phoenix distorting back in. That's what we saw just in that fight. Makes it now 21 to 8, 38 minutes on the clock here. And Team Liquid definitely making the Echo pick work. Did not in the early game. It wasn't the reason for everything happening. Uh, starting to come out big. They definitely know how to fight around it. We haven't seen many teams be able to do that. Piglet, 4, 1, and 12. We talked about him a little bit earlier. Definitely a better season. Things just seem to be huge, hugely on board with the communication for the team. Pretty strong game here from Team Liquid. Cloud9 able to you know, pull back a little bit in that mid game with some smart calls, but too many kills for Ooh. Team Liquid. And Quas still hasn't died on this Hecarim. In the bottom lane, the split push takes its toll. One turret down. Yep. Looking at number two here, and they'll probably collapse onto this inhibitor. 10k gold lead Oh, he now. forced the flash with just parallel conversions. Just a few minutes ago, C9 had Taking closed head. this gold lead, but now it is Team Liquid. Pushing all the way in. It's not going to be much longer for C9 in this game, Kobe. It does not look like they've been able to iron out the wrinkles just, yet, just yet. Team Liquid's going to move themselves onto a 4-1 now, being tied with Dignitas in the top of the list as they look at the Nexus turrets. It was only going to be so long in this game. Strong play from Quas in the top lane. Strong play from Phoenix in that mid lane, and the rest of the team was able to pretty much carry along with that. They're on to the Nexus. It's going to be 40 minutes for this one as Cloud9 did as much as they could to come back in the game, but it just did not pay off. Team Liquid take down Cloud9 to go 4-1. and one. Yeah, great job there by Team Liquid. A very strong all-around performance from them. Yeah. As Cloud9 continue their slide. They had a good split bottom. They had a, a barren steal that kept them in the game for a little while from balls, but not able to pull out, not able to execute in the team fights. And uh, Team Liquid were able to secure yeah. their victory after the early strong play. Great adaptation to making errors after their advantageous moments. As we said, Liquid faltered in the bot lane. They lost Dominate after Quas got out alive. Then they faltered at the Baron. But after that, they said, you know what? We're getting advantages and then just throwing them away. Get the advantage and be happy with it. Sometimes that's a hard thing to do, especially in a high intensity game. But they were able to calm themselves down and really able to make the right calls and the right moves. It did, did not help that somehow Sneaky was caught out there at the end of that fight, at that Baron attempt, that really started to just catapult Liquid even more back into the game to give them position. Let's see what kind of damage charts we have on here. Piglet having a very good game for himself. 4, 1, and 12. I think we said within the first few games, he had more kills than he did for his last split. And it's just, it's its getting bigger and bigger now. The team trusts in him more. First Blood went to that bot lane to help get him fed. A lot more trust there, and it's working out for Team Liquid as they approach four and one. Yeah, the focus on attacking Cloud9's bottom lane does seem to be the emerging trend so far. Yep. And they've got a ways to climb back. Um, now, we are already into week three, and they are still working out the kinks. Early game control, not quite what they wanted. Yeah. Team Liquid, though, all smiles. As they said, next match, that's Team Impulse versus Team Dragon Knights. And Impulse started the day tied for sixth place and have been a little slow getting up to speed. Yeah, they did have two of the biggest speed bumps that are possible in the LCS. You know, they faced TSM and COG in the first two weeks. This is true. And they have had a couple of impressive wins as well, but they're definitely still an inconsistent team uh, made up 
made up of impetuous players. Not only Rush and Shao Shao, which people always point to, mm -hmm. but we've, all, we've also seen this a little bit with Impact as well. You know, a lot of the pros talk about how Impact is such a re, uh, an aggressive player. He can either win the game really hard with these uh, low percentage chance plays, but he can also uh, get very far behind and uh, cause some problems for the team. Of course, though, this is something that is expected with Team Impulse. This is the way they like to play, yep. fight early and often, take a lot of chances, uh, and for the most part, it works out for Impact. You know, to his credit, he's yeah. a very, very strong top laner, and he's won a lot of the games for his team. Seems like he's pretty cool and collected right now, sure of himself. Wouldn't feel too bad if I was one of the best top laners, if not the best in North America. And meanwhile, hopes were high that TDK would be fielding their intended roster. But once again, visa issues have kept them from playing this week. Right. Uh, TDK, you know, they also said they've been prioritizing their practice with Ninja and Emperor. Right. But with each week that passes, it puts them in a deeper and deeper hole. Even the subs thought that they were done this time around. So this comes as a surprise to them as well. They've returned uh, to the LCS on yeah. short notice. Now, though, they're 0-4, and they have a really difficult schedule ahead of them this week, playing Team Impulse and TSM tomorrow. So once they get their full roster together, this team may have a large deficit to work off. And Apollo says the best thing TDK can do is worry about tomorrow's problems tomorrow. For Seraph and Kez, I think that their best chance at doing well as a team would be try not to focus on their like win ratio right now and just try and improve as a team when their their players get back and as well as just look for that playoff spot. Well, hopefully they can do that. Let's check out the starting lineups as we get right into the game and figure out if it all pans out for them. On the blue side, it's going to be Team Impulse. That's Impact in the top lane, Rush in the jungle, Xiaowei Zhao in mid, Apollo at AD carry, and Adrian at support. And on the red side, we have Team Dragon Knights. Up top is Seraph in the jungle, Keds, mid Bishu, AD carry, Latman, and support Smoothie. All right, so I'm hoping kind of for a Xiaowei Xiao echo. I feel yeah. like he could be one of the guys that's crazier, and he's going to go absolutely insane and show us some I, of those plays. Maybe we get the Shao Wei Shao today. I do feel like we should have more melee carries in the North American LCS. Korea gets like a ribbon idea. all the time. They've got all <laughs> kinds of crazy plays between Master Yi, Aurelia, Yasuo, so true. Fizz. Team Impulse is definitely the team to play a bunch of melee carries yes, they because are. of the style that they like to run with very you know mid-centric rushdown plays with a Sivir. On the squad. Yep. Fighting one after the other, whether they go down or not. I bet you if they could all run teleport, if it was in the meta, they would. Because you could fight more. You'd be right back in. Have to mention, going into these picks and bans, TDK will lose all bans this week. Team Dragon Knight submitted a roster on Wednesday with players who were not in the country. In the view of league operations, they want to discourage teams from declaring starters who they know will have a significant likelihood to not actually make it to the game. Forfeits hurt fans and the league, and last-minute substitutions are not fair to their opponents who spent time preparing for the starting lineup. That will never materialize. So that will be TDK's bans for this week, and hopefully the roster can get righted as we continue the summer split next week. Yeah, they submitted their uh, main roster before the players had their visas right. actually acquired. There's and a lot of hope there, it. though. You know, coming into another week, wanting to use your players. I can see where that comes from, but <laughs> it will penalize them. As if you will it, this. it will be so. Will not so much with visas. Try to manifest. It will not work. So we will definitely get some crazy champions in this one because of that, Kobe. Callista and Gragas are going to find themselves on the ban list. Yeah, high There's likelihood Ryan, of uh, Rise, Alistar, Echo, all kinds of things getting Echo. through. Who can hold the most OP picks? I don't know. We'll have to see. I'm trying to decide. Wait on. the timeout here for TDK as it ticks down, and Impulse will have their third ban. Quickly, the Rise ban. <laughs> as if they were confused that Ryze was going to be banned out here. Smiles on the faces, they know they have to go through this one with a bit of that kind of chip off the block of not being able to get anything out of the hands of Impulse. All right. They get what they want, Impact smiling about top lane. He knows what he, he's going to be playing this game. Let's see what they jump on first. Impulse do have the first pick, so we're just waiting for that band to time out, and they get uh, whatever champion in the game they desire. 
the Alistar. Why not? Most Adrian, a very big Leona player, so he knows all about always being in the fight and being tanky. That's interesting. I actually put him a little bit lower on the list of OPs. Nope. But we'll see how crucial that is. What would you have reflected we'll on for that first? See, uh, Echo. Uh, we'll see oh, just how that so. does right. reflect in their in-game strategy. Though. I don't know. I got to say, I'm not sold on just the Echo. I feel like the team completely has to be on board. A really chaotic team fight from Impulse. All right, maybe, well, maybe, on the... Maybe it doesn't get locked in by Kez. Who knows? On the backswing, their second round, uh, I would actually like to see Impulse focus on that Sivir and try and get it early for Apollo from the bottom lane just mm -hmm. because it's such a crucial champion to the way that Impulse played the game. And they've already banned Kalista, so I feel like it's a fairly safe move to try and jump on that pick early. Kez opting for his famed Nidalee. Yep. All right. Janna and Nidalee locked in here for Team Dragon Knights. Still leaving as many of the priority picks that have not been banned up here for Impulse. You can still go Rek'Sai. You can still go whatever you want in the jungle. Xiao Wei Xiao still has that Echo open. It's going to be the LeBlanc and Apollo locking in the Sivir as well, keeping tried and true to that pick. Yeah, what is uh, Bishu going to run into LeBlanc? Because they basically wasted one of their priority pick options with Janna, who, you know, Alistar's already, she's a great pick, Janna is fine, but Alistar's already locked in. You know they're not going to grab that from you. Yeah. And uh, they would, Bishu would rather have the counter pick than opt for one of those early, strong, all-around picks like LeBlanc. Mm -hmm. With Zed getting that nerf, you know, there's not a lot of really, you know, hard counters or very strong right. counters into LeBlanc. So we'll see what he opts for this time around. He did have a very good um, Varus game. The victor needed a little bit of work, but we'll see how he does against Xiao Wei Xiao. You know, you can laser through LeBlanc into the origin of her distortion to guarantee true. that you will hit Kinda the laser the damage, shot. but there's nothing you can do to stop LeBlanc's burst as Victor. So you can Victor try and shield yourself a little bit. Victor Lucian picked up on the side of Team Dragon Knights. Just kind of rounding out a composition of champions that they feel comfortable on, and you have to expect that. Even you said yourself, Kobe, these guys coming in at the last second, even Bishu is tweeting, whoa, I play Bjergsen this week now. I did not expect that. <laughs> so tomorrow he has to do that. Today he has to face Xiao Wei Xiao, and without any preparation against two of the most aggressive dudes in the mid lane, it might be a little difficult. Could see a Katarina on the other side. It's hovered. The crowd likes it. And we're waiting for the last two picks here from Impulse. Echo's made his way all the way down to pick number seven. Or it's say pick number eight because it's eight, nine, ten. Yeah, and of course, you know, the value that teams place on Echo will vary greatly yep. depending on how much time people have put into it. Or, you know, as Dominate went over, how much focus the team has on learning the new champions and getting on the uh, yep. avant-garde curve of League of Legends as quickly as possible. Well, here we are, the Lee Sin. Not exactly uh, the forefront of <laughs> the jungle meta, but it will be locked in to try and answer the Nidalee. And there's no huge tank on TDK locked in yet. You know, with top lane still an option for it. But at least in right now, this looks like an okay game to run mm -hmm. him into if you're gonna run him in this meta. Uh, not, not too many issues on the opposing team at the moment. I don't put anything past Rush. His last season, he was still, or rather, last split, he was still playing the Warrior Vi whenever he wanted to, so he brings out what he wants. He yeah, does what he wants when he wants. Bard could be locked in here by Smoothie for TDK, possibly trying to make some plays in the team fights with that tempered fate and some magical journeys that will hopefully bring Team Dragon Knights to the victory here. Yeah. Whoa, a Mundo versus Team Impulse. Fortunately, it's not a top bard. It's top Mundo coming in. It's going to be, like you said, against Impulse. Some a team that can definitely start to kind of pinch out anything they can find. Is that a diveable Seraph in the top lane? We do know Seraph has brought that Mundo yeah. from the Challenger series on. It's something he likes to play, so it's not going to be that easy to take down. They do go for it. Not back and really. forth here. 
Not really a fan of the uh, Mundo, especially against a team like Impulse. Impulse are all about rush, make an early move. We got a lead. All right, we have Sivir as well. Mm -hmm. Turn it into <laughs> overdrive here. Pop Sivir ultimates mid game because we already have an early game lead and end the game that way. Mundo has a hard time, you know, getting up to the tanky point that Maokai has a very easy build path into. Mundo is going to take a bit longer to scale up to that very strong tanky stage. Yeah. We'll see if Seraph can do it. He will probably be going with the uh, challenging Smite and Cinder Hulk build, which just further delays Mundo's power spike as it you know, benefits all yep. from the extra HP building that you build after your Cinder Hulk. Well, hopefully they can stave off any of the fighting that we're going to see Impulse wanting to do. So TDK can get to that point, play a little bit of poke game with the Nidalee they picked up. And right now it is time to turn to the stuff... <laughs> Turn your turn to stuff the ballot boxes, rather. Cannot speak. Hard to do. Vote for the team you think will come out on top by tweeting hashtag TIP win or hashtag TDK win to at LOL Esports. And we'll be tallying those up throughout the game. As always, we had a pretty good 50-50 vote earlier that that game played out exactly how we would, th how we would have thought. Pretty 50-50. Now we jump into this one. We'll see what the vote is in just a few as Impulse tries to take down TDK here. Two and two for Impulse. TDK looking for a win. The sub squad is trying to bring that out for them, but it's just been a difficult start to the season. Yeah, it truly has. And they've had some good showings in the early stages for a couple of their games, even though they have you know, lost all four of the initial LCS games with the sub squad. They've made the early stages uh, look fairly e fairly close for a while. That's always a good sign. High accuracy there from Kez. Yeah, already calibrated right out of the gate. Usually it takes a few. <laughs> so we got Coinstar as well as the Adrian with the Relic. 30 seconds until minions spawn. To see how much of a hand Apollo has with his team here. That's why I keep highlighting the Sivir with the team impulse. Mm -hmm. And no surprise, they will Five be games in a row advantage now. of it this time. They're always yep. able to get it. Definitely priority when they go through picks and bans here. That's impulse. every single game. Yep. Yeah. This yep. split, by the way. Impulse is very, very good at fighting, so why not give you somebody that can bring a huge amount of utility to that fight and speed everybody up? Also, usually has a pretty safe laning phase with Adrian. Let's see here. It looks like they're pretty easy. Yeah, trying to finagle some uh, early experience for Apollo. Stack up the saplings. Very safe from both sides as well. So everybody's they're getting what they want here without aggression. They've just now revealed the lane swap. So that'll be fine. TDK going to be uh, just fine with the lane swap here early. Group up, and they will have a freeze bottom, whereas t Impulse do not have the option to freeze since right. they, they are taking the Gromp. They won't uh, be able to get there in time. That means that TDK, they need to know and they need to count on uh, the early shove mm -hmm. from Impulse. We'll see if they can time it because we saw earlier today such a great job of TSM in the lane swap to capitalize. Uh, and tr you try and cut off the reinforcements yeah. to that turret. Uh, be the first one to teleport in Fog of War so the enemies don't know you're teleporting. To try and gain experience advantage from lane swap. So everybody should be on the same page. TDK freeze. Impulse push. Yep. Double jump is all around. Did just see Adrian getting an eye on Seraph and Kez. We actually had Smoothie doing the same thing, but he did not see anyone. Still gives him information, lets him know Impulse was all on the top side, and now that both teams know they're not getting that matchup, this freeze in the bottom lane could pay off here. They want to change it whenever they want, they can do so. Now slow pushing it in. See if they have any plan here. TK, at the moment, it doesn't look like they have uh, any plan to defend or try and sneak into yeah. experience top, so. Looks like the dragon will be their option. Keep bottom frozen. Try and do the early dragon. Nidalee yep. and Mundo is a great combo to pull off an early dragon with, but Rush is in the area, and it's a, still a very tricky objective to go for. Wow, he recalled. Well, All right, Impulse gonna give it up. Ever since Kaz in Complexity, this was one of his true loves, the early dragon. So it looks like they go for it again. Kaz is still on those comms as the main voice here, and he will call for an early dragon. 
with the sub squad. TDK pick up three minute and 51 seconds there. And Impulse is trying to get this pushed down so they can get the lanes back matched up. Suspect uh, early movements by Rush actually in the right. lane swaps. Uh, he, he, is, he is a guy who took a long time to really get a handle on the lane swaps mm -hmm. and doesn't seem to be quite at home still. So lane swap against, or lane swap with that uh, Lee Sin. Ending up bottom yep. side and not making any move to stop drag or go for the, uh, or go to break the freeze means that Impact's going to be out of luck there on the Maokai. He has no options. Uh, Rush just returns to try and uh, Ooh. farm the jungle. A little bit of a, a dance game here. Adrian thinking he can route Seraph. But it looks like Apollo's already back. back they up. definitely had a bit of miscommunication there. Adrian had Apollo's a thing that said, I'm going here. And Apollo was like, okay, go ahead. <laughs> now, now he tries to help him out. A little bit of added personal pressure there. Can't really do much to Seraph. But the bodies help. Power in numbers. It's a bit of a stop on Bishu's roam as Rush has taken down Crab in the mid lane. Actually, just a little bit of ward placement. All right, mid lane, 33 to 28 here. Xiao Wei Xiao knowing that he doesn't really have to move or go anywhere, so no problem for him, just playing it calm. Missing CS, though. <laughs> I can't maybe say not, Maybe not so calm now. It's five minutes in. I'd have about 20 by now. So with uh, TDK deciding to reverse, Impact finally gets some minions for himself. Very yeah. happy after that. Malachi can easily heal and AoE clear the wave see what Rush can do. Try and make some early game impact. Hmm. Interesting. They take down top turret, don't rotate Apollo down. They're kind of just leaving Seraph there to farm without a turret. But like I said, Adrian is still on that roam, making sure they have all the vision here to start shutting down Kaz's jungle a little bit. Yeah, it's actually very pertinent information that Impulse just gave away. They cleared that pink ward with multiple people. They did not have to do that. Mm -hmm. Not only did Rush blow his Raptor buff with going over to that ward, which is already revealed, but he also revealed his place on the map, allowing Seraph to stay in the top lane yeah. as Mundo without a turret, early stages of the game, very vulnerable champion with no flash, no escape summoner. That's really true. Good point. And uh, Seraph will be very happy. He wants to get through these early stages of the game as quickly as possible on his Mundo. Build up his scaling items. He's probably wondering to himself, why do I have a free lane right now? He's like, <laughs> Grab his minions as quickly as possible. More <laughs> than happy to be farming these up. Catches up in CS. He was down to about eight previously with Apollo in his face. So good cleanup here by him. It's like a ping back. They think that Seraph may be doing some work on the Krugs. Just trying to keep tabs on everything right now. Kez, bottom control of the Scuttle Crab. We just saw a Rush grabbing the top one here as they start to clear out these wards. Not as many forward wards this game. No sight stone rushes from our supports or junglers here as we have in previous. So not as much movement into the jungle. Ooh. Kez definitely has all of the auto attack resets down on Nidalee. Very quickly clear the ward. Gonna get some lane experience as yep. well and try and hold it. Wait till Latman can return to lane. I just love that skin by the yeah, way. Yeah, it's so fantastic. Cool. I think we also may be getting a first blood here. Bishu goes very hard. He does not have the wards surrounding him just yet. He puts the Chaos Storm out and it's not going to be able to find the right Xiao Wei. Xiao, he goes down. Great first blood for Impulse. All right, Rush able to cash in yeah. on Lee Sin. Earn first blood for Xiao Wei Xiao on the LeBlanc. That can get into a painful matchup. If the LeBlanc gets an early lead like that, yep. it is, again, a bit of a bit of mind games around the laser placement, but... Oh, Rush! Flash is there. Kick is in. Distort! Double distort! Has to flash out as he uses the ultimate. Nicely done. And they thought they had some breathing room there, but instantly attacked again by Rush. <laughs> no breathing room. Never. Mid lane attack. Xiao Wei Xiao plus Rush. Just want to keep on fighting. No Q landed. Does not matter. Xiao Wei Xiao only has to end up burning his flash in the end. And this is, oh, LeBlanc. All right. Up to an early start. Good Bottom aggression. Lane, though. Headbutt back here. Looks like the exhaust does go down. One teleport coming out. That's going to be impact. Seraph's a little late. Both of these guys are going to stop each other's 
Nobody really wants it. It was just for the aggression. Luckily for TDK, uh, Seraph still able to farm decently. Wave pushed all the way up to his turret. But he is going to have to work to try and get some vision back. That lack of turret may become a problem if Rush decides to change his focus from mid lane. He's already gotten Shower Shao that LeBlanc lead that we talked about, you know, making it a difficult matchup for Victor. Having to play into a 2-0 assassin. Yeah. Pretty much any assassin is hard, but LeBlanc definitely. And they're making sure that they do not let Bishu have any of those wards either. Three in the hands of Shao Wei Shao along with his sweeper, two in the hands of Rush, making sure the wards are still money efficient, just not throwing too much into a side step. Six seconds onto Dragon, and with that pressure back down to the bot side of Apollo and Adrian, I think they have a better chance at this one. Oh yeah, already trying to make moves into the TDK jungle. Team Impulse should put that as a priority to get Vision down on the red side jungle. Then they can really punish that lack of turret. Yeah. As of right now though, Dragon coming back up. Let's see if that draws attention to the bottom side of the map. I don't think TDK uh, should risk trying to steal it uh, or go for a risky Dragon just because Xiaoi Xiao is so strong at the moment. Everything always happening over pink wards today. Real high commodity. So they're going to back off for now. Get a quick push on this top lane by Seraph. I don't know how long he'll be able to stay up there without a teleport seeing impact mid. Looks like they aren't going to get Dragon just yet. So all clean on that front. It looks like Impulse trying to push in a little bit more. You can see those forward pings from Adrian and the rest of the team saying, let's see if we can get in here a little deeper. Bottom turret should go down. Map opened up a little bit more here for Impulse and their 2-0 lead, along with 2K in the bank. Yeah, all going according to plan. Lee Sin, early game gank from Rush. Yeah. Get that lead. Now we transition to the Sivir. Pop the uh, Sivir ultimate. Oh, what a kick from Rush. It would have been completely on point in hitting Latman as well. Will they even have what they need to get out? He throws down the heal, but Kez's heal is not enough to keep Lucian alive and a very pre-planned pre kill coming up there. Two of them for Impulse. <laughs> Even if you know what to expect from Impulse, it's so hard to stop it. Yep. Lee Sin into Sivir, get another kill, turret down, see if they can get Dragon and defend mid at the same time. Yes, indeed, they can split resources. Mm -hmm. Minions uh, collected as well as the Dragon. Very nicely done. Impact with his turret still up. Gets a good push on the wave. They're gonna have to call Seraph back to be accountable for that every so often. They're getting what they want across the map here. Like you're saying, the first kills on Bishu and then on Kez. A little bit of a whoopsie to give that to Xiaowei Xiao. Now 3-0-0, and he's already starting to roam. Bottom lane, he got himself that third one. I don't know where he's gonna go next. Looks like he does have a back right now, spending 1,300 gold, so. Come back to lane even stronger. Ready to put down those kills. This is a Shaowei Shao we're used to seeing, except he doesn't have 300 CS just yet. <laughs> well, he does have a Soul Stealer, so... Uh, oh, man. <laughs> he's, he's got a feeling for how the rest of this game is going to go. <laughs> he did just buy a Soul Stealer, yeah, straight they, up. They do have Sivir on Infinity Edge, so a couple more Sivir ults to chase people down. All they have to do is take out the last outer turret here, and they've got a free field to work with. Adrian could actually just go for a turret dive since he's Alistar. A little too ahead of himself on that one. Silver, Sivir not in the area. Yeah, pings down towards the bottom lane still. You can see Adrian not afraid to keep cutting into that side of the jungle as well. They have more than one member there along with Rush for safety. And nothing can really be done about TDK. Yeah, they're pushed back, but their, <laughs> their short path is through their base. They can't even go through their own jungle right now. So how are you going to guard these turrets one after the other? You're not. Good pushes here. Impulse waiting for another wave, and they should be able to make this one go down. Xiao Wei Xiao on the rotate as well. Oh dear, oh. What, a, what a balls. Perfect skin for Team Impulse. The constant boxing bell ring. <laughs> They're ready to fight. Fight! Round two, round one, round three, round six. Did you go back to two and one? Nobody wants to fight. Is there an echo? There's. <laughs> That's what happens when you play Team Impulse. <laughs> round three, round one. What? That's not it. Remember this fight? 
So Sightstone finally finished up onto Adrian. No, this is allowing them to get them themselves more into the jungle, more into these advantageous yeah. fights. And another kill going over to Kaz. He can't even be on the map long enough to add pressure himself to get to any of these lanes. Right down the mid here for Impulse. This should be another downed turret. All three, top, then to bottom, and now to mid lane methodically for them. And they have not died in the process of getting all this roam on and having everybody keep going back and forth. Now that the lanes did swap back, Impact has been there for a while, cleaning up Seraph's push in. But we also haven't seen Seraph waiting, waiting for that teleport to always be up and trying to just get that lane back in to yeah. DK's favor. That's why I really don't like the smite teleport Mundo into Team yeah. Impulse. Mundo doesn't want to be seen till this stage in the game. He's just built his Cinder Hulk. Mm -hmm. He's still scaling up. He wants to buy some health after that to really take advantage. Uh, he's definitely banking on that late game. Get a ton of health, magnified by Cinder Hulk, get his Thorn Mail. Um, but I fear that it will be too little too late. This the the impulse game, the high tempo style is going all according to plan. See if uh, they can pick somebody off here, though. Three members stop to try and take down Impact. See, they still have forward wards on the bottom side of the map, but they've kind of let them trickle away here in the top. Could give them a chance to move members in here. Now Smoothie and Kaz to take down Impact. No answer yet, just from Impulse. They're still clearing wards around the map, but safe play from Impact does not let that gank in the top lane happen. And again, TDK are kind of left with nothing. They didn't really expend too much for that, but they're definitely not using their resources to get these waves pushed in the way that they want. Just soaking them up. Latman in the bottom, 137. 140 over on the side of Apollo, as Latman still looking to finish those core items. Yeah. Impulse, one of the teams best equipped to take out substitute squads, actually, <laughs> with their style of play, just to try and snowball a couple early kills. Cross map that. move here up to the top side. He's even got the Krug Smite bonus to get a big chunk out of the turret on his first hit. Rush, though, as usual, looking for kills instead. Wants to ambush somebody. No one from TDK takes the dangerous route through the jungle. And it will be uh, defense as usual. No, Janna's shield assisted turret. They might be able to hold on here. One, uh, one, one, three, though, from Impulse on the bottom side. Just trying to draw a fight in my head for TDK here. Not much of it does damage across <laughs> the board. You're going to get ulted out. That's the disengage. Lucian ulti is just, after that point, going to be walked around. Yeah. Like Victor has to get a perfect chaos storm here because you're not really looking at too much damage other than that. Yeah, not too much against TDK or the subs they're using. These guys had very, very short notice. They yeah, absolutely. They didn't even think uh, that they would be back this week. And they're trying to make do with the scenario. Four Whoa. members of Impulse, though. <laughs> he miss, misses both chains, but I still think they have enough damage to follow up on that one. He finishes it off with possibly a sigil or one of the last distortions he was still able to hit. They keep moving through. Wow, Latman taking a huge hit there, I believe, from the end of the laser. Xiaowei Xiao still moving up. The blue buff is on, so he can easily take somebody out if he gets that chain into chain. And the team's only going to want the turret. Good on them for not going too hard there. Team Impulse playing very methodical. Here's Xiaowei Xiao once again, though. Always trying to get in that last bit of damage. Last say in the fight. This dragon's up in five. That will be theirs. And third dragon of the game. I don't think TDK is actually going to get themselves in this spot too much more here. Impulse with a very nice lead. Knowing how to control it. That's another one of the hard things that comes out as well, is when you're on that sub squad, is not everybody's kind of reacting. The call's the same. You're not positioning the same before the calls happen, so. Yeah. It only makes it harder. Things start to kind this, of pound. This actually could be a very cathartic exercise Ooh. for Team Impulse. Yeah. Uh, to play, play a game by the books. Some solid uh, pickups here. Seven and zero. I do not see them uh, giving up a kill, unless it's Rush. <laughs> It would be Rush. He is going damage. Spot. He is going. Uh, oh, yeah, he did. See? Well. There's more damage. Hex Drinker <laughs> counts as a semi defensive item, so he's protected against the Bishu damage. At least he at least. thought about it. 
Nobody can really toy with Xiao Wei Xiao in the bot lane. This now spreads uh -oh. out to what Impulse used to do. They don't have Ignite, so it'll take a while. Oh, but of course. Jenna might be able to save Sarah. Well, this is the thing. Now you have Xiao Wei Xiao in the bot lane, as we were saying, whether he's on the Yasuo or the LeBlanc in the past. Nah! All right, all right. Come on. Ring the next bell, Rush. Got to get him down. <laughs> Adrian stopping Kaz from making. Oh, he serves him up on a dish. Kaz able to jump off the table real quick. Knows he shouldn't be there. And yeah, they get out of this one alive. So good kill. Focus on to Seraph. He is a pretty tanky guy. Wonder if what happens when that has the rest of TDK to kind of add in Not enough damage. I don't know if it'll be enough. Yeah. At least it'll be a long fight. <laughs> They'll have the chances. The windows are open. However, very close to being shut on their fingers as well. TDK's got to step carefully here. They're already losing resources. The blue's going down. Bottom lane's going to be a nice split, whether it's actually both Xiaowei, Xiao and Apollo here, it looks like. And TDK, a lot of things to do. A lot of things on their plate. It's going to be a multitasking extravaganza coming up for them. Oh, yeah. They're also, they also, their next opponent doesn't get any easier. They have to play TSM tomorrow. Yep. It'll be a <laughs> Maybe a rough one as well. Ooh. Yeah, maybe they should play Bard and Echo for yeah. maximum crowd enjoyment. Hell yeah, I like it. Let's see how TIP finish this one out. Could be a catch right here on the lap man that he is not expecting. Oh yes. And, that was and three, grand. two, Pages. one. Oh, it, oh, got him. Ding, ding, keep fighting, guys. Xiao yeah. Xiao always likes to fight. Well, Talisman of Ascension goes off. Actually, Rush gets hit. He gets marked. Kicks back. Kaz dodges the Howling Gale as well to keep himself moving around. Not crowd control whatsoever. Impact, they lose a man. Impact putting up the tree wall here. Here comes Apollo. Now on the hunt is delivered to the rest of the team. He can activate that oh. wherever he wants, and the team gets it as he approaches. Chaos Storm not able to follow enough targets. Bishu's found in the back line. Oh. Impulse is just getting everything they <laughs> want in these fights, and I swear I'm, somebody's wishing they had an Ignite on that uh, side, but they don't. Yeah, Rush. Rush doesn't care about a deathless game. He, he doesn't care about... Well, it's not a perfect game because CDK did get a dragon, but they haven't given right. any turrets or a any turret. kills. Well, that was a three and a half minute dragon, pretty much. And yeah. Tip also took top turret because of that, so they could get those lanes matched back up, make it harder and harder. But you are correct. They have not been able to get any more dragons on the side of TDK. Now looking at about an 8,000 gold lead and an ardent blaze to say, get off my lawn. All right, 12 pages back. currently for Xiao Wei Xiao. Yeah, 12 on that Mage Eyes. That man able to dodge the LeBlanc damage, but not the Lee Sin in his That's face. That's just one of those games where you flash in your own jungle thinking it's safe and you still see more opponents. All right, here we go. Impulse is just <laughs> everywhere. Oh, he kicked him back out yeah. of the hop. That yep. was a good, uh, right after the mark. Able to avoid some damage there. His Hex Trigger was popped as well, so when he goes back in on Victor, this is without Hex Trinker. You're thinking, oh yeah, it wasn't that risky of a play. He's got Hex Trinker. Flash. Does not. <laughs> Flashes out of the ultimate and then comes back in just because it's ingrained in him. Woo. You need that kill to carry. And Spears are not doing too much to him now. Kaz just tickling. Two. Two Eating looks a like a lot of skill shots there, Rush. Eating them though. Very aggressive push to this top lane with the shield still being on it, but I don't know if TDK really wants to stay there too much longer. Impulse actually gives them a little bit of breathing room. They are still respecting TDK a bit in these fights, knowing that they don't want to go down in a poor fight situation oh, or righteous glory pops. Erroneous engage. Seraph is at the point that he could stand on the front line for quite a while. Yeah. Rely on Janus Shields on the turret to uh, deflect <laughs> most of the damage. And TDK. He's had a rough game. Putting up the barriers. Just trying piecing, to hold on. Piecing together everything he can to try and be a tanky Mundo after that skirmish with Saber. Close to the Spirit Visage. Has his cowl. Adrian and the rest of the team making their way in. TDK almost has to start giving these things up if they don't just straight up take the fight. Okay. Kez smite. I think that was a purple smite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kez got it. Quick fingers. He has been accurate with Nidalee. So there's that. <laughs> so much to think about. They can never be in a safe spot here. 
Mike has taken a bit of damage there. We saw from Shawe Shao, who is on the other side of the map, who Tip is actually letting those lanes get pushed just a little bit. A good fight here from TDK. Could actually reposition them, yeah. not give them too much back in this game. They still got turrets to drop, which could play into a bit of global gold that they do require. It's going to be very hard to get past the fights that will get them that gold, though. Impulse is just way too ahead, and they're showing strength in each fight with no hesitation on engaging. These games just make me so curious what TDK will look like when they do get their main roster. Yeah. And since they've been spending so much time practicing with those guys, uh, are they even trying to pull off the same types of games with the sub squad? Or are they just letting everyone pick whatever champion right. they feel uh, they're most comfortable with in lane? I mean, that's got to be the most comfortable. You can't rack your brain trying to get an entirely new squad to do, you know, blue 42, run the strat, right? That's going to be a little yeah. bit difficult to do that throughout the game, especially in tight moments. Because I want to see a team really utilize Mundo and make it a huge threat. Mm -hmm. But I just, I have not for a long time. Uh, so I'm very interested to see if, you know, TDK, when they get their main squad, because Seraph will, of course, be staying on the roster. And when the uh, right. guy the team was built around, if they do stick with picks like this, yeah. uh, but just work around it. And what's the possibility better. of a team that works together well when you do get that four minute dragon on the board, when you do have a bit of a lead and control over the other person's jungle? It'd be a lot different once that's all been organized for the same five guys over a long period of time. Here, you're kind of just winging it, building the, fl building the plane while you're flying it. Mm, plane not in such good shape right now. <laughs> it's all right. Where's the instruction manual? <laughs> they can glide uh. for a long time, even if the engine shut off. So we got a bit here for TDK. 12.026 minutes on the clock. It's not going to be long, though. Looks like that airstrip is quite close here for Impulse to be landing on. Inherbiter's gonna go down. They don't even have second tier in the mid lane pushed down yet. So now once this super minion wave starts pulling people from oh. TDK down to the bottom, it's gonna be so much harder for anybody to clear that top side. Seraph saying, get this wave out of here. At least push it to the turret. We gotta get something out of this. Mm -mm. Luden's Echo LeBlanc wave clear. Oh, want to watch. Are you one of the guys that uh, throws away the instruction manual as soon as you open whatever you're trying to build? Only until I have to take it apart because I did something wrong. Huh. <laughs> I, and then I pull it out of the garbage. I enjoy just throwing it away and <laughs> trying to work it out. But you don't throw out the trash. You keep it there just in case you have to go <laughs> diving for it if you really get stumped. This is true. All right, well, let's see life, if it works around there. <laughs> well, Spears... Didn't actually tag Rush. You can see his health bar is still full, and he can just actually leave it up to Xiao Wei Xiao to defend on the other mm. side. Holy <laughs> oh. smoothies, HP smoothly going down there. Next up. Just one after the other. Sigil into Ethereal Chain. Sigil for you. Sigil for you. <laughs> Sigil for you. Everyone, a try by Lapman to get close enough. I think he got headbutted over by Adrian, put in a real bad spot, cooked up, and served to the rest of Impulse here. We'll see how this he, Mundo does. He Xiaowei Xiao going real hard. Seraph's gonna wait for the Ignite to wear off and then use what he can to get back up here. It throws on the ultimate, but it's gonna be a lockdown to Xiaowei Xiao take him from one million to zero. No, he does not. He actually goes for Kaz. He says, just kidding. I want your Nidalee. And now they've kind of not had enough focus to continue the fight. Impact knows that they still want the Mundo. They take him down. He's not going anywhere he pleases. 15 to 0. 20 minutes in. Only one outer turret stands here for TDK. And I don't even think Impulse is going to have to take that down to get to the Nexus. That'll do it here. And uh, Inhibitor Turret going to go down very easy. Uh, easily. Yeah. See if they can finish off uh, the Nexus afterwards. Seven seconds on Bishu. That might be enough to dissuade Impulse. And it is. We should back up. Gonna have to wait for round two from Impulse. Two inhibitors down, Baron buff. Should be the final march. Oh boy. Everybody, everybody's mid lane clear and sideways are crashing in right now for TDK. It's Seraph. Seraph and Bishu, no worries. They're back to clean it. But you can see there. flash oh, over. Boop. Blatman in the pit. That's not exactly what he wanted. Ding ding. Rushes on the hunt. <laughs> Continue fight. 
Hey, yeah, let's fall rest. Where's it going? <laughs> and it's not even he dodged one. Not even that chaos or chaotic. Impulse going exactly where they want. They stopped that pressure towards the Raptors immediately. Started heading to the top side, knowing that this would pay off much more. There's Apollo and Impact. Silver Alt plus Righteous Glory. Ravi. That just tickles now. Oh! Whoa! The he hit the chain. And another chain. <laughs> Another chain. And another. What a play so, from Shao Wei Shao. Uh, yeah, I, I blinked. That's definitely going to be the game. The skill shot. Ooh. Uh, never mind. It doesn't matter. See you later, <laughs> Bishu. He goes down. 40 seconds for the death timers now on the clock. That is also going to be Latman getting hit up. Shao Wei Shao just gigantic this game. And you have to actually be kidding me. If he does not get another kill, Shao Wei Shao will have the exact same score that he got against Cloud9 last week. 8-0-5 LeBlanc to win the game. 20 stacks this time around. 20 as well. stacks as well. Shao Wei Shao repeating history. Wow. Very nicely done. Guess that just fits the uh, the bill for him. Yeah, they're happy with the with the execution there. Very happy indeed. Xiao Wei Xiao can now go to his true love and take a nap. <laughs> Always hear him in the mic checks. I kind of just want to sleep. Just want to sleep. Well, you put your opponents to sleep, and you can do that faster yourself. What a game here. One of the final weeks, hopefully, the TDK does have to use the sub squad. It's We're not expecting much out of them. But hopefully they are still able to grow in their scrims, able to grow with the original and main five that they want to bring to the LCS stage. Yeah, it uh, kind of reminds me of this really early game uh, days of League of Legends before even season one, when if you get to the top of the MMR, yeah. then there are only a couple of pre-maids actually playing. You know, Gigi's pre-maid of Koreans was the number one. And if you got in that game, there was like, very little hope. So everybody just picked a single champion for themselves to try and feel good about themselves and perform well on individually. Yeah. Just try and have a strong individual performance. Right. Feels like it's trending that way for D TDK now. Yeah. They just want to, the subs just want to have, pick their favorite champion and try and, you know, make one play to, uh, to have an uh, impact here on the stage. Right. Make a showing for themselves. Well, as much as we see and hope that you know TDK is going to rise with this new roster and be able to put up wins. You can see how much it still affects the team there. The coach with Seraph, you know, the condolences of the match, and it was not easy. They Ooh, did no, crap that was, that was They rough. were pushed in everywhere. Okay. Everything they tried didn't work. So you go to make calls, the calls don't work. You kind of reflect on that, and you don't want to make too many more calls. P Apollo with the smile on his face. Gravity versus Counter Logic Gaming. Last week, all eyes were on CLG to see if they could take down Team Solo Mid. But the question this week is, can CLG shake off the TSM loss? Yeah. In that game, CLG did show just how well that they've been able to integrate Pobelter into their new squad. Yep. Not only is he playing really well with the team, but he's been playing very well as an individual as ever. Uh, as usual. <clears throat> One of the main issues, though, that we were looking at from that game versus TSM was Smithy. You know, he picked Lee Sin. He did not have the same sort of effect that Rush does when he picks the champion. He wasn't able to make early game plays. So I'm very curious to see how he fares against Move, who is an outstanding member for Team Gravity in their week two. And Move did it all with Jarvan. You know, he was able to control yeah. vision across the map, and he was able to spoon feed solo <laughs> kills to his, uh, to his carries. So right. Meanwhile, Gravity have made a dramatic improvement from week one and are now riding a three-game winning streak. Yeah, they looked a lot stronger in week two, as we've said so many times. Not only was the individual play better, but the shot calling. You know, Bunny Fufu, -Fu, he's really taking his new role seriously, and the team is yeah. looking great. Uh, so we have to remember, though, it's only been a couple games. Uh, they've got a lot of work ahead of them to prove that they can uh, consistently perform at the top of the North American LCS. Yeah, see if they can. Hauntzer is more measured on his team strength and says they've got a real battle ahead of them. We've actually been like screaming them the past week and it's really hard to try to find a counter because every game they just like get such a huge advantage early game. But usually we just try to have to react to their plays and hopefully it doesn't end too bad for us. 
a little unnerving. Say, hopefully we have to react to the plays and they don't get the better of us. You should be the one making the plays and making them react. We'll see if they can get that on the board. Let's check out the starting lineups. On the blue side, it's going to be Gravity. Haunter in the top lane. Move in the jungle. Keen in mid. All tech at 80 carry and the foofooest of bunnies at support. And on the red side, it's Counter Logic Gaming. Up top, Zion Spartan in the jungle. Smithy mid Pobelter. 80 carry double lift and support Afro move. There's still definitely a lot of CLG believers in the crowd, that's for sure. I wonder when the Gravity fans are going to start being the ones with the chance coming out, because these guys have put their foot down this year. A team that we kind of saw, you know, in murky waters at the start of last split and the spring split, but they have actually, with two changes on the team, shown better than any team has out of the gate with changes. Usually yeah. it takes a team to time to get going. This is a very important game. Both these teams are three and one right now, yeah. and it's going to do a lot to prove, you know, just how good our gravity, you know, was it just a, a fluke last week? Uh, yeah. Or will they be able to perform against some very strong opponents? CLG, even though they lost to TSM, they've started this split really, yep. really strong. Uh, been able to u utilize all of the new members and old members, as well as integrate uh, the coaching staff changes that they've made. Absolutely. All been uh, fairly positive improvements for the team. So There actually haven't been, I mean, besides Reginald and a few others along the way, players that have stepped down to kind of have a coaching role that really worked out for them. They brought on Bjergsen, that really worked out. Comps has seemed to step back in this role, still offering what the idea of Team Gravity was about, and everybody's still holding on to that. He's been doing a fantastic job, and even Altex says he's offered so much to the team and really made Altex position and kind of growing with the team that much easier. Yeah, cop, uh, Coach Cop takes the friend first approach. He's not one to crack the whip with the guys. <laughs> More to bond and uh, discuss the game as a fellow player. Yeah, that always helps as well when you kind of have a guy that can relate. A lot of teams are trying different things. You know, life coaches coming in or different coaches in general. Somebody that's had a professional background in a different sport that kind of relates into mind games or being able to figure out strategies that sometimes relate to league. We've seen that across the board in Europe as well. Every team trying to level up as soon as coaches were available and things on stage. It was a different area that teams had touched, so that's still an area that they need to level up a lot in. As we get this game underway, just waiting for, I believe, Big Smithy to get logged into the client. Just had a quick issue, and we're going to get this one between CLG and Gravity underway. Like you said, Kobe, three and one on both sides, and both teams really <laughs> looking to break. The fly's undone! Smithy! No! <laughs> You're on camera, bud. Ah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a bro, see, I'll tell you if there's something in your beard, Rib. Nothing in your you're, teeth, you're, you're good. Clean. You're good. We're all right on that one. It's good. Make a lady does a they great job. Pause. <laughs> Smithy can blame that one. Grr. So I swear it was a champion select issue. <laughs> yeah. But we are going to be heading into that right now. It seems like everyone's all zipped up and ready to go. <laughs> all right. Zipped up, strapped in, ready to go. Let's Keep see here. LeBlanc right off the bat. And arms bat. inside the ride. <laughs> Let's go. Picks and bands now underway. LeBlanc will be hit up here. It looks like Ergot will be the first one in the mind of Counter Logic Gaming. Let's see where they go from here in Picks and Bands. If Pole Belter gets a good amount of focus or what Keen can bring to the table this time, he has been just throwing out the die and seeing what it rolls to so far for his matchups. Not Ergot, not. Uh, Twisted Fate. Nope. So far. So or keen targeted. Or fizz. All mid lane bans so far this time point. around. We have a lot of focus point. there, but no Cassiopeia on the table yet, mm -hmm. and neither of the melee carries like Fizz um, or Echo on the table either quite yet. Rise also is a possibility for the mid lane, although very popular in the top lane. Rek'Sai. So, do you give away the Gragas first pick to gravity and try and grab uh, something like a Rise uh, or Echo on the backswing? Mm -hmm. Or do they ban out the Gragas and, oh, never mind. Alistar is first on the table. Such a high priority from the support role for this <laughs> champion, pretty much across the world, actually. Yeah. And I think we see that Rise is just going to stay on the ban list. As much as it kind of goes to the, the last one, it, it will be banned. That Alistar, however, has been proving very good for teams. Initiation field. We saw Adrian using it very well for Impulse last game. Yeah, I think that is a good move for Gravity. A move has already shown that he can perform on champions outside 
of the power picks. So even if CLG do decide to take away Gragas, uh, which Smithy has actually not played that much of, won't be too much of an issue for them to work around. Bard was left up. It's kind of been the cheer going towards Alfremu, knowing that he is pretty good at it. But Lustboy has been the play at first pick. Aha. Echo here. The and crowd doesn't Rattles. know if they're cheering or booing because uh, last minute switch to Echo here. Ah, ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh. No Bard or Gur. <laughs> mm, Echo, yay! <laughs> All right, well, I love it. So much emotion. It's an emotional ride through Champion Select today with each pick. And man, Sivir going over to the side of Altax. More safe play been used quite a bit, if not banned. Rumble for Haunts are in the top lane. That one goes through. Take away the Silver Cop from the, CLG. Nice yeah. move. <laughs> Rumble locked in. The traditional carry from the top lane here for Hauntzer. Kalista is still up as well here, so. Something Doublelift wants to put in his hand. We've seen this so many times, though. The uh, uh, Kalista taken into Silver and not able to use it uh, early on to actually take over the lane or earn much of an advantage. Mm -hmm. And then when you transition into the mid game of Sivir boosting up the gravity team with a rumble ultimate at, uh, yeah. at the forefront of things. Good luck, Kalista. It's like a good mid game there from gravity. Oh, what could he want? Does he have Thresh open if you want to play something like Jinx, Bard Ash. How about none of the above that were just questioned? And Callista will go all the way through this game. I think one of the first ones not picked or banned. And we are going to get Ash Bart for CLG. Holy initiation from the bottom lane there. That is some <laughs> long range initiation coming out of the CLG bottom lane. A lot of uh, potential for picks here so far from CLG. And with Smithy moving around pretty quick uh, in the early game on Gragas. Excited to see what they are able to do with it. This is, I'm really excited to see these ultimates. An Ash Arrow and a Tempered Fate. And you're like, how do you close That's, that gap, you journey? Well, <laughs> an Ash Arrow into Tempered Fate sounds like a, a missed opportunity. Well, I'm saying if you're if you're too far away, you're yeah. spiking a guy down the lane. You got to have enough time to catch That's him. That's some hard coordination to pull off. You need to be very accurate yeah. to combo some Well, that's what I'm players. saying. You know, yeah. bring out the super dupers. I'm not just talking about any old play. See Hecarim and Jarvan being hovered over here, and they will be locked in. Looks like they will be right on the front line as well. Move goes back to that. Jarvan's going to lock somebody down in the cooker, along with the horse running right through whenever they want to. So pretty <laughs> dangerous looking Rumble composition. Yeah. You, were, you were wondering what he's going to have. Uh, it was. It's going to be different twist. again. Now, this is not the most outrageous thing. We've seen mid-rumble before. Um, See how he does against Echo. Definitely does have a strong matchup versus a lot of melees, but Echo is extremely mobile and able to use uh, his t time winder uh, for very efficient harass as well as wave clear. Mm -hmm. So very excited to see who gets the early oh, advantage in this mid lane because it's, it's easily tipped by jungler intervention. Mm. Not even going to be the mid lane Echo. I like it. We're getting to see an Echo in every lane as well here in the NALCS. It was brought about for each lane in the EU. Cooney was able to do that in the top lane. Come up with a victory as well. It's been hard for Echo players to find that win. Just has not seen that the coordination is there for the late game pan out in the fight. <laughs> so the old switcheroo, Gravity thought they had the uh, mid lane mind games down <laughs> with Rumble being swapped into mid lane. But CLG get the last laugh because they are red side. And pull that swap over to Lulu, who should be able to abuse that range. Rumble uh, should not be able to get into Flame Spitter range for the harass on the Poe Belter. We'll see how he's able to control Keen with the Glitter Lance, though. Look at this guy, five different champions from week one to week three here. Keen feels he's not giving anything up if he doesn't play anything again, keeping everybody on their toes, and he's been able to do very well with it. Malphite, TF, and Urgot were his wins with that Fizz being the loss, so not too much really that other he can do, but keep playing new champions. The teams have locked in their champs now, so who do you think has got the edge in this one? Tweet hashtag GVWin or hashtag CLGWin to at LOL Esports here for our final game of the day. Who do you think has the better composition there? As you see on your screen, we're about to find out who can play it better in game as we're almost on the rip. Counter Logic Gaming 3-1, Gravity 3-1.
and we are going to be on the rift. CLG chant coming out. I think if you do the GV chant, you could go GRV. Well, they're turning it into gravity. But you can do that as well. You don't even need the tricode. Gravity definitely has fan base. CLG as well. Hopefully get no scuffles in the crowd. We'll have enough in game. <laughs> Passionate fans. Spell Thieves come in for Afro Moo. Coin start for Bunny Foo Foo. Uh, supports. Looks like the five-man invade coming through along with Abel being able to clear the ward. And safely on the other side, Gravity does so. But I don't believe... I think that was their only ward as long as CLG doesn't walk out of Tribush here. They get out nicely. Nope, but they're gonna. So they get seen out the bottom side. All right, lane swap boards down for both teams. Nothing special here, <laughs> except for Zion. <laughs> I thought I saw him, but I didn't. I'm interested to see how he uses the top. Like I said, it's been changing back and forth. He actually goes for the ring start on the potion, so even more damage coming from that early echo. We usually get enough with the consumables altogether. Well, let's take a look here, because CLG are trying to call the lane swap, but right. they're about to cross into the ward where that uh, territory where that ward will see them. And an instant recall from gravity as they are alerted to the presence of Ash. Don't want to have to run Sivir into that. You know, Ash unaffected by the spell shield if she can just charge up her Q and activate. Yeah. Win trades that way. They will be a little bit delayed running to the lane swap, though. So this means that Gravity will not be able to freeze it, plus they'll lose out on some minions. Uh, and they will be behind in the push wars because COG also not freezing it since they weren't yep. there on time. Both teams will be pushing early into the right. turrets. And we'll see if anyone's able to sneak in the defenses before the dive becomes too much of a threat. Also see if Move wants to go for anything of an early dragon. Grabbing over Smithy's red. Coming back for blue. Oh, Afro Moo on his way in here. A, a meat charged up. No. Oh, yeah. Oh. Cosmic binding against the wall there. Very nicely done to harass both Haunter and Move. Let's see how much farther he can follow here. He might just push him right off. Yep. Yeah. Uh, to the other side of the jungle. Now, that's a scary thing to do. Afro Moo is the guy who stole blue buff with a Thresh auto. <laughs> so, they were able to get it, though, without Smite. Team Liquid remembers. That recall from Zion as well. He just teleported down into the bottom lane. So currently, CLG, three lanes of experience income, and they're trying to send Smithy to head off anyone thinking of getting into experience range of the top lane. So CLG right now, mm -hmm. uh, with a little bit of an early advantage as far as the experience across the map game. Right. Here come the reinforcements from Gravity, but CLG are already prepared. Do they have enough to zone them off the turret with three members? It doesn't look like it. It's a decent amount of minions already died to the turret, though. So Gravity a bit late. Oh, they are going to teleport just to get behind enemy line Ooh. and make sure they don't lose out on the experience. Ooh, Missed Cosmic Binding there. move could have been in big trouble had he been caught just outside turret aggro range. Yeah. And actually, there is a push up here. I was going to say Keen's kind of stuck in the mid lane because he cannot do much against Pobalter, but he makes the Scrap Shield run up. Already overheating, unfortunately. Pretty much used everything to get there. The team may be able to think about it now. Bunny Fufu -Fu flash pulverize in a Glitter Lance across the entire team. Xmithy's in the fire. Move going in for one last hit. The Ignite's on, but the heal is still there for Xmithy with his passive. They're able to pick up first blood onto Move. Gravity went way too deep on this fight. One last hit. The double kill for Afro Moo. Holy, that is going to be control of mid and top as well for CLG so many times. We see these early lane swaps turn into three kills for a single team, and the game just snowballing out of control from there. Luckily for Gravity, two of the kills went on to Afro Moo, and only one kill went on to a carry, which is a support carry in Poe Belter. But man, that is such a huge early swing for CLG with that chase through the jungle. 
Well, they thought they had him outnumbered for some reason because they were not accounting for Poe Belzer. His, uh, yes, albeit slower, rotation up from the mid lane, but he's going to come eventually. And they overchase. Great job there by CLG yeah. capitalizing. Taking home the early lead. Well, we said at the beginning of this game, we questioned if CLG could kind of shake off All right. that TSM game. Go back to their natural roaming mode, and yes, they can. So CLG, they have to be on the run because Keen came up with the early roam, but because Move was chunked out so early in this, he doesn't even want part of this fight. And Bunny Poop still decides goes. to flash in for it, gets the knockup. They don't really commit until it's a little bit too late. Oh. And the heal plus immediate chugging of the potion on Smithy and the Gragas passive yeah. all combine for enough healing so Ooh. that Gragas does not go down for the first blood. All of those health regen together and the slight moment of indecisiveness nice from play. gravity cost them. They had the advantage there with the quick roam, but uh, move getting chunked out as well as the uh, non-committal. Able to turn this into a huge lead for CLG early on in this game. That's exactly what they needed. Turret about to go down, double lift and half for a Moo. Rush hour coming up big with the rest of the team there in the beginning. Poe Belter's late roam there. CLG still able to assess the fight and do very well. 44 to 36. You see a little bit of an edge Poe Belter gained in CS in that lane, as well as getting his chalice and an ability tome. Make himself a little bit stronger. Aphromu going to continue the roam. Why not keep that pressure up? Like I said just before the replay, kind of will CLG be able to shake off what happened from TSM? It's kind of the downfall after that happened. Right now, it looks like it has not phased them too much, and the phase died for Zion Spartan just out of range. Should be able to shove the wave very quickly, though, on Echo. Timewinder, such a good spell. Man, Love and it. that... Discrepancy between Hecarim and Echo is insane because of not only because of that you know triple kill up top, but the entire time Zion had a solo lane. Hanser actually hasn't gotten a solo lane because of all the swaps. So not only is it this giant gold lead that you're seeing, yeah, but that's a level seven Echo to level four Hecarim. If CLG aren't able to utilize this. <laughs> to win in the mid game, yep. then uh, they definitely have well, some issues to work out. The focus as they head back to lanes as well, gonna help Connor Logic Gaming as pan out duos to the bottom lane here. The aggression to Dragon will definitely be CLGs with their lead if they wanna prep that fight. Already out for making sure there's enough wards around that position. We'll see how this Zion Spartan Haunter matchup goes as they're finally meeting up. Poe Belter getting what he wants out of Keen in mid. That's not getting attacked by Keen or getting any pressure from move. Those guys are really trying to recuperate right now. Yeah, all of gravity uh, in emergency mode yeah. right now because CLG, not only do they have the huge lead, but they have an easy vision advantage uh, with a whole bunch of deep boards up on the top side as well as constant hawk shots uh, coming from double lift. So there's pretty much no space for move to make a surprise play. Oh. And Gravity need to make some outplays individually. There's a flash. You're looking at supports being level five. This is why CLG is going so hard. You would not have Bunny Fufu's ultimate here to throw the fight off. X Smithy's trying to come down to make sure no pressure for move could have happened to the counter engage. So you can see how much double lift and apple. Oh. Want to keep the pressure going. Zion Spartan just toying with Hauntzer right now. If he can get him within that shot, he's got to be very oh, careful. Back. The ultimate almost in range for the Kono break, but I don't feel like he thinks he could have taken the fight. Hots are just beating up the level 7 Echo here, uh, using minions to his advantage as well. It's, it's a very in and out. Staying against somebody who could just continuously throw out damage kind of hurts. Zion Spartan figured that out. Credit where credit is due there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Everyone's... Worried for Ruh -ruh. the safety of Zion. He's still got Chrono yeah. Break up as long as he doesn't going put that for in that spot. Throws out the parallel convergence. He's going to miss move on that one. It didn't actually tag him. I like move's choice. Even though the spells were missed, they did not have the upper hand. They don't have the knowledge on the roam. They do have the abilities to get out. However, one of them has to be an ultimate. So you can just see with Xmithy's pressure, 
Gravity can't even take a fight they wanted, and yeah. we're setting up. Especially with Flash, I really thought Smithy was going to go for a big play there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, no Flash, no ultimate coming out of Gragas, so they just chased them off instead. Move was so low, I, that was a definite opportunity for CLG. And they're showing uh, to be a little bit, or Smithy at least, to be a little bit risk oh. adverse since they do have such a big lead. So unfortunate they can't punish any of this. They can only ward it. They even have the Wisp in the jungle as well to know if Move starts to come in. I believe Nick Smithy just grabbed that. Didn't see it chasing him around. So. CLG getting everything they want. Pressuring perfectly. Now to Keen in the mid lane. It's going to be the big one. No. He actually holds the ultimate. Very interesting. Oh, he gets the save. Wild growth from Pobelter. Moves in a very bad spot. Going to get some cosmic damage now coming in from Aphromu, who does not want to pick up a third kill for himself. Very nicely gives that one over to Pobelter. Aphromu would love to be fed, but he wants to get these carries fed even more. Oh, yeah. Uh, Gravity just so far behind at this point that even when they get a good opportunity like that, woo! Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, they're not done. Oh, boy. Time winders out. There's the tempered fate. I think Aphromoo just sealed his fate, however. Oh! But it's magical. Hey, it's magic. I actually want to see a replay of the beginning of that fight, because I feel like the, uh, Smithy's barrel went out in the wrong direction towards his own uh, ah. team. But uh, he was saved by Pope Belter, I think. Uh-oh. All right, here's the some cavalry. Double lift. All right, double lift. Oh! Hot damn! Double lift gets away from Bunny <laughs> Fufu here. That was definitely their call. He is out of mana, but he's still going to get the slow. You don't need it anymore. Altec turns this one around. No on the hunt. Oh, and, oh the boomerang splits the uprights. <laughs> They're not coming up with anything on this. Move is there, but that's just so they can get out safely. He's saying, I got your guard. Let's get out of this one. <laughs> some, uh, some good comedy plays in this game as well. All right, let's see what happened here. Smithy, well, he didn't go for the play up top. He did go for this one, but man, burning down here. Poe Belter's huh. just waiting for it. He did. He threw his <laughs> ultimate backwards. I knew it. <laughs> Smithy saved by Poe Belter, though, in the mid lane. He tried Poe Belter's going to get the kill off of it as well. Zion comes in. Doesn't matter about the lead. Zion hasn't been able to do much with this lead on Echo. Uh, maybe like Dominant, he hasn't put had time to put in too much too many games. Yeah, Echo, those right. 10 games. <laughs> Ooh, out of sight. See, there it is. Tempered fade him. Oh, no, they're not going to have to this time. <laughs> I was going to say, that's the follow-up. That's what I was looking for. But they have enough distance on the arrow to close. Or short enough, I should say. Plays from CLG. 4K ahead now. And they've only dropped one turret. So it's getting pretty bloody. Let's see if they can start grabbing a little bit more. Doesn't look good for Zion Spartan. Does, he does stay in parallel convergence for the shields. Only going to last a oh. little bit. But now he's used phase dive. Uses to get back over the wall. This should be Keen with the ultimate to lock him down. And they won't even need it. Move's going to get his hand in on this one as well. You can only do so much. Providing a distraction works as well. CLG picks up Dragon. Gravity on the board. They get one kill, but they lose Dragon for it. Yeah. And uh, Zion does go down. That is some, you know, comeback experience. Now, Ponser actually yeah. up to level eight, so that is very good news for Gravity. Even levels down, we saw him doing some damage to Zion Spartan. So Hecarim still being Hecarim. See if they can get into these five v five fights anytime soon. That's what Gravity's team looks like they've wanted to do from the get go with this composition, especially with Key bringing Rumble in the mid lane. So much damage. Always liking to play the different things to throw his opponents off. So far, CLG has figured it out. The early game of being able to roam on Gravity's roam. The roam up from Poe Belter and the rest of the team. Getting those first three kills in the top lane turret. <laughs> what is and now it seems like they are just watching each other clear awards. Taking some Polaroids for the family. Making it work. Here is the close in. And just across the wall. Ah, people have learned not to follow Bard through the magical journey <laughs> and get hit with a double cosmic binding. Aphrim has uh, been displaying the strengths so far. Yeah. We just really saw the funny. Bard gank. Jungler assisted Bard long gank in the bottom lane. Woo! Just a missed the flight on that one. <laughs> close indeed. I do want to see if Afro and Double If have the timing to pull off a tempered fate uh, catch into an Ash Arrow catch. Yeah. A long range Ash Arrow, because that Shablam. would be a uh, replay worthy combo. Definitely hard to pull off the timing, though, no matter how long you've played with another person.
Hey, there were the guys that pull off the Callista Blitz, so mm -hmm. they can do it, I believe. A quick hawk shot, about 20 feet in front. Even though it's global, why not? <laughs> well, look at all the Bacon. deep wards, though. COG has Bacon. so much map control, they've got deep wards everywhere, yeah. so he can use it just to uh, check the brush in his lane, make sure he's safe. Yeah, let's do a little zigzag cross-gravity territory that's speaking of all lift. under CLG surveillance. Speaking of lift, lift, Bloodthirst, her first item on his, his Ash, coming <laughs> to this one. So I'm doing it on stream, actually, and uh, he won the game handily, <laughs> so. Good prerequisite. So do it great. again. I love it. <laughs> I don't need crit. It works, as too, and you got all these guys that just want to stick on you, so you can just kite him away and heal up while doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, she doesn't have a dash to dash away, so just stand and fight. She said she has so much power when activating her Q, the attack speed and damage that she gets, insane lifesteal just standing there. So double lift is yeah. going with the stand and fight build. No Straight running. Down the mid lane goes the Hawk shot, and CLG follows just enough to take the turret down with it. Zion Spartan has still been in this top lane, 120 to 97. Making sure he can get a little bit of vision with parallel convergence. He doesn't see anything. And he feels good to go. He hasn't actually pushed his ward line up, though. But right now, he's just trying to be a nuisance for gravity. And he's doing just that. The rest of the team starts to close in. Aphromu is going to have Bunny Fufu on a bit of a roam. Also, Smithy is just on the back of Aphromu. He's got a tail. Zion Spartan could hit that. Oh, oh. <laughs> every time. I just want to like, press want R for people. Mm, so I talked about so close. star echo plays that I'm looking for for people to jump right. on. Here's another one. I want to see somebody, while they're kiting like that, be able to uh, pop a W over their shoulder right to where their ultimate is going to uh. line up in four seconds and account for the one second discrepancy <laughs> between uh, the parallel convergence and the ultimate. The chrono convergence. Yeah, so combine your chrono break with your parallel convergence into a single hand, single champion wombo combo. I don't know. All right. It seems Pope pretty out there easy, CSing on easy Lulu. to say. Easy on paper. We'll see if they can get that one to down, go down. <clears throat> so double lift to go. Push mid lane now with the rest of the team. Easy for Paul Balter to stay in the bottom lane and Whimsy away if he gets into any trouble. Right now, CLG with everything in their favor. And Zion Spartan about to clear a very nice big wave in the top side. So just hold it on tight until they get everything they want. Pretty much waiting for Gravity to take one of these fights and make an error out of it. Yeah, 6,000 gold lead. Uh, all you really have to do is set up that vision mm -hmm. so that they can prepare for that next dragon. Uh, when they go set up the vision, they should use the buddy system here. Bard definitely excels uh, in kiting people around. So if CLG just have people in the vicinity, Afro should be able to buy time for the team to join the party. Especially with the added defenses of a mid lane Lulu. We're able to buff anyone up who does get caught by this Sivir. Yeah, we saw that happen to Smithy just a little bit ago. Able to be saved. So confused, he threw his barrel the wrong way. <laughs> I want to go that way. Maybe he thought he could eject himself out of the fight somehow. Who knows? We do. He didn't. He's just showing us he still knows how to throw those alts. Five to one now. 19 minutes in here for Counter Logic Gaming. Playing it very strong. Not allowing anything to pretty much stop them. We talked about Move being an early jungler. Trying to put things on the plate for his team. And now that he's kind of been abruptly stopped, it seems like that kind of path of thinking goes away from him. He has trouble coming back it's, in now. It is hard. Okay, well, let's get caught here. It is really, really hard. All right. I'll wait, wait for another fight to go off. <laughs> Down on the chase. He should be good. One more Q, one more Q. He should be in range. Actually, he flashes for it. Yeah, he's he, that passive lockdown. He had that slow. So it's hard for move. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's hard for a, a jungler in general. Right, yeah. If you're working with a lane swap deficit of a triple kill and right. a tower at, what was that, like maybe six, seven minutes in? Yeah, real early. Really, really early. And it is super hard to make calls and make moves as a jungler from from that early of a deficit, it's very, very difficult. So. And he still tried to. He almost got him back himself back in with an Xmithy kill. That was literally saved at about 80 HP of a wild growth. So the calls he has been making 
are actually just in favor of CLG because they're in the right spot. A very unfortunate turn of events so far for those early engages. Right in the face of Hanser. Hits him right in the horse tail. <laughs> Aphromoo does the work. <laughs> of course he does. Oh, good pop by Pobelter, uses help pick, so the Glitter Lance actually goes through. Bunny Fufu coming through strong here, throws down the flash. Pulverize, double lift and Aphromoo both go up. Teleport's now coming in. And it looks like Zion Spartan's not gonna be able to deliver too much other than the Time Winder. No, he goes for Phase Dive right on the Parallel Convergence. Xmithy's there as well, figuring out what he wants to do, more or less just being a tank, so the rest of the team of Gravity cannot get back in. Keen's gonna go down here because Keith putting himself in the fight, but they're doing it for Move. They're doing it for Alltech. Can they clean up the fight now? Alltech not going back in. A few hits could have definitely been played there. Hanser with the TP into the fight now. He got back from 20 seconds of being dead. This is a 25 to 30 second fight now that's still continuing. And Zion Spartan's gonna be the only one alive for CLG with Hanser and Alltech on the other yeah, side. Yeah, a fight that Gravity end up winning yeah. in the end. Yeah, they did lose the turret in the process, but they got four kills being down this much. That's a tremendous achievement for Team Gravity. What a ridiculous uh, series of events that was. Double lift tank the turret. He must have tanked about four or five turret shots there. Even with the Bloodthirster first build into uh, Lulu here, that is a lot of shots for it. One for the AD carry to take. Okay, so only, oh no, he's still, yeah. So so that was only three, three initially. Then on the second dive, he tanks a bunch more. All right, so Keen, uh, not able to get the best rumble ultimate there, but here's a reinitiation. Teleport start coming in, Temper Fate, going to be a whiff. And Zion goes on the warpath. On to Bunny Fufu with his alt just on, but it wears off. Yeah, comes out. Here goes Move, comes in with a double jump kill. Gets a double hop. Afro Moo and uh, Pobelter get cleaned up. Keen gets him low. Move jumps in. One, two, and sets the stage for Hotster's arrival. Ooh. Like Alltech could have done a good amount of damage there as well in the fight. We're right back into it, Kobe. Hanser has the ult back up. We just saw him do this into the fight. Aphromoo's <laughs> gonna get caught. He gets wild growth. That's the journey that's up, but he's not allowed to take it with everybody right there on his tail. More, more so, he didn't want to take it. Goes down 30 seconds on the clock, and now Gravity have a bit of room to breathe. They don't really have waves to do anything with, though. Yeah, they're down 7,000 plus gold yeah. still. Yeah. But they're making picks. Five-man roam, get somebody out. One more kill for Gravity. They're so still making moves. To do. Fight, fight, fight. As long as they can get in range. They got that Sivir ultimate, so it shouldn't be that hard each time they want to. CLG still with four turrets. Once Gravity can start breaking that outer ring, they can safely get some more wards up. You can see only one was placed, and that's only because they were fighting in CLG's jungle. Still don't feel safe enough to start moving their line itself forward. To the top lane, Zion Spartan looking pretty juicy to the team, but it looks like they're actually pinging themselves off here. They do not want that. Also, with the way that Ash's passive uh, was reworked, I actually like the Phantom Dancer early uh, instead yep. of rushing into Infinity Edge because uh, it smooths out the curve for her. And since Phantom Dancer was buffed with five crit ta being taken from Infinity Edge and just added straight to Phantom Dancer, Oh, for Ash only, this is a viable uh, build right. path. She has seen a bit of play. Kind of fell to the wayside. Sneaky and a few other AD carriers playing her in week one. And we saw back to a lot of the Callista priority. Still works here in the composition CLG wants to bring to the table. Aphromoo finally getting that barred play, and it seems like Ash is what they want to synergize with. Banner of Command finished up for Aphromoo here, so he start promoting minions in the side lanes. We'll keep an eye on where that goes if he starts to use it. And that'll give CLG a few more options here so they don't have to just face a 5v5 fight against Gravity because that composition is still pretty damn scary. All right, looks like uh, we may have a collapse here. Silver Ultimate popped. On, sir. Double lift in the bottom lane. Won't be able to add much if they catch somebody, but nobody does get caught. 
Just a whole lot of my muscles are bigger than yours right now. Onslaught of yeah. Shadows through three members of Counter Logic Gaming. This is where Doublelift needs to be here. Fires the huh. arrow, cross map, temper fate, locks up three, and it opens up onto Bunny. He's got a breakable will already. Zion Spartan tries to dive in, could use the ult. He goes back and he pops down Altec. But once you're in the fight, you're pretty much going to get burned up unless the rest of the team is there. And that means Doublelift comes in from the side. Another challenger approaches, and it's enough to get a double kill and take down Keen. A three for two overall in favor of CLG. <laughs> Classic split pushing AD carry. Double lift waits. You trust the teams that, you know, you guys probably not going to get caught, right? I'll just fire <laughs> an arrow at first. You'll be able to handle things. He doesn't start walking up until the dive from gravity. Yeah, huge dive. Uh, so many abilities for CLG to stall there, though. With Tempered Fate landing on everybody except the AD carry, that was actually a really, really good Tempered Fate. Uh, placed Altec in the middle, so he, yeah. he was able to take that arrow from double lift. And then Zion able to use that ultimate back in, finish him off at the cost of his own life. Not done with the Zonias, so he doesn't have that extra few seconds to rely on. Oh, that's good. Second turret grabbed. I was going to say gravity getting a little excited there off of turret number one. And figuring they could get some more. Nice job. Getting out in time. I have to say, I th it was a good... Uh, job by Gravity. Yeah, and for they sure. And were able to gain some money back, punish CLG for their uh, split. But some very good micro plays there. Uh-oh. Setting up camp. There's a lot of wards around them right now. I wonder if this could backfire really hard. Parallel conversions. They're not looking. They're looking for the fight on their wards. There's the arrow. Once again, it hits Bunny Fufu, so not too much work on locking down what they need. Zion Spartan throws down the chrono break, and he's back to the outside with Wild Growth on. Now the teams have been split once more. Nice cosmic binding. Keeping moving the rest of the team in place. Altec on the backside, very low HP, and they start trading a few kills back and forth. Keen and Move both down. Aphromoo trying to follow now into Altec. May not be able to get it. The speed trying to give himself the boost, and they still lock it down. A triple kill now for Double Lift. The last fight was two kills for him. Now he's 6-1-10, and, and CLG's on to Baron with the ace. All right, that should be the Baron here for CLG, and some inner turrets going down for them as they will be able to siege up after that. Whew. Yeah, the dangers of setting up one of those plays when you are not fully confident of your control of the vision very, very dangerous, yeah. especially as behind as Gravity are. You can see the power if Echo's able to set up. Get his parallel convergence down there, unbeknownst to the enemy team. Now, the second one, he wasn't... So this one was great. He got the stun, he got the shield. The second one he sets up, he's not able to get into. But right. they chase Altec out. Again, not everyone there was there from CLG. So at this point, you know, Gravity sort of turned it around. They fend CLG off for a split second, Ooh. and it looked like they might get away, but Doublelift wasn't there for the very beginning of that. So by the time he gets there, uh, they're able to clean it up. Zion wasn't quite able to get to the dome of that second parallel convergence, so he did go down. But all in all, CLG cleaned that one up. With yeah. the Baron, they should be able to push, uh, push in on those inner turrets. Strong play. Three dragons to CLG, one Baron as well. You can see the average first. They actually get just a minute beforehand than usual. So game's pretty much going at the same clip they usually play at here. Lost a few more turrets than usual if we want to go by some of their games. And now they start to push down mid lane. The minions a little bit harder here for Gravity to clear with Alltech being the real main one that's going to be able to get on that. So hopefully he can stay on the front line. Get that with Baron up minions cleared out here. Still can't get close enough for CLG to get on the turrets. Oh, yeah. One good thing for gravity. The, they got to be careful. That banner of commands, uh, Baron up <laughs> cannon minion. The Afro moves made. You know what I really liked about a Thresh uh, play on this is Thresh can hook that banner in and then bring it into turret range without really hurting himself. Really, really cool play you can do with Thresh. But no Thresh in this game. Your turret goes down. All right, so. Zion split push on bottom has prepped another wave of minions as well. Let's see if they're able to just rotate down to bottom side and make the same happen. Yeah, it's not going to be too hard. Oh. There's one push. Double oh. lift actually right in the front. Goes down to about 10% HP, but he's back. Now on the back line, able to charge up with that Bloodthirst that he built up first. The rest of the team getting thrown around. Now they take down move. He tries to go too far in. 
Bunny Fufu throws himself in once more for Alltech to try and get more blue buff. Boomerangs off. It's not going to happen. They are methodically and surgically removing gravity from the map one by one as they do the same with their turrets. Alltech is just forced to watch. All right, going to press in on the Nexus here. Minions not quite ready, but they do have plenty of time. Pretty good wave here, Man, Kobe. we see the survivability of a Bloodthirster first Ash when paired with mid Lulu. Got about five seconds left. A few home guards around the base. Alltech on the phone gets taken down by Zion Spartan. Chrono breaks back to the Nexus turrets. A well-fought game by Counter Logic Gaming. They do not seem to be down and out from their team solo mid loss last week. And they are able to pick up the win over the three and one gravity. Woo! Got that game off to a explosive start. Yeah. The move up top side. Very explosive. Some shenanigans from Gravity able to... <laughs> Did you say shenanigans? Come back in a couple of plays, though. Counterlogic Gaming going through the pick ban phase. That first pick, Echo. Thrown in the Gragas after that, and then saying, nope, by the way, that's our top. So you can play a Rumble against a Lulu in the mid lane. Keen trying to bring out that Rumble. He expected an Echo and he did not get the matchup he wanted. Very well played throughout by Counter Logic game, especially just after the first turret take. We were waiting to see if they still had the, the kind of uh, hoorah to keep going, do their own plays, and they have not gone to the wayside in their roaming ability. <laughs> you see, did I do the most damage? I think it is the most damage. Did I do the most damage? Did he? Let's actually find out, because we can tell. Most damage he this did. game was done by Doublelift, 22,000. The next behind him was 16,228. That was the Sivir of all tech. So the AD carries definitely having their heyday in this game. Doublelift, we saw the triples, the doubles coming up. Aphromu able to pick up three of his own in the early game, which goes to show you that CLG is back to their roaming ways, making sure Aphromu can get all around the map and assist a lot of the lanes. Yeah, and I actually think that is the, would be the most efficient build for Ash. Just because of how, yeah, how her uh, passive now works with Phantom Dash, you don't have to invest so heavily in Infinity Edge like all the other AD carries do. Plenty of survivability as well. I'm able to take it home. So four and one, three and two for Gravity. The four and one for CLG now with Dig at the top of the list. CLG for and Dig. Tied up. Team Solo mid today, amazing matchups. And really, if you were to pit these two against now with kind of with Helios, you don't really know what's going to happen. Dignitas has been able to hold themselves in really, really tough times this split. And I think Counter Logic Gaming could have some trouble playing against them as well. Looking at when that would actually go down. Next time it will is week nine. So these guys got a lot of time to think about that game. CLG, however, coming up with a very nice win here. Everybody around the board played well. Pole Belter in the mid lane on Lulu. Didn't have an amazing game, but the team relies on him to always be there when they need it. He had the wild growths he needed to provide. It wasn't damage ultimates this time. He just plays the